Welcome to our channel. We will share rich content of audiobooks, allowing you to enjoy the pleasure of listening. Want to listen to more audiobooks? Please subscribe to our channel, about the book Seek and Ye Shall Find. With these words echoing in his head, eminent Harvard symbologist Robert Langdon awakes in a hospital bed with no recollection of where he is or how he got there. Nor can he explain the origin of the macabre object that is found hidden in his belongings. A threat to his life will propel him and a young doctor, Sienna Brooks, into a breakneck chase across the city of Florence. Only Langdon's knowledge of hidden passageways and ancient secrets that lie behind its historic facade can save them from the clutches of their unknown pursuers. With only a few lines from Dante's dark and epic masterpiece, The Inferno, to guide them, they must decipher a sequence of codes buried deep within some of the most celebrated artifacts of the Renaissance sculptures, paintings, buildings to find the answers to a puzzle which may, or may not, help them save the world from a terrifying threat. Set against an extraordinary landscape inspired by one of history's most ominous literary classics, Inferno is Dan Brown's most compelling and thought-provoking novel yet, a breathless race against time thriller that will grab you from page one and not let you go until you close the book. For my parents. Acknowledgements my most humble and sincere thanks to, as always, first and foremost, my editor and close friend, Jason Kaufman, for his dedication and talent, but mainly for his endless good humor. My extraordinary wife, Blythe, for her love and patience with the writing process, and also for her superb instincts and candor as a frontline editor. My tireless agent and trusted friend Heidi Lang, for expertly navigating more conversations, in more countries, on more topics than I will ever know. For her skills and energy, I am eternally grateful. The entire team at Doubleday for its enthusiasm, creativity and efforts on behalf of my books, with very special thanks to Suzanne Hurst, for wearing so many hats, and wearing them so well, Bill Thomas, Michael Windsor, Judy Jacoby, Joe Gallagher, Rob Bloom, Nora Richard, Beth Meister, Maria Carella, Lorraine Highland, and also to the unending support of Sonny Maida, Tony Chirico, Kathy Tridger, Anne Messett and Marcus Dole. To the incredible people of the Random House Sales Department, you are unrivaled. My sage counsel Michael Ruddle, for his pitch-perfect instincts on all matters, large and small, as well as for his friendship. My irreplaceable assistant Susan Morehouse, for her grace and vitality, and without whom all things descend into chaos. All of my friends at Transworld, in particular Bill Scott Kerr for his creativity, support and good cheer and also to Gail Rebick for her superb leadership. My Italian publisher Mondadori, especially Ricky Cavallero, Pira Cusani, Giovanni Dutto, Antonio Franchini, and Claudia Shu, and my Turkish publisher Alton Kitaplar, particularly Oya Alper, Erden Hepper, and Bata Boskert, for the special services provided in connection with the locations in this book. My exceptional publishers around the world for their passion, hard work, and commitment. For their impressive management of the London and Milan translation sites, Leon Romero Montalvo and Luciano Guglielmi. The bright Dr. Marta Alvarez Gonzalez for spending so much time with us in Florence and for bringing to life the city's art and architecture. The peerless Maurizio Pimpani for all he did to enhance our visit to Italy. All the historians, guides, and specialists who generously spent time with me in Florence and Venice, sharing their expertise. Giovanna Rao and Eugenia Antonucci at the Biblioteca Medicia Laurens Iana, Serena Pini and staff at the Palazzo Vecchio, Giovanna Giusti at the Uffizi Gallery, Barbara Fedeli at the Baptistry and Il Duomo, Ettore Vito and Massimo Bisson at St. Mark's Basilica, Giorgio Tagliaferro at the Doge's Palace, Isabella Di Leonardo, Elizabeth Carol Consavari, and Elena Svaldas. Throughout all of Venice, Annalisa Bruni and staff at the Biblioteca Nazionale Marciana, and to the many others whom I've failed to mention in this abbreviated list, my sincere thanks. Rachel Dylan Fried and Stephanie Delman at Sanford J. Greenberger Associates for everything they do both here and abroad. The exceptional minds of Dr. George Abraham, Dr. John Trenner, and Dr. Bob Helm for their scientific expertise. My early readers, who provided perspective along the way, 
Greg Brown, Dick and Connie Brown, Rebecca Kaufman, Jerry and Olivia Kaufman, and John Chaffee. The web-savvy Alex Cannon, who, along with the team at Sanborn Media Factory, keeps things humming in the online world. Judd and Kathy Gregg for providing me quiet sanctuary within Green Gables as I wrote the final chapters of this book. The superb online resources of the Princeton Dante Project, Digital Dante at Columbia University, and the world of Dante. The darkest places in hell are reserved for those who maintain their neutrality in times of moral crisis. Fact, all artwork, literature, science and historical references in this novel are real. The consortium is a private organization with offices in seven countries. Its name has been changed for considerations of security and privacy. Inferno is the underworld as described in Dante Alighieri's epic poem The Divine Comedy, which portrays hell as an elaborately structured realm populated by entities known as Shades bodiless souls trapped between life and death. Prologue I am the Shade. Through the dolent city, I flee. Through the eternal woe. I take flight. Along the banks of the river Arno, I scramble, breathless, turning left onto Via Dei Castellani, making my way northward, huddling in the shadows of the Uffizi. And still they pursue me. Their footsteps grow louder now as they hunt with relentless determination. For years they have pursued me. Their persistence has kept me underground, forced me to live in purgatory, laboring beneath the earth like a thonic monster. I am the shade. Here above ground, I raise my eyes to the north, but I am unable to find a direct path to salvation, for the Apennine Mountains are blotting out the first light of dawn. I pass behind the palazzo with its crenellated tower and one-handed clock, snaking through the early morning vendors in Piazza di San Ferenza with their hoarse voices smelling of lampredato and roasted olives. Crossing before the Bargello, I cut west toward the spire of the Badia and come up hard against the iron gate at the base of the stairs. Here all hesitation must be left behind. I turn the handle and step into the passage from which I know there will be no return. I urge my leaden legs up the narrow staircase, spiraling skyward on soft marble treads, pitted and worn. The voices echo from below. Beseeching. They are behind me, unyielding, closing in. They do not understand what is coming, nor what I have done for them. Ungrateful land. As I climb, the visions come hard, the lustful bodies writhing in fiery rain, the gluttonous souls floating in excrement, the treacherous villains frozen in Satan's icy grasp. I climb the final stairs and arrive at the top, staggering near dead into the damp morning air. I rush to the head-high wall, peering through the slits. Far below is the blessed city that I have made my sanctuary from those who exiled me. The voices call out, arriving close behind me. What you've done is madness. Madness breeds madness. For the love of God, they shout, tell us where you've hidden it. For precisely the love of God, I will not. I stand now, cornered, my back to the cold stone. They stare deep into my clear green eyes and their expressions darken, no longer cajoling, but threatening. You know we have our methods. We can force you to tell us where it is. For that reason, I have climbed halfway to heaven. Without warning, I turn and reach up, curling my fingers onto the high ledge, pulling myself up, scrambling onto my knees, then standing, unsteady at the precipice. Guide me, dear Virgil, across the void. They rush forward in disbelief, wanting to grab at my feet, but fearing they will upset my balance and knock me off. They beg now, in quiet desperation, but I have turned my back. I know what I must do. Beneath me, dizzyingly far beneath me, the red tile roofs spread out like a sea of fire on the countryside, illuminating the fair land upon which giants once roamed. Giotto, Donatello, Brunelleschi, Michelangelo, Botticelli. I inch my toes to the edge. Come down, they shout. It's not too late. Oh, willful ignorance. Do you not see the future? Do you not grasp the splendor of my creation? The necessity? I will gladly make this ultimate sacrifice, 
and with it I will extinguish your final hope of finding what you seek. You will never locate it in time. Hundreds of feet below, the cobblestone piazza beckons like a tranquil oasis. How I long for more time, but time is the one commodity even my vast fortunes cannot afford. In these final seconds, I gaze down at the piazza, and I behold a sight that startles me. I see your face. You are gazing up at me from the shadows. Your eyes are mournful, and yet in them I sense a veneration for what I have accomplished. You understand I have no choice. For the love of mankind, I must protect my masterpiece. It grows even now, waiting, simmering beneath the blood-red waters of the lagoon that reflects no stars. And so, I lift my eyes from yours and I contemplate the horizon. High above this burdened world, I make my final supplication. Dearest God, I pray the world remembers my name not as a monstrous sinner, but as the glorious Savior you know I truly am. I pray mankind will understand the gift I leave behind. My gift is the future. My gift is salvation. My gift is inferno. With that, I whisper my Amen, and take my final step, into the abyss. Chapter 1 The memories materialized slowly, like bubbles surfacing from the darkness of a bottomless well. A veiled woman. Robert Langdon gazed at her across a river whose churning waters ran red with blood. On the far bank, the woman stood facing him, motionless, solemn, her face hidden by a shroud. In her hand she gripped a Blutania cloth, which she now raised in honor of the sea of corpses at her feet. The smell of death hung everywhere. Seek, the woman whispered. And ye shall find. Langdon heard the words as if she had spoken them inside his head. Who are you, he called out, but his voice made no sound. Time grows short, she whispered. Seek and find. Langdon took a step toward the river, but he could see the waters were bloodred and too deep to traverse. When Langdon raised his eyes again to the veiled woman, the bodies at her feet had multiplied. There were hundreds of them now, maybe thousands, some still alive, writhing in agony, dying unthinkable deaths, consumed by fire, buried in feces, devouring one another. He could hear the mournful cries of human suffering echoing across the water. The woman moved toward him, holding out her slender hands, as if beckoning for help. Who are you? Langdon again shouted. In response, the woman reached up and slowly lifted the veil from her face. She was strikingly beautiful, and yet older than Langdon had imagined in her sixties perhaps, stately and strong, like a timeless statue. She had a sternly set jaw, deep soulful eyes, and long, silver-gray hair that cascaded over her shoulders in ringlets. An amulet of lapis lazuli hung around her neck a single snake coiled around a staff. Langdon sensed he knew her, trusted her. But how? Why? She pointed now to a writhing pair of legs, which protruded upside down from the earth, apparently belonging to some poor soul who had been buried head first to his waist. The man's pale thigh bore a single letter written in mud R. R. Langdon thought, uncertain. As in. Robert. Is that, me? The woman's face revealed nothing. Seek and find, she repeated. Without warning, she began radiating a white light, brighter and brighter. Her entire body started vibrating intensely, and then, in a rush of thunder, she exploded into a thousand splintering shards of light. Langdon bolted awake, shouting. The room was bright. He was alone. The sharp smell of medicinal alcohol hung in the air, and somewhere a machine pinged in quiet rhythm with his heart. Langdon tried to move his right arm but a sharp pain restrained him. He looked down and saw in four tugging at the skin of his forearm. His pulse quickened, and the machines kept pace, pinging more rapidly. Where am I? What happened? The back of Langdon's head throbbed, a gnawing pain. Gingerly, he reached up with his free arm and touched his scalp, trying to locate the source of his headache. Beneath his matted hair, he found the hard nubs of a dozen or so stitches caked with dried blood. He closed his eyes, trying to remember an accident. Nothing. 
a total blank. Think. Only darkness. A man in scrubs hurried in, apparently alerted by Langdon's racing heart monitor. He had a shaggy beard, bushy mustache, and gentle eyes that radiated a thoughtful calm beneath his overgrown eyebrows. What, happened? Langdon managed. Did I have an accident? The bearded man put a finger to his lips and then rushed out, calling for someone down the hall. Langdon turned his head, but the movement sent a spike of pain radiating through his skull. He took deep breaths and let the pain pass. Then, very gently and methodically, he surveyed his sterile surroundings. The hospital room had a single bed. No flowers. No cards. Langdon saw his clothes on a nearby counter, folded inside a clear plastic bag. They were covered with blood. My God! It must have been bad. Now Langdon rotated his head very slowly toward the window beside his bed. It was dark outside. Night. All Langdon could see in the glass was his own reflection an ashen stranger, pale and weary, attached to tubes and wires, surrounded by medical equipment. Voices approached in the hall, and Langdon turned his gaze back toward the room. The doctor returned, now accompanied by a woman. She appeared to be in her early thirties. She wore blue scrubs and had tied her blonde hair back in a thick ponytail that swung behind her as she walked. I'm Dr. Sienna Brooks, she said, giving Langdon a smile as she entered. I'll be working with Dr. Marconi tonight. Langdon nodded weakly. Tall and lissom, Dr. Brooks moved with the assertive gait of an athlete. Even in shapeless scrubs, she had a willowy elegance about her. Despite the absence of any makeup that Langdon could see, her complexion appeared unusually smooth, the only blemish a tiny beauty mark just above her lips. Her eyes, though a gentle brown, seemed unusually penetrating, as if they had witnessed a profundity of experience rarely encountered by a person her age. Dr. Marconi doesn't speak much English, she said, sitting down beside him, and he asked me to fill out your admittance form. She gave him another smile. Thanks, Langdon croaked. Okay, she began, her tone businesslike. What is your name? It took him a moment. Robert. Langdon. She shone a penlight in Langdon's eyes. Occupation. This information surfaced even more slowly. Professor. Art history, and symbology. Harvard University. Dr. Brooks lowered the light, looking startled. The doctor with the bushy eyebrows looked equally surprised. You're, an American. Langdon gave her a confused look. It's just, she hesitated. You had no identification when you arrived tonight. You were wearing Harris tweed and Somerset loafers, so we guessed British. I'm American, Langdon assured her, too exhausted to explain his preference for well-tailored clothing. Any pain? My head, Langdon replied, his throbbing skull only made worse by the bright pen light. Thankfully, she now pocketed it, taking Langdon's wrist and checking his pulse. You woke up shouting, the woman said. Do you remember why? Langdon flashed again on the strange vision of the veiled woman surrounded by writhing bodies. Seek and ye shall find. I was having a nightmare. About. Langdon told her. Dr. Brooks's expression remained neutral as she made notes on a clipboard. Any idea what might have sparked such a frightening vision? Langdon probed his memory and then shook his head, which pounded in protest. Okay, Mr. Langdon, she said, still writing, a couple of routine questions for you. What day of the week is it? Langdon thought for a moment. It's Saturday. I remember earlier today walking across campus, going to an afternoon lecture series, and then, that's pretty much the last thing I remember. Did I fall? We'll get to that. Do you know where you are? Langdon took his best guess. Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Brooks made another note. And is there someone we should call for you? Wife? Children? Nobody. Langdon replied instinctively. 
He had always enjoyed the solitude and independence provided him by his chosen life of bachelorhood, although he had to admit, in his current situation, he'd prefer to have a familiar face at his side. There are some colleagues I could call, but I'm fine. Dr. Brooks finished writing, and the older doctor approached. Smoothing back his bushy eyebrows, he produced a small voice recorder from his pocket and showed it to Dr. Brooks. She nodded in understanding and turned back to her patient. Mr. Langdon, when you arrived tonight, you were mumbling something over and over. She glanced at Dr. Marconi, who held up the digital recorder and pressed a button. A recording began to play, and Langdon heard his own groggy voice, repeatedly muttering the same phrase, V, sorry. V, sorry. It sounds to me, the woman said, like you're saying, very sorry. Very sorry. Langdon agreed, and yet he had no recollection of it. Dr. Brooks fixed him with a disquietingly intense stare. Do you have any idea why you'd be saying this? Are you sorry about something? As Langdon probed the dark recesses of his memory, he again saw the veiled woman. She was standing on the banks of a blood-red river surrounded by bodies. The stench of death returned. Langdon was overcome by a sudden, instinctive sense of danger, not just for himself, but for everyone. The pinging of his heart monitor accelerated rapidly. His muscles tightened, and he tried to sit up. Dr. Brooks quickly placed a firm hand on Langdon's sternum, forcing him back down. She shot a glance at the bearded doctor, who walked over to a nearby counter and began preparing something. Dr. Brooks hovered over Langdon whispering now. Mr. Langdon, anxiety is common with brain injuries, but you need to keep your pulse rate down. No movement. No excitement. Just lie still and rest. You'll be okay. Your memory will come back slowly. The doctor returned now with a syringe, which he handed to Dr. Brooks. She injected its contents into Langdon's fore. Just a mild sedative to calm you down she explained, and also to help with the pain. She stood to go. You'll be fine, Mr. Langdon. Just sleep. If you need anything, press the button on your bedside. She turned out the light and departed with the bearded doctor. In the darkness, Langdon felt the drugs washing through his system almost instantly, dragging his body back down into that deep well from which he had emerged. He fought the feeling, forcing his eyes open in the darkness of his room. He tried to sit up, but his body felt like cement. As Langdon shifted, he found himself again facing the window. The lights were out, and in the dark glass, his own reflection had disappeared, replaced by an illuminated skyline in the distance. Amid a contour of spires and domes, a single regal facade dominated Langdon's field of view. The building was an imposing stone fortress with a notched parapet and a 300-foot tower that swelled near the top, bulging outward into a massive machicolated battlement. Langdon sat bolt upright in bed, pain exploding in his head. He fought off the searing throb and fixed his gaze on the tower. Langdon knew the medieval structure well. It was unique in the world. Unfortunately, it was also located 4,000 miles from Massachusetts. Outside his window, Hidden in the shadows of the Viatore Gully, a powerfully built woman effortlessly unstraddled her BMW motorcycle and advanced with the intensity of a panther stalking its prey. Her gaze was sharp. Her close-cropped hair styled into spikes stood out against the upturned collar of her black leather riding suit. She checked her silenced weapon, and stared up at the window where Robert Langdon's light had just gone out. Earlier tonight her original mission had gone horribly awry. The coup of a single dove had changed everything. Now she had come to make it right. Chapter 2 I'm in Florence? Robert Langdon's head throbbed. He was now seated upright in his hospital bed, repeatedly jamming his finger into the call button. Despite the sedatives in his system, his heart was racing. Dr. Brooks hurried back in, her ponytail bobbing. Are you okay? Langdon shook his head in bewilderment. I'm in. Italy. Good, she said. You're remembering. No. 
Langdon pointed out the window at the commanding edifice in the distance. I recognize the Palazzo Vecchio. Dr. Brooks flicked the lights back on, and the Florence skyline disappeared. She came to his bedside, whispering calmly. Mr. Langdon, there's no need to worry. You're suffering from mild amnesia, but Dr. Marconi confirmed that your brain function is fine. The bearded doctor rushed in as well, apparently hearing the call button. He checked Langdon's heart monitor as the young doctor spoke to him in rapid, fluent Italian something about how Langdon was agitato to learn he was in Italy. Agitated? Langdon thought angrily. More like stupefied. The adrenaline surging through his system was now doing battle with the sedatives. What happened to me, he demanded. What day is it? Everything is fine, she said. It's early morning. Monday, March 18th. Monday. Langdon forced his aching mind to reel back to the last images he could recall cold and dark walking alone across the Harvard campus to a Saturday night lecture series. That was two days ago. A sharper panic now gripped him as he tried to recall anything at all from the lecture or afterward. Nothing. The ping of his heart monitor accelerated. The older doctor scratched at his beard and continued adjusting equipment while Dr. Brooks sat again beside Langdon. You're going to be okay, she reassured him, speaking gently. We've diagnosed you with retrograde amnesia, which is very common in head trauma. Your memories of the past few days may be muddled or missing, but you should suffer no permanent damage. She paused. Do you remember my first name? I told you when I walked in. Langdon thought a moment. Sienna. Dr. Sienna Brooks. She smiled. See? You're already forming new memories. The pain in Langdon's head was almost unbearable, and his near-field vision remained blurry. What, happened? How did I get here? I think you should rest, and maybe how did I get here, he demanded, his heart monitor accelerating further. Okay, just breathe easy, Dr. Brooks said, exchanging a nervous look with her colleague. I'll tell you. Her voice turned markedly more serious. Mr. Langdon, three hours ago, you staggered into our emergency room, bleeding from a head wound, and you immediately collapsed. Nobody had any idea who you were or how you got here. You were mumbling in English, so Dr. Marconi asked me to assist. I'm on sabbatical here from the U.K. Langdon felt like he had awoken inside a Max Ernst painting. What the hell am I doing in Italy? Normally Langdon came here every other June for an art conference, but this was March. The sedatives pulled harder at him now, and he felt as if Earth's gravity were growing stronger by the second, trying to drag him down through his mattress. Langdon fought it, hoisting his head, trying to stay alert. Dr. Brooks leaned over him, hovering like an angel. Please, Mr. Langdon, she whispered. Head trauma is delicate in the first 24 hours. You need to rest, or you could do serious damage. A voice crackled suddenly on the room's intercom. Dr. Marconi. The bearded doctor touched a button on the wall and replied, S.I. The voice on the intercom spoke in rapid Italian. Langdon didn't catch what it said, but he did catch the two doctors exchanging a look of surprise. Or is it alarm? Momento. Marconi replied, ending the conversation. What's going on? Langdon asked. Dr. Brooks's eyes seemed to narrow a bit. That was the ICU receptionist. Someone's here to visit you. A ray of hope cut through Langdon's grogginess. That's good news. Maybe this person knows what happened to me. She looked uncertain. It's just odd that someone's here. We didn't have your name and you're not even registered in the system yet. Langdon battled the sedatives and awkwardly hoisted himself upright in his bed. If someone knows I'm here, that person must know what happened. Dr. Brooks glanced at Dr. Marconi, who immediately shook his head and tapped his watch. She turned back to Langdon. This is the ICU, she explained. Nobody is allowed in until 9 a.m. at the earliest. 
In a moment Dr. Marconi will go out and see who the visitor is and what he or she wants. What about what I want? Langdon demanded. Dr. Brooks smiled patiently and lowered her voice, leaning closer. Mr. Langdon, there are some things you don't know about last night, about what happened to you. And before you speak to anyone, I think it's only fair that you have all the facts. Unfortunately, I don't think you are strong enough yet to what facts. Langdon demanded, struggling to prop himself higher. The four in his arm pinched, and his body felt like it weighed several hundred pounds. All I know is I'm in a Florence hospital and I arrived repeating the words very sorry, a frightening thought now occurred to him. Was I responsible for a car accident? Langdon asked. Did I hurt someone? No, no, she said. I don't believe so. Then what? Langdon insisted, eyeing both doctors furiously. I have a right to know what's going on. There was a long silence, and Dr. Marconi finally gave his attractive young colleague a reluctant nod. Dr. Brooks exhaled and moved closer to his bedside. Okay, let me tell you what I know, and you'll listen calmly, agreed. Langdon nodded, the head movement sending a jolt of pain radiating through his skull. He ignored it eager for answers. The first thing is this. Your head wound was not caused by an accident. Well, that's a relief. Not really. Your wound, in fact, was caused by a bullet. Langdon's heart monitor pinged faster. I beg your pardon. Dr. Brooks spoke steadily but quickly. A bullet grazed the top of your skull and most likely gave you a concussion. You're very lucky to be alive. An inch lower, and, she shook her head. Langdon stared at her in disbelief. Someone shot me? Angry voices erupted in the hall as an argument broke out. It sounded as if whoever had arrived to visit Langdon did not want to wait. Almost immediately, Langdon heard a heavy door at the far end of the hallway burst open. He watched until he saw a figure approaching down the corridor. The woman was dressed entirely in black leather. She was toned and strong with dark, spiked hair. She moved effortlessly, as if her feet weren't touching the ground, and she was headed directly for Langdon's room. Without hesitation, Dr. Marconi stepped into the open doorway to block the visitor's passage. Ferma, the man commanded, holding out his palm like a policeman. The stranger, without breaking stride, produced a silenced handgun. She aimed directly at Dr. Marconi's chest and fired. There was a staccato hiss. Langdon watched in horror as Dr. Marconi staggered backward into the room, falling to the floor, clutching his chest, his white lab coat drenched in blood. Chapter 3 Five miles off the coast of Italy, the 237-foot luxury yacht the Mendacium motored through the pre-dawn mist that rose from the gently rolling swells of the Adriatic. The ship's stealth profile hull was painted gunmetal grey, giving it the distinctly unwelcoming aura of a military vessel. With a price tag of over 300 million US dollars, the craft boasted all the usual amenities spa, pool, cinema, personal submarine, and helicopter pad. The ship's creature comforts, however, were of little interest to its owner, who had taken delivery of the yacht five years ago and immediately gutted most of these spaces to install a lead lined military-grade, electronic command center. Fed by three dedicated satellite links and a redundant array of terrestrial relay stations, the control room on the Mendacium had a staff of nearly two dozen technicians, analysts, operation coordinators who lived on board and remained in constant contact with the organization's various land-based operation centers. The ship's onboard security included a small unit of military-trained soldiers, two missile detection systems, and an arsenal of the latest weapons available. Other support staff cooks, cleaning, and service pushed the total number on board to more than 40. The Mendacium was, in effect, the portable office building from which the owner ran his empire. Known to his employees only as the Provost, he was a tiny, stunted man with tanned skin and deep-set eyes. His unimposing physique and direct manner seemed well suited to one who had made a vast fortune providing a private menu of covered services along the shadowy fringes of society. 
He had been called many things a soulless mercenary, a facilitator of sin, the devil's enabler but he was none of these. The provost simply provided his clients with the opportunity to pursue their ambitions and desires without consequence, that mankind was sinful and nature was not his problem. Despite his detractors and their ethical objections, the provost's moral compass was a fixed star. He had built his reputation and the consortium itself on two golden rules. Never make a promise you cannot keep. And never lie to a client. Ever. In his professional career, the provost had never broken a promise or reneged on a deal. His word was bankable and absolute guarantee and while there were certainly contracts he regretted having made, backing out of them was never an option. This morning, as he stepped onto the private balcony of his yacht's stateroom, the provost looked across the churning sea and tried to fend off the disquiet that had settled in his gut. The decisions of our past are the architects of our present. The decisions of the provost's past had put him in a position to negotiate almost any minefield and always come out on top. Today, however, as he gazed out the window at the distant lights of the Italian mainland, he felt uncharacteristically on edge. One year ago, on this very yacht, he had made a decision whose ramifications now threatened to unravel everything he had built. I agreed to provide services to the wrong man. There had been no way the provost could have known at the time, and yet now the miscalculation had brought a tempest of unforeseen challenges, forcing him to send some of his best agents into the field with orders to do whatever it took to keep his listing ship from capsizing. At the moment the provost was waiting to hear from one field agent in particular. Vayantha, he thought, picturing the sinewy, spike-haired specialist. Vayantha, who had served him perfectly until this mission, had made a mistake last night that had dire consequences. The last six hours had been a scramble, a desperate attempt to regain control of the situation. Vayantha claimed her error was the result of simple bad luck the untimely coup of a dove. The provost, however, did not believe in luck. Everything he did was orchestrated to eradicate randomness and remove chance. Control was the provost's expertise foreseeing every possibility, anticipating every response, and molding reality toward the desired outcome. He had an immaculate track record of success and secrecy, and with it came a staggering clientele billionaires, politicians, sheiks, and even entire governments. To the east, the first faint light of morning had begun to consume the lowest stars on the horizon. On the deck the provost stood and patiently awaited word from Vayantha that her mission had gone exactly as planned. Chapter 4 For an instant, Langdon felt as if time had stopped. Dr. Marconi lay motionless on the floor, blood gushing from his chest. Fighting the sedatives in his system, Langdon raised his eyes to the spike-haired assassin, who was still striding down the hall, covering the last few yards toward his open door. As she neared the threshold, she looked toward Langdon and instantly swung her weapon in his direction, aiming at his head. I'm going to die, Langdon realized. Here and now. The bang was deafening in the small hospital room. Langdon recoiled, certain he had been shot, but the noise had not been the attacker's gun. Rather, the bang had been the slam of the room's heavy metal door as Dr. Brooks threw herself against it and turned the lock. Eyes wild with fear, Dr. Brooks immediately spun and crouched beside her blood-soaked colleague, searching for a pulse. Dr. Marconi coughed up a mouthful of blood, which dribbled down his cheek across his thick beard. Then he fell limp. Enrico, no. T.I. Prego, she screamed. Outside, a barrage of bullets exploded against the metal exterior of the door. Shouts of alarm filled the hall. Somehow, Langdon's body was in motion, panic and instinct now overruling his sedatives. As he clambered awkwardly out of bed, a searing hot pain tore into his right forearm. For an instant, he thought a bullet had passed through the door and hit him, but when he looked down, he realized his forehead snapped off in his arm. The plastic catheter poked out of a jagged hole in his forearm, and warm blood was already flowing backward out of the tube. Langdon was now fully awake. Crouched beside Marconi's body, Dr. Brooks kept searching for a pulse as tears welled in her eyes. Then, as if a switch had been flipped inside her, she stood and turned to Langdon. 
her expression transformed before his eyes, her young features hardening with all the detached composure of a seasoned ER doctor dealing with a crisis. Follow me, she commanded. Dr. Brooks grabbed Langdon's arm and pulled him across the room. The sounds of gunfire and chaos continued in the hallway as Langdon lurched forward on unstable legs. His mind felt alert but his heavily drugged body was slow to respond. Move. The tile floor felt cold beneath his feet, and his thin hospital johnny was scarcely long enough to cover his six-foot frame. He could feel blood dripping down his forearm and pooling in his palm. Bullets continued to slam against the heavy doorknob, and Dr. Brooks pushed Langdon roughly into a small bathroom. She was about to follow when she paused, turned around, and ran back toward the counter and grabbed his bloody Harris tweed. Forget my damned jacket. She returned clutching his jacket and quickly locked the bathroom door. Just then, the door in the outer room crashed open. The young doctor took control. She strode through the tiny bathroom to a second door, yanked it open, and led Langdon into an adjoining recovery room. Gunfire echoed behind them as Dr. Brooks stuck her head out into the hallway and quickly grabbed Langdon's arm, pulling him across the corridor into a stairwell. The sudden motion made Langdon dizzy he sensed that he could pass out at any moment. The next 15 seconds were a blur, descending stairs, stumbling, falling. The pounding in Langdon's head was almost unbearable. His vision seemed even more blurry now, and his muscles were sluggish, each movement feeling like a delayed reaction. And then the air grew cold. I'm outside. As Dr. Brooks hustled him along a dark alley away from the building, Langdon stepped on something sharp and fell, hitting the pavement hard. She struggled to get him back to his feet, cursing out loud the fact that he had been sedated. As they neared the end of the alley, Langdon stumbled again. This time she left him on the ground, rushing into the street and yelling to someone in the distance. Langdon could make out the faint green light of a taxi parked in front of the hospital. The car didn't move, its driver undoubtedly asleep. Dr. Brooks screamed and waved her arms wildly. Finally the taxi's headlights came on and it moved lazily toward them. Behind Langdon in the alley, a door burst open, followed by the sound of rapidly approaching footsteps. He turned and saw the dark figure bounding toward him. Langdon tried to get back to his feet, but the doctor was already grabbing him, forcing him into the back seat of an idling Fiat taxi. He landed half on the seat and half on the floor as Dr. Brooks dove on top of him, yanking the door shut. The sleepy-eyed driver turned and stared at the bizarre duo that had just tumbled into his cab a young, ponytailed woman in scrubs and a man in a half-torn johnny with a bleeding arm. He clearly was about ready to tell them to get the hell out of his car, when the side mirror exploded. The woman in black leather sprinted out of the alley, gun extended. Her pistol hissed again just as Dr. Brooks grabbed Langdon's head, pulling it down. The rear window exploded, showering them with glass. The driver needed no further encouragement. He slammed his foot down on the gas, and the taxi peeled out. Langdon teetered on the brink of consciousness. Someone is trying to kill me? Once they had rounded a corner, Dr. Brooks sat up and grabbed Langdon's bloody arm. The catheter was protruding awkwardly from a hole in his flesh. Look out the window, she commanded. Langdon obeyed. Outside, ghostly tombstones rushed by in the darkness. It seemed somehow fitting that they were passing a cemetery. Langdon felt the doctor's fingers probing gently for the catheter and then, without warning, she wrenched it out. A searing bolt of pain traveled directly to Langdon's head. He felt his eyes rolling back and then everything went black. Chapter 5 The shrill ring of his phone drew the provost's gaze from the calming mist of the Adriatic, and he quickly stepped back into his stateroom office. It's about time, he thought, eager for news. The computer screen on his desk had flickered to life, informing him that the incoming call was from a Swedish Sektra Tiger XS personal voice encrypting phone, which had been redirected through four untraceable routers before being connected to his ship. He donned his headset. This is the provost, he answered, his words slow and meticulous. Go ahead. It's Vayantha, the voice replied. 
the provost sensed an unusual nervousness in her tone. Field agents rarely spoke to the provost directly, and even more rarely did they remain in his employ after a debacle like the one last night. Nonetheless, the provost had required an agent on site to help remedy the crisis, and Vayantha had been the best person for the job. I have an update, Vayantha said. The provost was silent, his cue for her to continue. When she spoke, her tone was emotionless, clearly an attempt at professionalism. Langdon has escaped, she said. He has the object. The provost sat down at his desk and remained silent for a very long time. Understood, he finally said. I imagine he will reach out to the authorities as soon as he possibly can. Two decks beneath the provost, in the ship's secure control center, senior facilitator Lawrence Knowlton sat in his private cubicle and noticed that the provost's encrypted call had ended. He hoped the news was good. The provost's tension had been palpable for the past two days, and every operative on board sensed there was some kind of high-stakes operation going on. The stakes are inconceivably high, and Vayantha had better get it right this time. Knowlton was accustomed to quarterbacking carefully constructed game plans, but this particular scenario had disintegrated into chaos, and the provost had taken over personally. We've moved into uncharted territory. Although a half dozen other missions were currently in process around the world, all of them were being serviced by the consortium's various field offices, freeing the provost and his staff aboard the Mendasium to focus exclusively on this one. Their client had jumped to his death several days ago in Florence, but the consortium still had numerous outstanding services on his docket specific tasks the man had entrusted to this organization regardless of the circumstances and the consortium, as always intended to follow through without question. I have my orders, Knowlton thought, fully intending to comply. He exited his sound-proofed glass cubicle, walking past a half-dozen other chambers some transparent, some opaque in which duty officers were handling other aspects of this same mission. Knowlton crossed through the thin, processed air of the main control room, nodding to the tech crew, and entered a small walk-in vault containing a dozen strong boxes. He opened one of the boxes and retrieved its contents in this case, a bright red memory stick. According to the task card attached, the memory stick contained a large video file, which the client had directed them to upload to key media outlets at a specific time tomorrow morning. Tomorrow's anonymous upload would be simple enough, but in keeping protocol for all digital files, the flowchart had flagged this file for review today 24 hours prior to delivery to ensure the consortium had adequate time to perform any necessary decryption, compiling, or other preparation that might be required before uploading it at the precise hour. Nothing left to chance. Knowlton returned to his transparent cubicle and closed the heavy glass door, blocking out the outside world. He flipped a switch on the wall, and his cubicle instantly turned opaque. For privacy, all of the glass-walled offices aboard the Mendasium were built with suspended particle device glass. The transparency of SPD glass was easily controlled by the application or removal of an electric current, which either aligned or randomized millions of tiny rod-like particles suspended within the panel. Compartmentalization was a cornerstone of the consortium's success. Know only your own mission. Share nothing. Now. Ensconced in his private space, Knowlton inserted the memory stick into his computer and clicked the file to begin his assessment. Immediately his screen faded to black, and his speakers began playing the soft sound of lapping water. An image slowly appeared on screen, amorphous and shadowy. Emerging from the darkness, a scene began to take shape, the interior of a cave, or a giant chamber of some sort. The floor of the cavern was water like an underground lake. Strangely, the water appeared to be illuminated, as if from within. Knowlton had never seen anything like it. The entire cavern shone with an eerie reddish hue, its pale walls awash with tendril-like reflections of rippling water. What, is this place? As the lapping continued, the camera began to tilt downward and descend vertically, directly toward the water until the camera pierced the illuminated surface. The sounds of rippling disappeared, replaced by an eerie hush beneath the water. Submerged now, the camera kept descending, 
moving down through several feet of water until it stopped, focusing on the cavern's silt-covered floor. Bolted to the floor was a rectangular plaque of shimmering titanium. The plaque bore an inscription. In this place, on this date, the world was changed forever. Engraved at the bottom of the plaque was a name and a date. The name was that of their client. The date, tomorrow. Chapter 6 Langdon felt firm hands lifting him now, urging him from his delirium, helping him out of the taxi. The pavement felt cold beneath his bare feet. Half supported by the slender frame of Dr. Brooks, Langdon staggered down a deserted walkway between two apartment buildings. The dawn air rustled, billowing his hospital gown, and Langdon felt cold air in places he knew he shouldn't. The sedative he'd been given in the hospital had left his mind as blurred as his vision. Langdon felt like he was underwater, attempting to claw his way through a viscous, dimly lit world. Sienna Brooks dragged him onward, supporting him with surprising strength. Stairs, she said, and Langdon realized they had reached a side entrance of the building. Langdon gripped the railing and trudged dizzily upward, one step at a time. His body felt ponderous. Dr. Brooks physically pushed him now. When they reached the landing, she typed some numbers into a rusted old keypad and the door buzzed open. The air inside was not much warmer, but the tile floors felt like soft carpet on the solace of his feet compared to the rough pavement outside. Dr. Brooks led Langdon to a tiny elevator and yanked open a folding door, herding Langdon into a cubicle that was about the size of a phone booth. The air inside smelled of MS cigarettes a bittersweet fragrance as ubiquitous in Italy as the aroma of fresh espresso. Ever so slightly, the smell helped clear Langdon's mind. Dr. Brooks pressed a button, and somewhere high above them, a series of tired gears clunked and whirred into motion. Upward. The creaky carriage shimmied and vibrated as it began its ascent. Because the walls were nothing but metal screens, Langdon found himself watching the inside of the elevator shaft slide rhythmically past them. Even in his semi-conscious state, Langdon's lifelong fear of cramped spaces was alive and well. Don't look. He leaned on the wall, trying to catch his breath. His forearm ached, and when he looked down, he saw that the sleeve of his Harris tweed had been tied awkwardly around his arm like a bandage. The remainder of the jacket was dragging behind him on the ground frayed and filthy. He closed his eyes against his pounding headache, but the blackness engulfed him again. A familiar vision materialized the statuesque, veiled woman with the amulet and silver hair in ringlets. As before, she was on the banks of a blood-red river and surrounded by writhing bodies. She spoke to Langdon, her voice pleading. Seek and ye shall find. Langdon was overcome with the feeling that he had to save her, save them all. The half-buried, upside-down legs were falling limp, one by one. Who are you? He called out in silence. What do you want? Her luxuriant silver hair began fluttering in a hot wind. Our time grows short, she whispered, touching her amulet necklace. Then, without warning, she erupted in a blinding pillar of fire, which billowed across the river, engulfing them both. Langdon shouted his eyes flying open. Dr. Brooks eyed him with concern. What is it? I keep hallucinating. Langdon exclaimed. The same scene. The silver-haired woman. And all the dead bodies. Langdon nodded, perspiration beating on his brow. You'll be okay, she assured him, despite sounding shaky herself. Recurring visions are common with amnesia. The brain function that sorts and catalogues your memories has been temporarily shaken up, and so it throws everything into one picture. Not a very nice picture, he managed. I know, but until you heal, your memories will be muddled and uncatalogued past, present, and imagination all mixed together. The same thing happens in dreams. The elevator lurched to a stop, and Dr. Brooks yanked open the folding door. They were walking again this time down a dark, narrow corridor. They passed a window, outside of which the murky silhouettes of Florence rooftops had begun emerging in the pre-dawn light. At the far end of the hall, she crouched down and retrieved a key from beneath a thirsty-looking houseplant and unlocked a door. 
The apartment was tiny, the air inside hinting at an ongoing battle between a vanilla-scented candle and old carpeting. The furniture and artwork were meager at best as if she had furnished it at a yard sale. Dr. Brooks adjusted a thermostat, and the radiators banged to life. She stood a moment and closed her eyes, exhaling heavily, as if to collect herself. Then she turned and helped Langdon into a modest kitchenette whose formica table had two flimsy chairs. Langdon made a move toward a chair in hopes of sitting down, but Dr. Brooks grabbed his arm with one hand and opened a cabinet with her other. The cabinet was nearly bare, crackers, a few bags of pasta, a can of coke, and a bottle of nodos. She took out the bottle and dumped six caplets into Langdon's palm. Caffeine, she said. For when I work night shifts like tonight. Langdon put the pills in his mouth and glanced around for some water. Chew them, she said. They'll hit your system faster and help counteract the sedative. Langdon began chewing and instantly cringed. The pills were bitter, clearly meant to be swallowed whole. Dr. Brooks opened the refrigerator and handed Langdon a half-empty bottle of San Pellegrino. He gratefully took a long drink. The ponytailed doctor now took his right arm and removed the makeshift bandage that she'd fashioned out of his jacket, which she laid on the kitchen table. Then she carefully examined his wound. As she held his bare arm, Langdon could feel her slender hands trembling. You'll live, she announced. Langdon hoped she was going to be okay. He could barely fathom what they'd both just endured. Dr. Brooks, he said, we need to call somebody. The consulate, the police. Somebody. She nodded in agreement. Also, you can stop calling me Dr. Brooks my name is Sienna. Langdon nodded. Thanks. I'm Robert. It seemed the bond they'd just forged fleeing for their lives warranted a first name basis. You said you're British. By birth, yes. I don't hear an accent. Good, she replied. I worked hard to lose it. Langdon was about to inquire why, but Sienna motioned for him to follow. She led him down a narrow corridor to a small, gloomy bathroom. In the mirror above the sink, Langdon glimpsed his reflection for the first time since seeing it in the window of his hospital room. Not good. Langdon's thick dark hair was matted, and his eyes looked bloodshot and weary. A shroud of stubble obscured his jaw. Sienna turned on the faucet and guided Langdon's injured forearm under the ice-cold water. It stung sharply, but he held it there wincing. Sienna retrieved a fresh washcloth and squirted it with antibacterial soap. You may want to look away. It's fine. I'm not bothered by Sienna began scrubbing violently, and white-hot pain shot up Langdon's arm. He clenched his jaw to prevent himself from shouting out in protest. You don't want an infection, she said, scrubbing harder now. Besides, if you're going to call the authorities, you'll want to be more alert than you are now. Nothing activates adrenaline production like pain. Langdon held on for what felt like a full ten seconds of scrubbing before he forcefully yanked his arm away. Enough. Admittedly, he felt stronger and more awake, the pain in his arm had now entirely overshadowed his headache. Good, she said, turning off the water and patting his arm dry with a clean towel. Sienna then applied a small bandage to his forearm but as she did so, Langdon found himself distracted by something he had just noticed something deeply upsetting to him. For nearly four decades, Langdon had worn an antique collector's edition Mickey Mouse timepiece, a gift from his parents. Mickey's smiling face and wildly waving arms had always served as his daily reminder to smile more often and take life a little less seriously. My, watch, Langdon stammered. It's gone. Without it he felt suddenly incomplete. Was I wearing it when I arrived at the hospital? Sienna shot him an incredulous look, clearly mystified that he could be worried about such a trivial thing. I don't remember any watch. Just clean yourself up. I'll be back in a few minutes and we'll figure out how to get you some help. She turned to go, but paused in the doorway, locking eyes with him in the mirror. And while I'm gone, I suggest you think very hard about why someone would want to kill you. 
I imagine it's the first question the authorities will ask. Wait, where are you going? You can't talk to the police half naked. I'm going to find you some clothes. My neighbor is about your size. He's away, and I'm feeding his cat. He owes me. With that, Sienna was gone. Robert Langdon turned back to the tiny mirror over the sink and barely recognized the person staring back at him. Someone wants me dead. In his mind, he again heard the recording of his own delirious mumblings. Very sorry. Very sorry. He probed his memory for some recollection, anything at all. He saw only emptiness. All Langdon knew was that he was in Florence, having suffered a bullet wound to the head. As Langdon stared into his own weary eyes, he half wondered if he might at any moment wake up in his reading chair at home, clutching an empty martini glass and a copy of Dead Souls, only to remind himself that Bombay Sapphire and Gogol should never be mixed. Chapter 7 Langdon shed his bloody hospital gown and wrapped a towel around his waist. After splashing water on his face, he gingerly touched the stitches on the back of his head. The skin was sore, but when he smoothed his matted hair down over the spot, the injury all but disappeared. The caffeine pills were kicking in, and he finally felt the fog beginning to lift. Think, Robert. Try to remember. The windowless bathroom was suddenly feeling claustrophobic, and Langdon stepped into the hall, moving instinctively toward a shaft of natural light that spilled through a partially open door across the corridor. The room was a makeshift study of sorts, with a cheap desk, a worn swivel chair, assorted books on the floor, and, thankfully, a window. Langdon moved toward daylight. In the distance, the rising Tuscan sun was just beginning to kiss the highest spires of the waking city the Campanile, the Badia, the Bargello. Langdon pressed his forehead to the cool glass. The March air was crisp and cold, amplifying the full spectrum of sunlight that now peaked up over the hillsides. Painter's light, they called it. At the heart of the skyline, a mountainous dome of red tiles rose up its zenith adorned with a gilt copper ball that glinted like a beacon. I El Duomo. Brunelleschi had made architectural history by engineering the basilica's massive dome, and now, more than 500 years later, the 375-foot-tall structure still stood its ground, an immovable giant on Piazza del Duomo. Why would I be in Florence? For Langdon, a lifelong aficionado of Italian art, Florence had become one of his favorite destinations in all of Europe. This was the city on whose streets Michelangelo played as a child, and in whose studios the Italian Renaissance had ignited. This was Florence, whose galleries lured millions of travelers to admire Botticelli's Birth of Venus, Leonardo's Annunciation, and the city's pride and joy Il Davide. Langdon had been mesmerized by Michelangelo's David when he first saw it as a teenager, entering the Accademia del Bel Arti, moving slowly through the somber phalanx of Michelangelo's crude Prigioni, and then feeling his gaze dragged upward, inexorably, to the 17-foot-tall masterpiece. The David S. sheer enormity and defined musculature startled most first-time visitors, and yet for Langdon, it had been the genius of David's pose that he found most captivating. Michelangelo had employed the classical tradition of contraposto to create the illusion that David was leaning to his right, his left leg bearing almost no weight, when, in fact, his left leg was supporting tons of marble. The David had sparked in Langdon his first true appreciation for the power of great sculpture. Now Langdon wondered if he had visited the masterpiece during the last several days, but the only memory he could conjure was that of awakening in the hospital and watching an innocent doctor murdered before his eyes. Very sorry. Very sorry. The guilt he felt was almost nauseating. What have I done? As he stood at the window, his peripheral vision caught a glimpse of a laptop computer sitting on the desk beside him. Whatever had happened to Langdon last night, he suddenly realized, might be in the news. If I can access the internet, I might find answers. Langdon turned toward the doorway and called out, Sienna. Silence. She was still at the neighbor's apartment looking for clothes. Having no doubt Sienna would understand the intrusion, Langdon opened the laptop and powered it up. 
Sienna's home screen flickered to life a standard Windows blue cloud background. Langdon immediately went to the Google Italia search page and typed in Robert Langdon. If my students could see me now, he thought as he began the search. Langdon continually admonished his students for Googling themselves a bizarre new pastime that reflected the obsession with personal celebrity that now seemed to possess American youth. A page of search results materialized hundreds of hits pertaining to Langdon, his books, and his lectures. Not what I'm looking for. Langdon restricted the search by selecting the news button. A fresh page appeared, news results for Robert Langdon. Book signings, Robert Langdon to appear. Graduation address by Robert Langdon. Robert Langdon publishes symbol primer for. The list was several pages long, and yet Langdon saw nothing recent certainly nothing that would explain his current predicament. What happened last night? Langdon pushed on, accessing the website for the Florentine, an English language newspaper published in Florence. He scanned the headlines, breaking news sections, and police blog seeing articles on an apartment fire, a government embezzling scandal, and assorted incidents of petty crime. Anything at all. He paused at a breaking news blurb about a city official who, last night, had died of a heart attack in the plaza outside the cathedral. The official's name had yet to be released, but no foul play was suspected. Finally, not knowing what else to do, Langdon logged on to his Harvard email account and checked his messages wondering if he might find answers there. All he found was the usual stream of mail from colleagues, students, and friends, much of it referencing appointments for the coming week. It's as if nobody knows I'm gone. With rising uncertainty, Langdon shut down the computer and closed the lid. He was about to leave when something caught his eye. On the corner of Sienna's desk, atop a stack of old medical journals and papers, sat a Polaroid photograph. The snapshot was of Sienna Brooks and her bearded doctor colleague, laughing together in a hospital hallway. Dr. Marconi, Langdon thought, racked with guilt as he picked up the photo and studied it. As Langdon replaced the photo on the stack of books, he noticed with surprise the yellow booklet on top a tattered playbill from the London Globe Theatre. According to the cover, it was for a production of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, staged nearly 25 years ago. Scrawled across the top of the playbill was a handwritten message in magic marker, Sweetheart, never forget you're a miracle. Langdon picked up the playbill, and a stack of press clippings fell out onto the desk. He quickly tried to replace them, but as he opened the booklet to the weathered page where the clippings had been, he stopped short. He was staring at a cast photo of the child actor portraying Shakespeare's mischievous sprite Puck. The photo showed a young girl who could not have been more than five, her blonde hair in a familiar ponytail. The text below her photo read, A Star is Born. The bio was a gushing account of a child theater prodigy Sienna Brooks with an off-the-chart IQ, who had, in a single night, memorized every character's lines and, during initial rehearsals, often cued her fellow cast members. Among this five-year-old's hobbies were violin, chess, biology, and chemistry. The child of a wealthy couple in the London suburb of Blackheath, the girl was already a celebrity in scientific circles, at the age of four, she had beat a chess grandmaster at his own game and was reading in three languages. My God, Langdon thought. Sienna. That explains a few things. Langdon recalled one of Harvard's most famous graduates had been a child prodigy named Saul Kripke, who at the age of six had taught himself Hebrew and read all of the works of Descartes by the age of twelve. More recently, Langdon recalled reading about a young phenom named Moshe Kai Kavalin, who, at age eleven, had earned a college degree with a 4.0 grade point average and won a national title in martial arts, and, at fourteen, published a book titled We Can Do. Langdon picked up another press clipping, a newspaper article with a photo of Sienna at age 7, Child Genius Displays 208 IQ. Langdon had been unaware that IQs even went that high. According to the article, Sienna Brooks was a virtuoso violinist, could master a new language in a month, and was teaching herself anatomy and physiology. He looked at another clipping from a medical journal, The Future of Thought, 
not all minds are created equal. This article had a photo of Sienna, now maybe 10 years old, still a towhead, standing beside a large piece of medical apparatus. The article contained an interview with a doctor, who explained that PET scans of Sienna's cerebellum revealed that it was physically different from other cerebella, in her case a larger, more streamlined organ capable of manipulating visual spatial content in ways that most human beings could not begin to fathom. The doctor equated Sienna's physiological advantage to an unusually accelerated cellular growth in her brain, much like a cancer, except that it accelerated growth of beneficial brain tissue rather than dangerous cancer cells. Langdon found a clipping from a small town newspaper. The Curse of Brilliance There was no photo this time, but the story told of a young genius, Sienna Brooks, who had tried to attend regular schools but was teased by other students because she didn't fit in. It talked about the isolation felt by gifted young people whose social skills could not keep up with their intellects and who were often ostracized. Sienna, according to this article, had run away from home at the age of eight, and had been smart enough to live on her own undiscovered for ten days. She had been found in an upscale London hotel, where she had pretended to be the daughter of a guest, stolen a key, and was ordering room service on someone else's account. Apparently she had spent the week reading all 1,600 pages of Grey's Anatomy. When authorities asked why she was reading medical texts, she told them she wanted to figure out what was wrong with her brain. Langdon's heart went out to the little girl. He couldn't imagine how lonely it must be for a child to be so profoundly different. He refolded the articles, pausing for one last look at the photo of the five-year-old Sienna in the role of Puck. Langdon had to admit, considering the surreal quality of his encounter with Sienna this morning, that her role as the mischievous, dream-inducing sprite seemed strangely apartment Langdon only wished that he, like the characters in the play, could now simply wake up and pretend that his most recent experiences were all a dream. Langdon carefully replaced all the clippings on the proper page and closed the playbill, feeling an unexpected melancholy as he again saw the note on the cover, Sweetheart, never forget you're a miracle. His eyes moved down to the familiar symbol adorning the cover of the playbill. It was the same early Greek pictogram that adorned most playbills around the world a 2,500-year-old symbol that had become synonymous with dramatic theater. L.E. Mascara Langdon looked at the iconic faces of comedy and tragedy gazing up at him, and suddenly he heard a strange humming in his ears as if a wire were slowly being pulled taut inside his mind. A stab of pain erupted inside his skull. Visions of a mask floated before his eyes. Langdon gasped and raised his hands, sitting down in the desk chair and closing his eyes tightly, clutching at his scalp. In his darkness, the bizarre visions returned with a fury, stark and vivid. The silver-haired woman with the amulet was calling to him again from across a blood-red river. Her shouts of desperation pierced the putrid air, clearly audible over the sounds of the tortured and dying, who thrashed in agony as far as the eye could see. Langdon again saw the upside-down legs adorned with the letter R, the half-buried body pedaling its legs in wild desperation in the air. Seek and find. The woman called to Langdon. Time is running out. Langdon again felt the overwhelming need to help her, to help everyone. Frantic, he shouted back to her across the blood-red river. Who are you? Once again, the woman reached up and lifted her veil to reveal the same striking visage that Langdon had seen earlier. I am life, she said. Without warning, a colossal image materialized in the sky above her a fearsome mask with a long, beak-like nose and two fiery green eyes which stared blankly out at Langdon. And. I am death, the voice boomed. Chapter 8 Langdon's eyes shot open, and he drew a startled breath. He was still seated at Sienna's desk, head in his hands, heart pounding wildly. What the hell is happening to me? The images of the silver-haired woman and the beaked mask lingered in his mind. I am life. I am death. He tried to shake the vision but it felt seared permanently into his mind. On the desk before him, the playbill's two masks stared up at him. Your memories will be muddled and uncatalogued, Sienna had told him. Past, present and imagination all mixed together. 
Langdon felt dizzy. Somewhere in the apartment, a phone was ringing. It was a piercing, old-fashioned ring, coming from the kitchen. Sienna. Langdon called out, standing up. No response. She had not yet returned. After only two rings, an answering machine picked up. Ciao, Sono Io, Sienna's voice happily declared on her outgoing message. La Siatimi on Mesagio E6 Ricciamero. There was a beep, and a panicked woman began leaving a message in a thick Eastern European accent. Her voice echoed down the hall. Sienna, E's Dani Kova. Where you? E's terrible. Your friend Dr. Marconi, he dead. Hospital going crazy. Police come here. People telling them you running out trying to save patient. Why? You don't know him. Now police want to talk to you. They take employee file. I know information wrong bad address, no numbers, fake working visas so they no find you today, but soon they find. I try to warn you. So sorry, Sienna. The call ended. Langdon felt a fresh wave of remorse engulfing him. From the sounds of the message, Dr. Marconi had been permitting Sienna to work at the hospital. Now Langdon's presence had cost Marconi his life, and Sienna's instinct to save a stranger had dire implications for her future. Just then a door closed loudly at the far end of the apartment. She's back. A moment later, the answering machine blared. Sienna, ease Danny Kova. Where you? Langdon winced, knowing what Sienna was about to hear. As the message played, Langdon quickly put away the playbill, neatening the desk. Then he slipped back across the hall into the bathroom, feeling uncomfortable about his glimpse into Sienna's past. Ten seconds later, there was a soft knock on the bathroom door. I'll leave your clothes on the doorknob, Sienna said, her voice ragged with emotion. Thank you so much. Langdon replied. When you're done, please come out to the kitchen, she added. There's something important I need to show you before we call anyone. Sienna walked tiredly down the hall to the apartment's modest bedroom. Retrieving a pair of blue jeans and a sweater from the dresser, she carried them into her bathroom. Locking her eyes with her own reflection in the mirror, she reached up, grabbed a clutch of her thick blonde ponytail, and pulled down hard sliding the wig from her bald scalp. A hairless 32-year-old woman stared back at her from the mirror. Sienna had endured no shortage of challenges in her life, and although she had trained herself to rely on intellect to overcome hardship, her current predicament had shaken her on a deeply emotional level. She set the wig aside and washed her face and hands. After drying off, she changed her clothes and put the wig back on, straightening it carefully. Self-pity was an impulse Sienna seldom tolerated, but now, as the tears welled up from deep within, she knew she had no choice but to let them come. And so she did. She cried for the life she could not control. She cried for the mentor who had died before her eyes. She cried for the profound loneliness that filled her heart. But, above all, she cried for the future, which suddenly felt so uncertain. Chapter 9 Below Decks on the Luxury Vessel The Mendacium, Facilitator Lawrence Knowlton sat in his sealed glass cubicle and stared in disbelief at his computer monitor, having just previewed the video their client had left behind. I'm supposed to upload this to the media tomorrow morning? In his ten years with the consortium, Knowlton had performed all kinds of strange tasks that he knew fell somewhere between dishonest and illegal. Working within a moral grey area was commonplace at the consortium an organization whose lone ethical high ground was that they would do whatever it took to keep a promise to a client. We follow through. No questions asked. No matter what. The prospect of uploading this video, however, had left Knowlton unsettled. In the past, no matter what bizarre tasks he had performed, he always understood the rationale, grasped the motives comprehended the desired outcome. And yet this video was baffling. Something about it felt different. Much different. Sitting back down at his computer, Knowlton restarted the video file, hoping a second viewing might shed more light. 
he turned up the volume and settled in for the nine-minute show. As before, the video began with the soft lapping of water in the eerie water-filled cavern where everything was bathed in a numinous red light. Again the camera plunged down through the surface of the illuminated water to view the silt-covered floor of the cavern. And again, Nalton read the text on the submerged plaque, in this place, on this date, the world was changed forever. That the polished plaque was signed by the consortium's client was disquieting. That the date was tomorrow, left Nalton increasingly concerned. It was what followed, however, that had truly set Nalton on edge. The camera now panned to the left to reveal a startling object hovering underwater just beside the plaque. Here, tethered to the floor by a short filament, was an undulating sphere of thin plastic. Delicate and wobbling like an oversized soap bubble, the transparent shape floated like an underwater balloon, inflated not with helium, but with some kind of gelatinous, yellow-brown liquid. The amorphous bag was distended and appeared to be about a foot in diameter, and within its transparent walls, the murky cloud of liquid seemed to swirl slowly, like the eye of a silently growing storm. Jesus, Nalton thought, feeling clammy. The suspended bag looked even more ominous the second time around. Slowly, the image faded to black. A new image appeared the cavern's damp wall, dancing with the rippling reflections of the illuminated lagoon. On the wall, a shadow appeared, the shadow of a man, standing in the cavern. But the man's head was misshapen, badly. Instead of a nose, the man had a long beak, as if he were half-bird. When he spoke, his voice was muffled, and he spoke with an eerie eloquence, a measured cadence, as if he were the narrator in some kind of classical chorus. Nalton sat motionless, barely breathing, as the beaked shadow spoke. I am the shade. If you are watching this, then it means my soul is finally at rest. Driven underground, I must speak to the world from deep within the earth, exiled to this gloomy cavern where the bloodred waters collect in the lagoon that reflects no stars. But this is my paradise, the perfect womb for my fragile child. Inferno. Soon you will know what I have left behind. And yet, even here, I sense the footfalls of the ignorant souls who pursue me, willing to stop at nothing to thwart my actions. Forgive them, you might say, for they know not what they do. But there comes a moment in history when ignorance is no longer a forgivable offense, a moment when only wisdom has the power to absolve. With purity of conscience, I have bequeathed to you all the gift of hope, of salvation, of tomorrow. And yet still there are those who hunt me like a dog, fueled by the self-righteous belief that I am a madman. There is the silver-haired beauty who dares call me monster. Like the blind clerics who lobbied for the death of Copernicus, she scorns me as a demon, terrified that I have glimpsed the truth. But I am not a prophet. I am your salvation. I am the shade. Chapter 10 Have a seat, Sienna said. I have some questions for you. As Langdon entered the kitchen, he felt much steadier on his feet. He was wearing the neighbor's Brioni suit, which fit remarkably well. Even the loafers were comfortable, and Langdon made a mental note to switch to Italian footwear when he got home. If I get home, he thought. Sienna was transformed a natural beauty having changed into form-fitting jeans and a cream-colored sweater, both of which complemented her lithe figure. Her hair was still pulled back in a ponytail, and without the authoritative air of medical scrubs, she seemed more vulnerable somehow. Langdon noticed her eyes were red, as if she had been crying, and an overwhelming guilt again gripped him. Sienna, I'm so sorry. I heard the phone message. I don't know what to say. Thanks, she replied. But we need to focus on you at the moment. Please sit down. Her tone was firmer now conjuring memories of the articles Langdon had just read about her intellect and precocious childhood. I need you to think, Sienna said, motioning for him to sit. Can you remember how we got to this apartment? Langdon wasn't sure how it was relevant. In a taxi, he said, sitting down at the table. Someone was shooting at us. Shooting at you, Professor. Let's be clear on that. Yes. Sorry. 
And do you remember any gunshots while you were in the cab? Odd question. Yes, two of them. One hit the side mirror, and the other broke the rear window. Good, now close your eyes. Langdon realized she was testing his memory. He closed his eyes. What am I wearing? Langdon could see her perfectly. Black flats, blue jeans, and a cream v-neck sweater. Your hair is blonde, shoulder length, pulled back. Your eyes are brown. Langdon opened his eyes and studied her, pleased to see his eidetic memory was functioning normally. Good. Your visual cognitive imprinting is excellent, which confirms your amnesia is fully retrograde, and you have no permanent damage to the memory-making process. Have you recalled anything new from the last few days? No, unfortunately. I did have another wave of visions while you were gone, though. Langdon told her about the recurrence of his hallucination of the veiled woman, the throngs of dead people, and the writhing, half-buried legs marked with the letter R. Then he told her about the strange, beaked mask hovering in the sky. I am death. Sienna asked, looking troubled. That's what it said, yes. Okay. I guess that beats I am Vishnu, destroyer of worlds. The young woman had just quoted Robert Oppenheimer at the moment he tested the first atomic bomb. And this beak-nosed, green-eyed mask. Sienna said, looking puzzled. Do you have any idea why your mind might have conjured that image? No idea at all, but that style of mask was quite common in the Middle Ages. Langdon paused. It's called a plague mask. Sienna looked strangely unnerved. A plague mask. Langdon quickly explained that in his world of symbols, the unique shape of the long-beaked mask was nearly synonymous with the Black Death the deadly plague that swept through Europe in the 1300s, killing off a third of the population in some regions. Most believed the Black and Black Death was a reference to the darkening of the victim's flesh through gangrene and subepidermal hemorrhages, but in fact the word black was a reference to the profound emotional dread that the pandemic spread through the population. That long-beaked mask, Langdon said, was worn by medieval plague doctors to keep the pestilence far from their nostrils while treating the infected. Nowadays, you only see them worn as costumes during Venice Carnavali an eerie reminder of a grim period in Italy's history. And you're certain you saw one of these masks in your visions? Sienna asked her voice now tremulous. A mask of a medieval plague doctor. Langdon nodded. A beaked mask is hard to mistake. Sienna was knitting her brow in a way that gave Langdon the sense she was trying to figure out how best to give him some bad news. And the woman kept telling you to seek and find. Yes. Just as before. But the problem is, I have no idea what I'm supposed to seek. Sienna let out a long slow breath her expression grave. I think I may know. And what's more? I think you may have already found it. Langdon stared. What are you talking about? Robert, last night when you arrived at the hospital, you were carrying something unusual in your jacket pocket. Do you recall what it was? Langdon shook his head. You were carrying an object, a rather startling object. I found it by chance when we were cleaning you up. She motioned to Langdon's bloody Harris tweed, which was laid out flat on the table. It's still in the pocket, if you'd like to have a look. Uncertain, Langdon eyed his jacket. At least that explains why she went back for my jacket. He grabbed his blood-stained coat and searched all the pockets, one by one. Nothing. He did it again. Finally, he turned to her with a shrug. There's nothing here. How about the secret pocket? What? My jacket doesn't have a secret pocket. No. She looked puzzled. Then is this jacket, someone else's? Langdon's brain felt muddled again. No, this is my jacket. You're certain? Damned certain, he thought. In fact, it used to be my favorite Camberley. He folded back the lining and showed Sienna the label bearing his favorite symbol in the fashion world Harris Tweed's iconic orb adorned with 13 button-like jewels and topped by a Maltese cross. 
leave it to the Scots to invoke the Christian warriors on a piece of twill. Look at this, Langdon said, pointing out the hand-embroidered initials RL that had been added to the label. He always sprang for Harris Tweed's hand-tailored models, and for that reason, he always paid extra to have them sew his initials into the label. On a college campus where hundreds of tweed jackets were constantly doffed and donned in dining halls and classrooms, Langdon had no intention of getting the short end of an inadvertent trade. I believe you, she said, taking the jacket from him. Now you look. Sienna opened the jacket farther to reveal the lining near the nape of the back. Here, discreetly hidden in the lining, was a large, neatly fashioned pocket. What the hell? Langdon was certain he had never seen this before. The pocket consisted of a hidden seam, perfectly tailored. That wasn't there before. Langdon insisted. Then I'm imagining you've never seen, this. Sienna reached into the pocket and extracted a sleek metal object, which she set gently in Langdon's hands. Langdon stared down at the object in utter bewilderment. Do you know what this is? Sienna asked. No, he stammered. I've never seen anything like it. Well, unfortunately, I do know what this is. And I'm fairly certain it's the reason someone is trying to kill you. Now pacing his private cubicle aboard the Mendacium, facilitator Nalton felt an increasing disquiet as he considered the video he was supposed to share with the world tomorrow morning. I am the shade? Rumors had circulated that this particular client had suffered a psychotic break over the last few months, but this video seemed to confirm those rumors beyond any doubt. Nalton knew he had two choices. He could either prepare the video for delivery tomorrow as promised, or he could take it upstairs to the provost for a second opinion. I already know his opinion, Nalton thought, having never witnessed the provost take any action other than the one promised a client. He'll tell me to upload this video to the world, no questions asked, and he'll be furious at me for asking. Nalton returned his attention to the video, which he rewound to a particularly unsettling spot. He started the playback, and the eerily illuminated cavern reappeared accompanied by the sounds of lapping water. The humanoid shadow loomed on the dripping wall a tall man with a long, bird-like beak. In a muffled voice, the deformed shadow spoke. These are the new Dark Ages. Centuries ago, Europe was in the depths of its own misery the population huddled, starving, mired in sin and hopelessness. They were as a congested forest, suffocated by deadwood, awaiting God's lightning strike the spark that would finally ignite the fire that would rage across the land and clear the deadwood, once again bringing sunshine to the healthy roots. Calling is God's natural order. Ask yourself, what followed the Black Death? We all know the answer. The Renaissance. Rebirth. It has always been this way. Death is followed by birth. To reach paradise, man must pass through inferno. This, the Master taught us. And yet the silver-haired ignorant dares call me monster? Does she still not grasp the mathematics of the future? The horrors it will bring? I am the shade. I am your salvation. And so I stand, deep within this cavern, gazing out across the lagoon that reflects no stars. Here in this sunken palace, inferno smolders beneath the waters. Soon it will burst into flames. And when it does, nothing on earth will be able to stop it. Chapter 11 The object in Langdon's hand felt surprisingly heavy for its size. Slender and smooth, the polished metal cylinder was about six inches long and rounded at both ends like a miniature torpedo. Before you handle that too roughly, Sienna offered, you may want to look at the other side. She gave him a taut smile. You say you're a professor of symbols. Langdon refocused on the tube, turning it in his hands until a bright red symbol rolled into view, emblazoned on its side. Instantly, his body tensed. As a student of iconography, Langdon knew that precious few images had the power to instill instantaneous fear in the human mind, but the symbol before him definitely made the list. His reaction was visceral and immediate, he placed the tube on the table and slid back his chair. Sienna nodded. Yeah, that was my reaction, too. 
The marking on the tube was a simple trilateral icon. This notorious symbol, Langdon had once read, was developed by Dow Chemical in the 1960s to replace an array of impotent warning graphics previously in use. Like all successful symbols, this one was simple, distinctive, and easy to reproduce. Cleverly conjuring associations with everything from crab pincers to ninja hurling knives, the modern biohazard symbol had become a global brand that conveyed danger in every language. This little canister is a biotube, Sienna said. Used for transporting dangerous substances. We see these occasionally in the medical field. Inside is a foam sleeve into which you can insert a specimen tube for safe transport. In this case, she pointed to the biohazard symbol. I'm guessing a deadly chemical agent, or maybe a, virus. She paused. The first Ebola samples were brought back from Africa in a tube similar to this one. This was not at all what Langdon wanted to hear. What the hell is it doing in my jacket? I'm an art history professor, why am I carrying this thing? Violent images of writhing bodies flashed through his mind, and hovering over them, the plague mask. Very sorry. Very sorry. Wherever this came from, Sienna said. This is a very high-end unit. Lead-line titanium. Virtually impenetrable, even to radiation. I'm guessing government issue. She pointed to a postage stamp size black pad flanking the biohazard symbol. Thumbprint recognition. Security in case it's lost or stolen. Tubes like this can be opened only by a specified individual. Although Langdon sensed his mind now working at normal speed he still felt as if he were struggling to catch up. I've been carrying a biometrically sealed canister. When I discovered this canister in your jacket, I wanted to show Dr. Marconi privately, but I didn't have an opportunity before you woke up. I considered trying your thumb on the pad while you were unconscious, but I had no idea what was in the tube, and my thumb. Langdon shook his head. There's no way this thing is programmed for me to open it. I don't know anything about biochemistry. I'd never have anything like this. Are you sure? Langdon was damned sure. He reached out and placed his thumb on the finger pad. Nothing happened. See. I told the titanium tube clicked loudly, and Langdon yanked his hand back as if it had been burned. Holy shit. He stared at the canister as if it were about to unscrew itself and start emitting a deadly gas. After three seconds, it clicked again, apparently relocking itself. Speechless, Langdon turned to Sienna. The young doctor exhaled, looking unnerved. Well, it seems pretty clear that the intended carrier is you. For Langdon, the entire scenario felt incongruous. That's impossible. First of all, how would I get this chunk of metal through airport security? Maybe you flew in on a private jet? Or maybe it was given to you when you arrived in Italy. Sienna, I need to call the consulate. Right away. You don't think we should open it first? Langdon had taken some ill-advised actions in his life, but opening a hazardous materials container in this woman's kitchen would not be one of them. I'm handing this thing over to the authorities. Now. Sienna pursed her lips, mulling over options. Okay but as soon as you make that call, you're on your own. I can't be involved. You definitely can't meet them here. My immigration situation in Italy is, complicated. Langdon looked Sienna in the eye. All I know, Sienna, is that you saved my life. I'll handle this situation however you want me to handle it. She gave a grateful nod and walked over to the window, gazing down at the street below. Okay. This is how we should do it. Sienna quickly outlined a plan. It was simple, clever, and safe. Langdon waited as she turned on her cell phone's caller ID blocking and dialed. Her fingers were delicate and yet moved purposefully. Informaccioni Abinati. Sienna said, speaking in a flawless Italian accent. Per favore, pio darmi il numero del consolato americano differenza. She waited and then quickly wrote down a phone number. Grazie mille, she said, and hung up. 
Sienna slid the phone number over to Langdon along with her cell phone. You're on. Do you remember what to say? My memory is fine, he said with a smile as he dialed the number on the slip of paper. The line began to ring. Here goes nothing. He switched the call to speaker and set the phone on the table so Sienna could hear. A recorded message answered, offering general information about consulate services and hours of operation, which did not begin until 8.30 a.m. Langdon checked the clock on the cell. It was only 6 a.m. If this is an emergency, the automated recording said, you may dial 77 to speak to the night duty officer. Langdon immediately dialed the extension. The line was ringing again. Consolato Americano, a tired voice answered. Sono il funzionario di turno. Le parla inglese. Langdon asked. Of course, the man said in American English. He sounded vaguely annoyed to have been awoken. How can I help you? I'm an American visiting Florence and I was attacked. My name is Robert Langdon. Passport number, please. The man yawned audibly. My passport is missing. I think it was stolen. I was shot in the head. I've been in the hospital. I need help. The attendant suddenly woke up. Sir? Did you say you were shot? What was your full name again, please? Robert Langdon. There was a rustling on the line and then Langdon could hear the man's fingers typing on a keyboard. The computer pinged. A pause. Then more fingers on the keyboard. Another ping. Then three high-pitched pings. A longer pause. Sir, the man said. Your name is Robert Langdon. Yes, that's right. And I'm in trouble. Okay, sir, your name has an action flag on it, which is directing me to transfer you immediately to the Consul General's Chief Administrator. The man paused as if he himself couldn't believe it. Just hold the line. Wait. Can you tell me the line was already ringing? It rang four times and connected. This is Collins, a hoarse voice answered. Langdon took a deep breath and spoke as calmly and clearly as possible. Mr. Collins, my name is Robert Langdon. I'm an American visiting Florence. I've been shot. I need help. I want to come to the U.S. consulate immediately. Can you help me? Without hesitation, the deep voice replied, Thank heavens you're alive, Mr. Langdon. We've been looking for you. Chapter 12 The consulate knows I'm here? For Langdon, the news brought an instantaneous flood of relief. Mr. Collins who had introduced himself as the Consul General's Chief Administrator spoke with a firm, professional cadence and yet there was urgency in his voice. Mr. Langdon, you and I need to speak immediately. And obviously not on the phone. Nothing was obvious to Langdon at this point, but he wasn't about to interrupt. I'll have someone pick you up right away, Collins said. What is your location? Sienna shifted nervously listening to the interchange on speakerphone. Langdon gave her a reassuring nod, fully intending to follow her plan exactly. I'm in a small hotel called Pensioni La Fiorentina, Langdon said, glancing across the street at the drab hotel that Sienna had pointed out moments ago. He gave Collins the street address. Got it, the man replied. Don't move. Stay in your room. Someone will be there right away. Room number. Langdon made one up. 39. Okay. 20 minutes. Collins lowered his voice. And, Mr. Langdon, it sounds like you may be injured and confused, but I need to know, are you still in possession? In possession. Langdon sensed the question, while cryptic, could have only one meaning. His eyes moved to the biotub on the kitchen table. Yes. Sir. I'm still in possession. Collins exhaled audibly. When we didn't hear from you, we assumed, well, frankly, we assumed the worst. I'm relieved. Stay where you are. Don't move. Twenty minutes. Someone will knock on your door. Collins hung up. 
Langdon could feel his shoulders relaxing for the first time since he'd woken up in the hospital. The consulate knows what's going on, and soon I'll have answers. Langdon closed his eyes and let out a slow breath, feeling almost human now. His headache had all but passed. Well, that was all very MI6, Sienna said in a half-joking tone. Are you a spy? At the moment Langdon had no idea what he was. The notion that he could lose two days of memory and find himself in an unrecognizable situation felt incomprehensible, and yet here he was, twenty minutes away from a rendezvous with a U.S. consulate official in a rundown hotel. What's happening here? He glanced over at Siena, realizing they were about to part ways and yet feeling as if they had unfinished business. He pictured the bearded doctor at the hospital, dying on the floor before her eyes. Siena, he whispered, your friend. Dr. Marconi. I feel terrible. She nodded blankly. And I'm sorry to have dragged you into this. I know your situation at the hospital is unusual, and if there's an investigation, he trailed off. It's okay, she said. I'm no stranger to moving around. Langdon sensed in Sienna's distant eyes that everything had changed for her this morning. Langdon's own life was in chaos at the moment, and yet he felt his heart going out to this woman. She saved my life, and I've ruined hers. They sat in silence for a full minute, the air between them growing heavy, as if they both wanted to speak, and yet had nothing to say. They were strangers, after all, on a brief and bizarre journey that had just reached a fork in the road, each of them now needing to find separate paths Siena, Langdon finally said, when I sort this out with the consulate, if there's anything I can do to help you, please. Thanks, she whispered, and turned her eyes sadly toward the window. As the minutes ticked past, Sienna Brooks gazed absently out the kitchen window and wondered where the day would lead her. Wherever it was, she had no doubt that by day's end, her world would look a lot different. She knew it was probably just the adrenaline, but she found herself strangely attracted to the American professor. In addition to his being handsome, he seemed to possess a sincerely good heart. In some distant, alternate life, Robert Langdon might even be someone she could be with. He would never want me, she thought. I'm damaged. As she choked back the emotion, something outside the window caught her eye. She bolted upright, pressing her face to the glass and staring down into the street. Robert, look. Langdon peered down into the street at the sleek black BMW motorcycle that had just rumbled to a stop in front of Pensioni La Fiorentina. The driver was lean and strong, wearing a black leather suit and helmet. As the driver gracefully swung off the bike and removed a polished black helmet, Sienna could hear Langdon stop breathing. The woman's spiked hair was unmistakable. She produced a familiar handgun, checked the silencer, and slid it back inside her jacket pocket. Then, moving with lethal grace, she slipped inside the hotel. Robert, Sienna whispered her voice taut with fear. The U.S. government just sent someone to kill you. Chapter 13 Robert Langdon felt a swell of panic as he stood at the apartment window, eyes riveted on the hotel across the street. The spike-haired woman had just entered, but Langdon could not fathom how she had gotten the address. Adrenaline coursed through his system, disjointing his thought process once again. My own government sent someone to kill me. Sienna looked equally astounded. Robert, that means the original attempt on your life at the hospital also was sanctioned by your government. She got up and double-checked the lock on the apartment door. If the U.S. consulate has permission to kill you, she didn't finish the thought, but she didn't have to. The implications were terrifying. What the hell do they think I did? Why is my own government hunting me? Once again, Langdon heard the two words he had apparently been mumbling when he staggered into the hospital. Very sorry, very sorry. You're not safe here, Sienna said. We're not safe here. She motioned across the street. That woman saw us flee the hospital together, and I'm betting your government and the police are already trying to track me down. My apartment is a sublet in someone else's name, but they'll find me eventually. 
she turned her attention to the biotub on the table. You need to open that, right now. Langdon eyed the titanium device, seeing only the biohazard symbol. Whatever's inside that tube, Sienna said, probably has an ID code, an agency sticker, a phone number, something. You need information. I need information. Your government killed my friend. The pain in Sienna's voice shook Langdon from his thoughts, and he nodded, knowing she was correct. Yes, I'm, very sorry. Langdon cringed, hearing those words again. He turned to the canister on the table, wondering what answers might be hidden inside. It could be incredibly dangerous to open this. Sienna thought for a moment. Whatever's inside will be exceptionally well contained, probably in a shatterproof plexiglass test tube. This biotube is just an outer shell to provide additional security during transport. Langdon looked out the window at the black motorcycle parked in front of the hotel. The woman had not yet come out, but she would soon figure out that Langdon was not there. He wondered what her next move would be, and how long it would take before she was pounding on the apartment door. Langdon made up his mind. He lifted the titanium tube and reluctantly placed his thumb on the biometric pad. After a moment the canister pinged and then clicked loudly. Before the tube could lock itself again, Langdon twisted the two halves against each other in opposite directions. After a quarter turn, the canister pinged a second time, and Langdon knew he was committed. Langdon's hands felt sweaty as he continued unscrewing the tube. The two halves turned smoothly on perfectly machined threads. He kept twisting, feeling as if he were about to open a precious Russian nesting doll, except that he had no idea what might fall out. After five turns, the two halves released. With a deep breath, Langdon gently pulled them apart. The gap between the halves widened, and a foam rubber interior slid out. Langdon laid it on the table. The protective padding vaguely resembled an elongated Nerf football. Here goes nothing. Langdon gently folded back the top of the protective foam, finally revealing the object nestled inside. Sienna stared down at the contents and cocked her head, looking puzzled. Definitely not what I expected. Langdon had anticipated some kind of futuristic-looking vial, but the content of the biotube was anything but modern. The ornately carved object appeared to be made of ivory and was approximately the size of a roll of life savers. It looks old, Sienna whispered. Some kind of, cylinder seal, Langdon told her, finally permitting himself to exhale. Invented by the Sumerians in 3500 BC, cylinder seals were the precursors to the intaglio form of printmaking. Carved with decorative images, a seal contained a hollow shaft through which an axle pin was inserted so the carved drum could be rolled like a modern paint roller across wet clay or terracotta to imprint a recurring band of symbols, images, or text. This particular seal, Langdon guessed, was undoubtedly quite rare and valuable, and yet he still couldn't imagine why it would be locked in a titanium canister like some kind of bioweapon. As Langdon delicately turned the seal in his fingers, he realized that this one bore an especially gruesome carving a three-headed, Horn Satan who was in the process of eating three different men at once, one man in each of his three mouths. Pleasant. Langdon's eyes moved to seven letters carved beneath the devil. The ornate calligraphy was written in mirror image, as was all text on imprinting rollers, but Langdon had no trouble reading the letters Salgia. Sienna squinted at the text, reading it aloud. Salgia. Langdon nodded, feeling a chill to hear the words spoken aloud. It's a Latin mnemonic invented by the Vatican in the Middle Ages to remind Christians of the seven deadly sins. Salgia is an acronym for, Superbia, Avaricia, Luxuria, Invidia, Gula, Ira, and Acedia. Siena frowned. Pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. Langdon was impressed. You know Latin. I grew up Catholic. I know sin. Langdon managed a smile as he returned his gaze to the seal, wondering again why it had been locked in a biotube as if it were dangerous. I thought it was ivory, Sienna said. But it's bone. She slid the artifact into the sunlight and pointed to the lines on it. 
ivory forms in a diamond-shaped cross hatching with translucent striations, bones form with these parallel striations and darkened pitting. Langdon gently picked up the seal and examined the carvings more closely. The original Sumerian seals had been carved with rudimentary figures and cuneiform. This seal, however, was much more elaborately carved. Medieval, Langdon guessed. Furthermore, the embellishments suggested an unsettling connection with his hallucinations. Sienna eyed him with concern. What is it? Recurring theme, Langdon said grimly, and motioned to one of the carvings on the seal. See this three-headed, man-eating Satan? It's a common image from the Middle Ages an icon associated with the Black Death. The three gnashing mouths are symbolic of how efficiently the plague ate through the population. Sienna glanced uneasily at the biohazard symbol on the tube. Allusions to the plague seemed to be occurring with more frequency this morning than Langdon cared to admit, and so it was with reluctance that he acknowledged a further connection. Salgia is representative of the collective sins of mankind, which, according to medieval religious indoctrination was the reason God punished the world with the Black Death, Sienna said, completing his thought. Yes. Langdon paused momentarily losing his train of thought. He had just noticed something about the cylinder that struck him as odd. Normally, a person could peer through a cylinder seal's hollow center, as if through a section of empty pipe, but in this case, the shaft was blocked. There's something inserted inside this bone. The end caught the light and shimmered. There's something inside, Langdon said. And it looks like it's made of glass. He flipped the cylinder upside down to check the other end, and as he did so, a tiny object rattled inside, tumbling from one end of the bone to the other, like a ball bearing in a tube. Langdon froze, and he heard Sienna let out a soft gasp beside him. What the hell was that? Did you hear that sound? Sienna whispered. Langdon nodded and carefully peered into the end of the canister. The opening appears to be blocked by, something made of metal. The cap of a test tube, maybe? Sienna backed away. Does it look, broken? I don't think so. He carefully tipped the bone again to re-examine the glass end, and the rattling sound recurred. An instant later, the glass in the cylinder did something wholly unexpected. It began to glow. Sienna's eyes opened wide. Robert, stop. Don't move. Chapter 14 Langdon stood absolutely still, his hand in midair, holding the bone cylinder steady. Without a doubt, the glass at the end of the tube was emitting light, glowing as if the contents had suddenly awoken. Quickly, the light inside faded back to black. Sienna moved closer, breathing quickly. She tilted her head and studied the visible section of glass inside the bone. Tip it again, she whispered. Very slowly. Langdon gently turned the bone upside down. Again, a small object rattled the length of the bone and stopped. Once more, she said. Gently. Langdon repeated the process, and again the tube rattled. This time, the interior glass shimmered faintly, glowing again for an instant before it faded away. It's got to be a test tube, Sienna declared, with an agitator ball. Langdon was familiar with the agitator balls used in spray paint cans submerged pellets that helped stir the paint when the can was shaken. It probably contains some kind of phosphorescent chemical compound, Sienna said, or a bioluminescent organism that glows when it's stimulated. Langdon was having other ideas. While he had seen chemical glow sticks and even bioluminescent plankton that glowed when a boat churned up its habitat, he was nearly certain the cylinder in his hand contained neither of these things. He gently tipped the tube several more times, until it glowed, and then held the luminescent end over his palm. As expected, a faint reddish light appeared, projected onto his skin. Nice to know a 208 IQ can be wrong sometimes. Watch this, Langdon said, and began shaking the tube violently. The object inside rattled back and forth, faster and faster. Sienna jumped back. What are you doing? Still shaking the tube, Langdon walked over to the light switch and flipped it off, plunging the kitchen into relative darkness. It's not a test tube inside, 
he said, still shaking as hard as he could. It's a Faraday pointer. Langdon had once been given a similar device by one of his students a laser pointer for lecturers who disliked wasting endless AAA batteries and didn't mind the effort of shaking their pointer for a few seconds in order to transform their own kinetic energy into electricity on demand. When the device was agitated, a metal ball inside sailed back and forth across a series of paddles and powered a tiny generator. Apparently someone had decided to slide this particular pointer into a hollow, carved bone and ancient skin to she the modern electronic toy. The tip of the pointer in his hand was now glowing intensely, and Langdon gave Sienna an uneasy grin. Showtime! He aimed the bone-sheathed pointer at a bare space on the kitchen wall. When the wall lit up, Sienna drew a startled breath. It was Langdon, however, who physically recoiled in surprise. The light that appeared on the wall was not a little red laser dot. It was a vivid, high-definition photograph that emanated from the tube as if from an old-fashioned slide projector. My God! Langdon's hand trembled slightly as he absorbed the macabre scene projected on the wall before him. No wonder I've been seeing images of death. At his side, Sienna covered her mouth and took a tentative step forward, clearly entranced by what she was seeing. The scene projected out of the carved bone was a grim oil painting of human suffering thousands of souls undergoing wretched tortures in various levels of hell. The underworld was portrayed as a cutaway cross-section of the earth into which plunged a cavernous funnel-shaped pit of unfathomable depth. This pit of hell was divided into descending terraces of increasing misery, each level populated by tormented sinners of every kind. Langdon recognized the image at once. The masterpiece before him La Mappa dell'Inferno had been painted by one of the true giants of the Italian Renaissance, Sandro Botticelli. An elaborate blueprint of the underworld, the map of hell was one of the most frightening visions of the afterlife ever created. Dark, grim, and terrifying, the painting stopped people in their tracks even today. Unlike his vibrant and colorful Primavera or Birth of Venus, Botticelli had crafted his map of hell with a depressing palette of reds, sepias, and browns. Langdon's crashing headache had suddenly returned, and yet for the first time since waking up in a strange hospital, he felt a piece of the puzzle tumble into place. His grim hallucinations obviously had been stirred by seeing this famous painting. I must have been studying Botticelli's map of hell, he thought, although he had no recollection of why. While the image itself was disturbing, it was the painting's provenance that was now causing Langdon an increasing disquiet. Langdon was well aware that the inspiration for this foreboding masterpiece had originated not in the mind of Botticelli himself, but rather in the mind of someone who had lived 200 years before him. One great work of art inspired by another. Botticelli's Map of Hell was in fact a tribute to a 14th century work of literature that had become one of history's most celebrated writings a notoriously macabre vision of hell that resonated to this day. Dante's Inferno Across the street, Vayantha quietly climbed a service staircase and concealed herself on the rooftop terrace of the sleepy little Pensioni La Fiorentina. Langdon had provided a non-existent room number and a fake meeting place to his consulate contact a mirrored meet, as it was called in her business a common tradecraft technique that would enable him to assess the situation before revealing his own location. Invariably, the fake or mirrored location was selected because it lay in perfect view of his actual location. Vayantha found a concealed vantage point on the rooftop from which she had a bird's eye view of the entire area. Slowly, she let her eyes climb the apartment building across the street. Your move, Mr. Langdon. At that moment, on board the Mendacium, the provost stepped out onto the mahogany deck and inhaled deeply savoring the salty air of the Adriatic. This vessel had been his home for years, and yet now, the series of events transpiring in Florence threatened to destroy everything he had built. His field agent Vayantha had put everything at risk, and while she would face an inquiry when this mission was over, right now the provost still needed her. She damned well better regain control of this mess. Brisk footsteps approached behind him, and the provost turned to see one of his female analysts arriving at a jog. Sir, the analyst said, breathless. We have new information. Her voice cut the morning air with a rare intensity. 
It appears Robert Langdon just accessed his Harvard email account from an unmasked IP address. She paused, locking eyes with the provost. Langdon's precise location is now traceable. The provost was stunned that anyone could be so foolish. This changes everything. He steepled his hands and stared out at the coastline, considering the implications. Do we know the status of the SRS team? Yes, sir. Less than two miles away from Langdon's position. The provost needed only a moment to make the decision. Chapter 15 El Inferno de Dante, Sienna whispered, her expression rapt as she inched closer to the stark image of the underworld now projected on her kitchen wall. Dante's vision of hell, Langdon thought, rendered here in living color. Exalted as one of the preeminent works of world literature, the Inferno was the first of three books that made up Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy a 14,233-line epic poem describing Dante's brutal descent into the underworld, journey through purgatory, and eventual arrival in paradise. Of the comedy's three sections Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso Inferno was by far the most widely read and memorable. Composed by Dante Alighieri in the early 1300s, Inferno had quite literally redefined medieval perceptions of damnation. Never before had the concept of hell captivated the masses in such an entertaining way. Overnight, Dante's work solidified the abstract concept of hell into a clear and terrifying vision visceral, palpable, and unforgettable. Not surprisingly, following the poem's release, the Catholic Church enjoyed an enormous uptick in attendance from terrified sinners looking to avoid Dante's updated version of the underworld. Depicted here by Botticelli, Dante's horrific vision of hell was constructed as a subterranean funnel of suffering a wretched underground landscape of fire, brimstone, sewage, monsters, and Satan himself waiting at its core. The pit was constructed in nine distinct levels, the nine rings of hell, into which sinners were cast in accordance with the depth of their sin. Near the top, the lustful or carnal malefactors were blown about by an eternal windstorm, a symbol of their inability to control their desire. Beneath them the gluttons were forced to lie face down in a vile slush of sewage, their mouths filled with the product of their excess. Deeper still, the heretics were trapped in flaming coffins, damned to eternal fire. And so it went, getting worse and worse the deeper one descended. In the seven centuries since its publication, Dante's enduring vision of hell had inspired tributes, translations, and variations by some of history's greatest creative minds. Longfellow, Chaucer, Marx, Milton, Balzac, Borges, and even several popes had all written pieces based on Dante's Inferno. Monteverdi, Liszt, Wagner, Tchaikovsky, and Puccini composed pieces based on Dante's work, as had one of Langdon's favorite living recording artists Lorianna McKennett. Even the modern world of video games and iPad apps had no shortage of Dante-related offerings. Langdon, eager to share with his students the vibrant symbolic richness of Dante's vision, sometimes taught a course on the recurring imagery found in both Dante and the works he had inspired over the centuries. Robert, Sienna said, shifting closer to the image on the wall. Look at that. She pointed to an area near the bottom of the funnel-shaped hell. The area she was pointing to was known as the Malbolge meaning evil ditches. It was the eighth and penultimate ring of hell and was divided into ten separate ditches, each for a specific type of fraud. Sienna pointed more excitedly now. Look. Didn't you say, in your vision, you saw this? Langdon squinted at where Sienna was pointing, but he saw nothing. The tiny projector was losing power, and the image had begun to fade. He quickly shook the device again until it was glowing brightly. Then he carefully set it farther back from the wall, on the edge of the counter across the small kitchen, letting it cast an even larger image from there. Langdon approached Sienna, stepping to the side to study the glowing map. Again Sienna pointed down toward the eighth ring of hell. Look! Didn't you say your hallucinations included a pair of legs sticking out of the earth upside down with the letter R? She touched a precise spot on the wall. There they are. As Langdon had seen many times in this painting, the tenth ditch of the Malbolge was packed with sinners half buried upside down, their legs sticking out of the earth. But strangely, in this version, one pair of legs bore the letter R, 
written in mud, exactly as Langdon had seen in his vision. My God! Langdon peered more intently at the tiny detail. That letter R, that is definitely not in Botticelli's original. There's another letter, Sienna said, pointing. Langdon followed her outstretched finger to another of the ten ditches in the Malbalch, where the letter E was scrawled on a false prophet whose head had been put on backward. What in the world? This painting has been modified. Other letters now appeared to him, scrawled on sinners throughout all ten ditches of the Malbalch. He saw a C on a seducer being whipped by demons, another R on a thief perpetually bitten by snakes, an A on a corrupt politician submerged in a boiling lake of tar. These letters, Langdon said with certainty, are definitely not part of Botticelli's original. This image has been digitally edited. He returned his gaze to the uppermost ditch of the Malbalge and began reading the letters downward, through each of the ten ditches, from top to bottom. C. A. T. R. O. V. A. C. E. R. Catrovisor. Langdon said. Is this Italian? Sienna shook her head. Not Latin either. I don't recognize it. A, signature, maybe. Catrovisor. She looked doubtful. Doesn't sound like a name to me. But look over there. She pointed to one of the many characters in the third ditch of the Malbalch. When Langdon's eyes found the figure, he instantly felt a chill. Among the crowd of sinners in the third ditch was an iconic image from the Middle Ages a cloaked man in a mask with a long, bird-like beak and dead eyes. The Plague Mask Is there a plague doctor in Botticelli's original? Sienna asked. Absolutely not. That figure has been added. And did Botticelli sign his original? Langdon couldn't recall, but as his eyes moved to the lower right-hand corner where a signature normally would be, he realized why she had asked. There was no signature, and yet barely visible along La Mappa's dark brown border was a line of text in tiny block letters, La Verita e Visibile Solo a Traverso Gliachi della Morte. Langdon knew enough Italian to understand the gist. The truth can be glimpsed only through the eyes of death. Sienna nodded. Bizarre. The two of them stood in silence as the morbid image before them slowly began to fade. Dante's Inferno, Langdon thought. Inspiring foreboding pieces of art since 1330. Langdon's course on Dante always included an entire section on the illustrious artwork inspired by the Inferno. In addition to Botticelli's celebrated map of hell, there was Rodin's timeless sculpture of the three shades from the gates of hell. Stratinus's illustration of Phlegias paddling through submerged bodies on the river Styx. William Blake's lustful sinners swirling through an eternal tempest. Bouguereau's strangely erotic vision of Dante and Virgil watching two nude men locked in battle. Bayrose's tortured souls huddling beneath a hail-like torrent of scalding pellets and droplets of fire. Salvador Dali's eccentric series of watercolors and woodcuts, and Dori's huge collection of black and white etchings depicting everything from the tunneled entrance to Hades, to winged Satan himself. Now it seemed that Dante's poetic vision of hell had not only influenced the most revered artists throughout history. It had also, apparently, inspired yet another individual a twisted soul who had digitally altered Botticelli's famous painting, adding ten letters, a plague doctor, and then signing it with an ominous phrase about seeing the truth through the eyes of death. This artist had then stored the image on a high-tech projector sheathed in a freakishly carved bone. Langdon couldn't imagine who would have created such an artifact, and yet, at the moment, this issue seemed secondary to a far more unnerving question. Why the hell am I carrying it? As Sienna stood with Langdon in the kitchen and pondered her next move, the unexpected roar of a high horsepower engine echoed up from the street below. It was followed by a staccato burst of screeching tires and car doors slamming. Puzzled, Sienna hurried to the window and peered outside. A black, unmarked van had skidded to a stop in the street below. Out of the van flowed a team of men, all dressed in black uniforms with circular green medallions on their left shoulders. They gripped automatic rifles and moved with fierce, military efficiency. Without hesitation, 
four soldiers dashed toward the entrance of the apartment building. Sienna felt her blood go cold. Robert, she shouted. I don't know who they are, but they found us. Down in the street, Agent Christoph Bruder shouted orders to his men as they rushed into the building. He was a powerfully built man whose military background had imbued him with an emotionless sense of duty and respect for the command chain. He knew his mission, and he knew the stakes. The organization for whom he worked contained many divisions, but Bruder's division surveillance and response support was summoned only when a situation reached crisis status. As his men disappeared into the apartment building, Bruder stood watch at the front door, pulling out his COMM device and contacting the person in charge. It's Bruder, he said. We've successfully tracked Langdon through his computer IP address. My team is moving in. I'll alert you when we have him. High above Bruder, on the rooftop terrace of Pensioni La Fiorentina, Vayantha stared down in horrified disbelief at the agents dashing into the apartment building. What the hell are they doing here? She ran a hand through her spiked hair, suddenly grasping the dire consequences of her botched assignment last night. With the single coup of a dove, everything had spiraled wildly out of control. What had begun as a simple mission, had now turned into a living nightmare. If the SRS team is here, then it's all over for me. Vayantha desperately grabbed her Sectra Tiger XS communications device and called the provost. Sir, she stammered. The SRS team is here. Bruder's men are swarming the apartment building across the street. She awaited a response, but when it came, she heard only sharp clicks on the line, then an electronic voice, which calmly stated, Disavowal protocol commencing. Vayantha lowered the phone and looked at the screen just in time to see the COMM device go dead. As the blood drained from her face, Vayantha forced herself to accept what was happening. The consortium had just severed all ties with her. No links. No association. I've been disavowed. The shock lasted only an instant. Then the fear set in. Chapter 16 Hurry, Robert. Sienna urged. Follow me. Langdon's thoughts were still consumed by grim images of Dante's underworld as he charged out the door into the hall of the apartment building. Until this instant, Sienna Brooks had managed the morning's substantial stress with a kind of detached poise, but now her calm demeanor had grown taut with an emotion Langdon had yet to see in her true fear. In the hallway, Sienna ran ahead, rushing past the elevator, which was already descending no doubt summoned by the men now entering the lobby. She sprinted to the end of the hall and, without looking back, disappeared into the stairwell. Langdon followed close behind, skidding on the smooth solace of his borrowed loafers. The tiny projector in the breast pocket of his Brioni suit bounced against his chest as he ran. His mind flashed on the strange letters adorning the eighth ring of hell, Catrovisor. He pictured the plague mask and the strange signature, the truth can be glimpsed only through the eyes of death. Langdon strained to connect these disparate elements, but at the moment nothing was making sense. When he finally came to a stop on the staircase landing, Sienna was there, listening intently. Langdon could hear footsteps pounding up the stairs from below. Is there another exit? Langdon whispered. Follow me, she said tersely. Sienna had kept Langdon alive once already today, and so, with little choice but to trust the woman, Langdon took a deep breath and bounded down the stairs after her. They descended one floor, and the sounds of approaching boots grew very close now, echoing only a floor or two below them. Why is she running directly into them? Before Langdon could protest, Sienna grabbed his hand and yanked him out of the stairwell along a deserted hallway of apartments along corridor of locked doors. There's nowhere to hide. Sienna flipped a light switch and a few bulbs went out, but the dim hallway did little to hide them. Sienna and Langdon were clearly visible here. The thundering footsteps were nearly upon them now, and Langdon knew their assailants would appear on the staircase at any moment, with a direct view down this hall. I need your jacket, Sienna whispered as she yanked Langdon's suit jacket off him. She then forced Langdon to crouch on his haunches behind her in a recessed doorframe. Don't move. 
What is she doing? She's in plain sight. The soldiers appeared on the staircase, rushing upward but stopping short when they saw Sienna in the darkened hallway. Per el amor de Dio. Sienna shouted at them, her tone scathing. Casi cuesta confusion. The two men squinted, clearly uncertain what they were looking at. Sienna kept yelling at them. Tonto giaso a quest aura. So much noise at this hour. Langdon now saw that Sienna had draped his black jacket over her head and shoulders like an old woman's shawl. She had hunched over, positioning herself to obstruct their view of Langdon crouched in the shadows, and now, utterly transformed, she hobbled one step toward them and screamed like a senile old woman. One of the soldiers held up his hand, motioning for her to return to her apartment. Senora. Rintri subito in casa. Sienna took another rickety step, shaking her fist angrily. Avit svegliato mio marito, che e malito. Langdon listened in bewilderment. They woke up your ailing husband? The other soldier now raised his machine gun and aimed directly at her. Ferma Osboro. Sienna stopped short, cursing them mercilessly as she hobbled backward, away from them. The men hurried on, disappearing up the stairs. Not quite Shakespearean acting, Langdon thought, but impressive. Apparently a background in drama could be a versatile weapon. Sienna removed the jacket from her head and tossed it back to Langdon. Okay, follow me. This time Langdon followed without hesitation. They descended to the landing above the lobby, where two more soldiers were just entering the elevator to go upstairs. On the street outside, another soldier stood watch beside the van his black uniform stretched taut across his muscular body. In silence, Sienna and Langdon hurried downstairs toward the basement. The underground carport was dark and smelled of urine. Sienna jogged over to a corner packed with scooters and motorcycles. She stopped at a silver trike a three-wheeled moped contraption that looked like the ungainly offspring of an Italian Vespa and an adult tricycle. She ran her slender hand beneath the trike's front fender and removed a small magnetized case. Inside was a key, which she inserted, and revved the engine. Seconds later, Langdon was seated behind her on the bike. Precariously perched on the small seat, Langdon groped at his sides, looking for hand grips or something to steady himself. Not the moment for modesty, Sienna said, grabbing his hands and wrapping them around her slender waist. You'll want to hold on. Langdon did exactly that as Sienna gunned the trike up the exit ramp. The vehicle had more power than he would have imagined, and they nearly left the ground as they launched out of the garage, emerging into the early morning light about 50 yards from the main entrance. The brawny soldier in front of the building turned at once to see Langdon and Sienna tearing away, their trike letting out a high-pitched whine as she opened the throttle. Perched on the back, Langdon peered back over his shoulder toward the soldier, who now raised his weapon and took careful aim. Langdon braced himself. A single shot rang out, ricocheting off the trike's back fender, barely missing the base of Langdon's spine. Jesus! Sienna made a hard left at an intersection, and Langdon felt himself sliding, fighting to keep his balance. Lean toward me, she shouted. Langdon leaned forward centering himself again as Sienna raced the trike down a larger thoroughfare. They had driven a full block before Langdon began breathing again. Who the hell were those men? Sienna's focus remained locked on the road ahead as she raced down the avenue, weaving in and out of the light morning traffic. Several pedestrians did double takes as they passed, apparently puzzled to see a six-foot man in a Brioni suit riding behind a slender woman. Langdon and Sienna had traveled three blocks and were approaching a major intersection when horns blared up ahead. A sleek black van rounded the corner on two wheels, fishtailing into the intersection, and then accelerating up the road directly toward them. The van was identical to the soldier's van back at the apartment building. Sienna immediately swerved hard to her right and slammed on the brakes. Langdon's chest pressed hard into her back as she skidded to a stop out of sight behind a parked delivery truck. She nestled the trike up to the rear bumper of the truck and killed the engine. Did they see us? She and Langdon huddled low and waited, breathless. 
The van roared past without hesitation, apparently never having seen them. As the vehicle sped by, however, Langdon caught a fleeting glimpse of someone inside. In the back seat, an attractive older woman was wedged between two soldiers like a captive. Her eyes sagged and her head bobbed as if she were delirious or maybe drugged. She wore an amulet and had long silver hair that fell in ringlets. For a moment Langdon's throat clenched, and he thought he'd seen a ghost. It was the woman from his visions. Chapter 17 The Provost stormed out of the control room and marched along the long starboard deck of the Mendacium, trying to gather his thoughts. What had just transpired at the Florence apartment building was unthinkable. He circled the entire ship twice before stalking into his office and taking out a bottle of 50-year-old Highland Park single malt. Without pouring a glass, he set down the bottle and turned his back on it a personal reminder that he was still very much in control. His eyes moved instinctively to a heavy, weathered tome on his bookshelf a gift from a client, the client whom he now wished he'd never met. A year ago, how could I have known? The provost did not normally interview prospective clients personally, but this one had come to him through a trusted source, and so he had made an exception. It had been a dead calm day at sea when the client arrived aboard the Mendacium via his own private helicopter. The visitor, a notable figure in his field, was 46, clean-cut, and exceptionally tall, with piercing green eyes. As you know, the man had begun, your services were recommended to me by a mutual friend. The visitor stretched out his long legs and made himself at home in the provost's lushly appointed office. So, let me tell you what I need. Actually, no, the provost interrupted, showing the man who was in charge. My protocol requires that you tell me nothing. I will explain the services I provide, and you will decide which, if any, are of interest to you. The visitor looked taken aback but acquiesced and listened intently. In the end, what the lanky newcomer desired had turned out to be very standard fare for the consortium essentially a chance to become invisible for a while so he could pursue an endeavor far from prying eyes. Child's Play the consortium would accomplish this by providing him a fake identity and a secure location, entirely off the grid, where he could do his work in total secrecy whatever his work might be. The consortium never inquired for what purpose a client required a service, preferring to know as little as possible about those for whom they worked. For a full year, at a staggering profit, the provost had provided safe haven to the green-eyed man, who had turned out to be an ideal client. The provost had no contact with him, and all of his bills were paid on time. Then, two weeks ago, everything changed. Unexpectedly, the client had made contact, demanding a personal meeting with the provost. Considering the sum of money the client had paid, the provost obliged. The disheveled man who arrived on the yacht was barely recognizable as the steady, clean-cut person with whom the provost had done business the year before. He had a wild look in his once sharp green eyes. He looked almost, ill. What happened to him? What has he been doing? The provost had ushered the jittery man into his office. The silver-haired devil, his client stammered. She's getting closer every day. The provost glanced down at his client's file, eyeing the photo of the attractive silver-haired woman. Yes, the provost said, your silver-haired devil. We are well aware of your enemies. And as powerful as she may be, for a full year we've kept her from you, and we will continue to do so. The green-eyed man anxiously twisted strands of greasy hair around his fingertips. Don't let her beauty fool you, she is a dangerous foe. True, the provost thought, still displeased that his client had drawn the attention of someone so influential. The silver-haired woman had tremendous access and resources not the kind of adversary the provost appreciated having to deflect. If she or her demons locate me, the client began. They won't, the provost had assured him. Have we not thus far hidden you and provided you everything you've requested? Yes, the man said. And yet, I will sleep easier if, he paused, regrouping. I need to know that if anything happens to me, you will carry out my final wishes. Those wishes being. The man reached into a bag and pulled out a small, 
sealed envelope. The contents of this envelope provide access to a safe deposit box in Florence. Inside the box, you will find a small object. If anything happens to me, I need you to deliver the object for me. It is a gift of sorts. Very well. The provost lifted his pen to make notes. And to whom shall I deliver it? To the silver-haired devil. The provost glanced up. A gift for your tormentor. More of a thorn in her side. His eyes flashed wildly. A clever little barb fashioned from a bone. She will discover it is a map, her own personal Virgil, an escort to the center of her own private hell. The provost studied him for a long moment. As you wish. Consider it done. The timing will be critical, the man urged. The gift should not be delivered too soon. You must keep it hidden until, he paused, suddenly lost in thought. Until when, the provost prodded. The man stood abruptly and walked over behind the provost's desk, grabbing a red marker and frantically circling a date on the provost's personal desk calendar. Until this day. The provost set his jaw and exhaled, swallowing his displeasure at the man's brazenness. Understood, the provost said. I will do nothing until the circled day, at which time the object in the safe deposit box, whatever it may be, will be delivered to the silver-haired woman. You have my word. He counted the days on his calendar until the awkwardly circled date. I will carry out your wishes in precisely fourteen days from now. And not one day before, the client admonished feverishly. I understand, the provost assured. Not a day before. The provost took the envelope, slid it into the man's file, and made the necessary notations to ensure that his client's wishes were followed precisely. While his client had not described the exact nature of the object in the safe deposit box, the provost preferred it this way. Detachment was a cornerstone of the consortium's philosophy. Provide the service. Ask no questions. Pass no judgment. The client's shoulders softened and he exhaled heavily. Thank you. Anything else, the provost had asked, eager to rid himself of his transformed client. Yes, actually, there is. He reached into his pocket and produced a small, crimson memory stick. This is a video file. He laid the memory stick in front of the provost. I would like it uploaded to the world media. The provost studied the man curiously. The consortium often mass-distributed information for clients, and yet something about this man's request felt disconcerting. On the same date, the provost asked, motioning at the scrawled circle on his calendar. Same exact date, the client replied. Not one moment before. Understood. The provost tagged the red memory stick with the proper information. So that's it, then. He stood up, attempting to end the meeting. His client remained seated. No. There is one final thing. The provost sat back down. The client's green eyes were looking almost feral now. Shortly after you deliver this video, I will become a very famous man. You are already a famous man, the provost had thought, considering his client's impressive accomplishments. And you will deserve some of the credit, the man said. The service you have provided has enabled me to create my masterpiece, an opus that is going to change the world. You should be proud of your role. Whatever your masterpiece is, the provost said with growing impatience, I'm pleased you have had the privacy required to create it. As a show of thanks, I've brought you a parting gift. The unkempt man reached into his bag. A book. The provost wondered if perhaps this book was the secret opus the client had been working on for all this time. And did you write this book? No the man heaved a massive tome up onto the table. Quite to the contrary, this book was written for me. Puzzled, the provost eyed the edition his client had produced. He thinks this was written for him? The volume was a literary classic, written in the 14th century. Read it the client urged with an eerie smile. It will help you understand all I have done. With that, the unkempt visitor had stood up, said goodbye, and abruptly departed. 
the provost watched through his office window as the man's helicopter lifted off the deck and headed back toward the coast of Italy. Then the provost returned his attention to the large book before him. With uncertain fingers, he lifted the leather cover and thumbed to the beginning. The opening stanza of the work was written in large calligraphy, taking up the entire first page. Inferno midway upon the journey of our life I found myself within a forest dark, for the straightforward pathway had been lost. On the opposing page, his client had signed the book with a handwritten message, My dear friend, thank you for helping me find the path. The world thanks you, too. The provost had no idea what this meant, but he'd read enough. He closed the book and placed it on his bookshelf. Thankfully, his professional relationship with this strange individual would be over soon. Fourteen more days, the provost thought, turning his gaze to the wildly scrawled red circle on his personal calendar. In the days that followed, the provost felt uncharacteristically on edge about this client. The man seemed to have come unhinged. Nonetheless, despite the provost's intuition, the time passed without incident. Then, just before the circled date, there occurred a rapid series of calamitous events in Florence. The provost tried to handle the crisis, but it quickly accelerated out of control. The crisis climaxed with his client's breathless ascent up the Badia Tower. He jumped off, to his death. Despite his horror at losing a client, especially in this manner, the provost remained a man of his word. He quickly began preparing to make good on his final promise to the deceased the delivery to the silver-haired woman of the contents of a safe deposit box in Florence the timing of which, he had been admonished, was critical. Not before the date circled in your calendar. The provost gave the envelope containing the safe deposit box codes to Vayantha, who had traveled to Florence to recover the object inside this clever little barb. When Vayantha called in, however, her news was both startling and deeply alarming. The contents of the safe deposit box had already been removed, and Vayantha had barely escaped being detained. Somehow, the silver-haired woman had learned of the account and had used her influence to gain access to the safe deposit box and also to place an arrest warrant on anyone else who showed up looking to open it. That was three days ago. The client had clearly intended the purloined object to be his final insult to the silver-haired woman a taunting voice from the grave. And yet now it speaks too soon. The consortium had been in a desperate scramble ever since using all its resources to protect its client's final wishes, as well as itself. In the process, the consortium had crossed a series of lines from which the provost knew it would be hard to return. Now, with everything unraveling in Florence, the provost stared down at his desk and wondered what the future held. On his calendar, the client's wildly scrawled circle stared up at him a crazed ring of red ink around an apparently special day. Tomorrow. Reluctantly, the provost eyed the bottle of scotch on the table before him. Then, for the first time in fourteen years, he poured a glass and drained it in a single gulp. Below decks, facilitator Lawrence Knowlton pulled the little red memory stick from his computer and set it on the desk in front of him. The video was one of the strangest things he had ever seen. And it was precisely nine minutes long, to the second. Feeling uncharacteristically alarmed, he stood and paced his tiny cubicle, wondering again whether he should share the bizarre video with the provost. Just do your job, Knowlton told himself. No questions. No judgment. Forcing the video from his mind, he marked his planner with a confirmed task. Tomorrow, as requested by the client, he would upload the video file to the media. Chapter 18 Violani Calo Machiavelli has been called the most graceful of all Florentine avenues. With wide S curves that serpentine through lushly wooded landscapes of hedges and deciduous trees, the drive is a favorite among cyclists and Ferrari enthusiasts. Siena expertly maneuvered the trike through each arching curve as they left behind the dingy residential neighborhood and moved into the clean, cedar-laden air of the city's upscale West Bank. They passed a chapel clock that was just chiming 8 a.m. Langdon held on, his mind churning with mystifying images of Dante's Inferno, and the mysterious face of a beautiful silver-haired woman he had just seen wedged in between two huge soldiers in the back seat of the van. Whoever she is, Langdon thought 
they have her now. The woman in the van, Sienna said over the noise of the trike's engine. You're sure it was the same woman from your visions? Absolutely. Then you must have met her at some point in the past two days. The question is why you keep seeing her, and why she keeps telling you to seek and find. Langdon agreed. I don't know. I have no recollection of meeting her, but every time I see her face, I have an overwhelming sense that I need to help her. Very sorry. Very sorry. Langdon suddenly wondered if maybe his strange apology had been directed to the silver-haired woman. Did I fail her somehow? The thought left a knot in his gut. For Langdon, it felt as if a vital weapon had been extracted from his arsenal. I have no memory. Eidetic since childhood, Langdon's memory was the intellectual asset he relied on most. For a man accustomed to recalling every intricate detail of what he saw around him, functioning without his memory felt like attempting to land a plane in the dark with no radar. It seems like your only chance of finding answers is to decipher Law Mappa, Sienna said. Whatever secret it holds, it seems to be the reason you're being hunted. Langdon nodded, thinking about the word Catrovisor, set against the backdrop of writhing bodies in Dante's Inferno. Suddenly a clear thought emerged in Langdon's head. I awoke in Florence. No city on earth was more closely tied to Dante than Florence. Dante Alieri had been born in Florence, grew up in Florence, fell in love, according to legend, with Beatrice in Florence, and was cruelly exiled from his home in Florence, destined to wander the Italian countryside for years, longing soulfully for his home. You shall leave everything you love most, Dante wrote of banishment. This is the arrow that the bow of exile shoots first. As Langdon recalled those words from the seventeenth canto of the Paradiso, he looked to the right, gazing out across the Arno River toward the distant spires of old Florence. Langdon pictured the layout of the old city a labyrinth of tourists, congestion and traffic bustling through narrow streets around Florence's famed cathedral, museums, chapels, and shopping districts. He suspected that if he and Siena ditched the trike, they could evaporate into the throngs of people. The old city is where we need to go, Langdon declared. If there are answers, that's where they'll probably be. Old Florence was Dante's entire world. Sienna nodded her agreement and called over her shoulder, it will be safer, too plenty of places to hide. I'll head for Porta Romana, and from there, we can cross the river. The river, Langdon thought with a touch of trepidation. Dante's famous journey into hell had begun by crossing a river as well. Sienna opened up the throttle, and as the landscape blurred past, Langdon mentally scanned through images of the inferno, the dead and dying, the ten ditches of the Malbolge with the plague doctor and the strange word Catrovisor. He pondered the words scrawled beneath Law Mappa the truth can be glimpsed only through the eyes of death and wondered if the grim saying might be a quote from Dante. I don't recognize it. Langdon was well versed in Dante's work, and his prominence as an art historian who specialized in iconography meant he was occasionally called upon to interpret the vast array of symbols that populated Dante's landscape. Coincidentally, or perhaps not so coincidentally, he had given a lecture on Dante's Inferno about two years earlier. Divine Dante, Symbols of Hell Dante Alieri had evolved into one of history's true cult icons, sparking the creation of Dante societies all around the world. The oldest American branch had been founded in 1881 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. New England's famous fireside poet was the first American to translate the Divine Comedy, his translation remaining among the most respected and widely read to this day. As a noted student of Dante's work, Langdon had been asked to speak at a major event hosted by one of the world's oldest Dante societies Societa Dante Alieri Vienna. The event was slated to take place at the Viennese Academy of Sciences. The event's primary sponsor a wealthy scientist and Dante Society member had managed to secure the Academy's 2,000-seat lecture hall. When Langdon arrived at the event, he was met by the conference director and ushered inside. As they crossed the lobby, Langdon couldn't help but notice the five words painted in gargantuan letters across the back wall, What if God was wrong? 
It's a Lucas Traberg, the director whispered. Our newest art installation. What do you think? Langdon eyed the massive text, uncertain how to respond. Um, his brush strokes are lavish, but his command of the subjunctive seems sparse. The director gave him a confused look. Langdon hoped his rapport with the audience would be better. When he finally stepped on stage, Langdon received a rousing round of applause from a crowd that was standing room only. Mean Damon Uendi Heron, Langdon began, his voice booming over the loudspeakers. Will come in, Ben Vainwet, welcome. The famous line from Cabaret drew appreciative laughter from the crowd. I've been informed that our audience tonight contains not only Dante Society members, but also many visiting scientists and students who may be exploring Dante for the first time. So, for those in the audience who have been too busy studying to read medieval Italian epics, I thought I'd begin with a quick overview of Dante his life, his work, and why he is considered one of the most influential figures in all of history. More applause. Using the tiny remote in his hand, Langdon called up a series of images of Dante, the first being Andrea del Castaño's full-length portrait of the poet standing in a doorway, clutching a book of philosophy. Dante Alighieri, Langdon began. This Florentine writer and philosopher lived from 1265 to 1321. In this portrait, as in nearly all depictions, he wears on his head a red cappuccio a tight-fitting, plated hood with ear flaps which, along with his crimson Luca robe, has become the most widely reproduced image of Dante. Langdon advanced slides to the Botticelli portrait of Dante from the Uffizi Gallery, which stressed Dante's most salient features, a heavy jaw and hooked nose. Here, Dante's unique face is once again framed by his red cappuccio, but in this instance Botticelli has added a laurel wreath to his cap as a symbol of expertise in this case in the poetic arts a traditional symbol borrowed from ancient Greece and used even today in ceremonies honoring poet laureates and Nobel laureates. Langdon quickly scrolled through several other images, all showing Dante in his red cap, red tunic, laurel wreath, and prominent nose. And to round out your image of Dante, here is a statue from the Piazza di Santa Croce, and, of course, the famous fresco attributed to Giotto in the Chapel of the Bargello. Langdon left the slide of Giotto's fresco on the screen and walked to the center of the stage. As you are no doubt aware, Dante is best known for his monumental literary masterpiece The Divine Comedy a brutally vivid account of the author's descent into hell, passage through purgatory, and eventual ascent into paradise to commune with God. By modern standards, The Divine Comedy has nothing comedic about it. It's called a comedy for another reason entirely. In the 14th century, Italian literature was, by requirement, divided into two categories, tragedy, representing high literature, was written in formal Italian, comedy, representing low literature, was written in the vernacular and geared toward the general population. Langdon advanced slides to the iconic fresco by Michelino, which showed Dante standing outside the walls of Florence clutching a copy of the Divine Comedy. In the background, the terraced mountain of Purgatory rose high above the gates of Hell. The painting now hung in Florence's Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore better known as Il Duomo. As you may have guessed from the title, Langdon continued, the Divine Comedy was written in the vernacular the language of the people. Even so, it brilliantly fused religion, history, politics, philosophy, and social commentary in a tapestry of fiction that, while erudite, remained wholly accessible to the masses. The work became such a pillar of Italian culture that Dante's writing style has been credited with nothing less than the codification of the modern Italian language. Langdon paused a moment for effect and then whispered, My friends, it is impossible to overstate the influence of Dante Alighieri's work. Throughout all of history, with the sole exception perhaps of Holy Scripture, no single work of writing, art, music, or literature has inspired more tributes, imitations, variations, and annotations than the Divine Comedy. After listing the vast array of famous composers, artists, and authors who had created works based on Dante's epic poem, Langdon scanned the crowd. So tell me, do we have any authors here tonight? Nearly one-third of the hands went up. Langdon stared out in shock. 
Wow, either this is the most accomplished audience on earth, or this e-publishing thing is really taking off. Well, as all of you authors know, there is nothing a writer appreciates more than a blurb one of those single-line endorsements from a powerful individual, designed to make others want to buy your work. And, in the Middle Ages, blurbs existed, too. And Dante got quite a few of them. Langdon changed slides. How would you like to have this on your book jacket? Ne'er walked the earth a greater man than he. Michelangelo a murmur of surprise rustled through the crowd. Yes, Langdon said, that's the same Michelangelo you all know from the Sistine Chapel and the David. In addition to being a master painter and sculptor, Michelangelo was a superb poet, publishing nearly 300 poems including one titled Dante dedicated to the man whose stark visions of hell were those that inspired Michelangelo's last judgment. And if you don't believe me, read the third canto of Dante's Inferno and then visit the Sistine Chapel, just above the altar, you'll see this familiar image. Langdon advanced slides to a frightening detail of a muscle-bound beast swinging a giant paddle at cowering people. This is Dante's hellish ferryman, Karen, beating straggling passengers with an oar. Langdon moved now to a new slide a second detail of Michelangelo's last judgment a man being crucified. This is Haman the Agagite, who, according to scripture, was hanged to death. However, in Dante's poem, he was crucified instead. As you can see here in the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo chose Dante's version over that of the Bible. Langdon grinned and lowered his voice to a whisper. Don't tell the Pope. The crowd laughed. Dante's Inferno created a world of pain and suffering beyond all previous human imagination, and his writing quite literally defined our modern visions of hell. Langdon paused. And believe me, the Catholic Church has much to thank Dante for. His Inferno terrified the faithful for centuries, and no doubt tripled church attendance among the fearful. Langdon switched the slide. And this leads us to the reason we are all here tonight. The screen now displayed the title of his lecture, Divine Dante, Symbols of Hell. Dante's Inferno is a landscape so rich in symbolism and iconography that I often dedicate an entire semester course to it. And tonight, I thought there would be no better way to unveil the symbols of Dante's Inferno than to walk side by side with him, through the gates of hell. Langdon paced out to the edge of the stage and surveyed the crowd. Now, if we're planning on taking a stroll through hell, I strongly recommend we use a map. And there is no map of Dante's hell more complete and accurate than the one painted by Sandro Botticelli. He touched his remote, and Botticelli's forbidding map a del Inferno materialized before the crowd. He could hear several groans as people absorbed the various horrors taking place in the funnel-shaped subterranean cavern. Unlike some artists, Botticelli was extremely faithful in his interpretation of Dante's text. In fact, he spent so much time reading Dante that the great art historian Giorgio Vasari said Botticelli's obsession with Dante led to serious disorders in his living. Botticelli created more than two dozen other works relating to Dante, but this map is his most famous. Langdon turned now, pointing to the upper left-hand corner of the painting. Our journey will begin up there, above ground, where you can see Dante in red, along with his guide, Virgil standing outside the gates of hell. From there we will travel downward, through the nine rings of Dante's Inferno, and eventually come face to face with, Langdon quickly flashed to a new slide a giant enlargement of Satan as depicted by Botticelli in this very painting a horrific, three-headed Lucifer consuming three different people, one in each mouth. The crowd gasped audibly. A glance at coming attractions, Langdon announced. This frightening character here is where tonight's journey will end. This is the ninth ring of hell, where Satan himself resides. However, Langdon paused. Getting there is half the fun, so let's rewind a bit, back up to the gates of hell, where our journey begins. Langdon moved to the next slide a Gustav Dory lithograph that depicted a dark, tunneled entrance carved into the face of an austere cliff. The inscription above the door read, Abandon all hope. Yeah, who enter here. So, Langdon said with a smile. Shall we enter? Somewhere tires screeched loudly, 
and the audience evaporated before Langdon's eyes. He felt himself lurch forward, and he collided with Sienna's back as the trike skidded to a stop in the middle of the Viale Machiavelli. Langdon reeled, still thinking about the gates of hell looming before him. As he regained his bearings, he saw where he was. What's going on, he demanded. Sienna pointed 300 yards ahead to the Porta Romana the ancient stone gateway that served as the entrance to Old Florence. Robert, we've got a problem. Chapter 19 Agent Bruder stood in the humble apartment and tried to make sense of what he was seeing. Who the hell lives here? The decor was sparse and jumbled, like a college dorm room furnished on a budget. Agent Bruder, one of his men called from down the hall. You'll want to see this. As Bruder made his way down the hall, he wondered if the local police had detained Langdon yet. Bruder would have preferred to solve this crisis in-house, but Langdon's escape had left little choice but to enlist local police support and set up roadblocks. An agile motorbike on the labyrinthine streets of Florence would easily elude Bruder's vans, whose heavy polycarbonate windows and solid, puncture-proof tires made them impenetrable but lumbering. The Italian police had a reputation for being uncooperative with outsiders, but Bruder's organization had significant influence police, consulates, embassies. When we make demands, nobody dares question. Bruder entered the small office where his man stood over an open laptop and typed in latex gloves. This is the machine he used, the man said. Langdon used it to access his email and run some searches. The files are still cached. Bruder moved toward the desk. It doesn't appear to be Langdon's computer, the tech said. It's registered to someone initialed SC I should have a full name shortly. As Bruder waited, his eyes were drawn to a stack of papers on the desk. He picked them up, thumbing through the unusual array an old playbill from the London Globe Theatre and a series of newspaper articles. The more Bruder read, the wider his eyes became. Taking the documents, Bruder slipped back into the hall and placed a call to his boss. It's Bruder, he said. I think I've got an idea on the person helping Langdon. Who is it? His boss replied. Bruder exhaled slowly. You're not going to believe this. Two miles away, Vayantha hunkered low on her BMW as it fled the area. Police cars raced past her in the opposite direction, sirens blaring. I've been disavowed, she thought. Normally, the soft vibration of the motorcycle's four-stroke engine helped calm her nerves. Not today. Vayantha had worked for the consortium for 12 years, climbing the ranks from ground support, to strategy coordination, all the way to a high-ranked field agent. My career is all I have. Field agents endured a life of secrecy, travel, and long missions, all of which precluded any real outside life or relationships. I've been on this same mission for a year, she thought still unable to believe the provost had pulled the trigger and disavowed her so abruptly. For twelve months Vayantha had been overseeing support services for the same client of the consortium an eccentric, green-eyed genius who wanted only to disappear for a while so he could work unmolested by his rivals and enemies. He travelled very rarely, and always invisibly, but mostly he worked. The nature of this man's work was not known to Vayantha whose contract had simply been to keep the client hidden from the powerful people trying to find him. Vayantha had performed the service with consummate professionalism, and everything had gone perfectly. Perfectly, that was, until last night. Vayantha's emotional state and career had been in a downward spiral ever since. I'm on the outside now. The disavowal protocol, if invoked, required that the agent instantly abandon her current mission and exit the arena at once. If the agent were captured, the consortium would disavow all knowledge of the agent. Agents knew better than to press their luck with the organization, having witnessed firsthand its disturbing ability to manipulate reality into whatever suited its needs. Vayantha knew of only two agents who had been disavowed. Strangely, she had never seen either of them again. She had always assumed they had been called in for their formal review and fired, required never to make contact again with consortium employees. Now, however, Vayantha was not so sure. You're overreacting, she tried to tell herself. 
the consortium's methods are far more elegant than cold-blooded murder. Even so, she felt a fresh chill sweep through her body. It had been instinct that urged her to flee the hotel rooftop unseen the moment she saw Bruder's team arrive, and she wondered if that instinct had saved her. Nobody knows where I am now. As Vayantha sped northward on the sleek straightaway of the Viale del Poggio Imperiale, she realized what a difference a few hours had made for her. Last night she had been worried about protecting her job. Now she was worried about protecting her life. Chapter 20 Florence was once a walled city, its primary entrance the stone gateway of the Porta Romana, built in 1326. While most of the city's perimeter walls were destroyed centuries ago, the Porta Romana still exists, and to this day, traffic enters the city by funneling through deep arched tunnels in the colossal fortification. The gateway itself is a 50-foot-tall barrier of ancient brick and stone whose primary passageway still retains its massive bolted wooden doors, which are propped open at all times to let traffic pass through. Six major roads converge in front of these doors, filtering into a rotary whose grassy median is dominated by a large pistoletto statue depicting a woman departing the city gates carrying an enormous bundle on her head. Although nowadays it is more of a snarled traffic nightmare, Florence's austere city gate was once the site of the Fira dei Contrati the contracts fair at which fathers sold their daughters into a contracted marriage, often forcing them to dance provocatively in an effort to secure higher dowries. This morning, several hundred yards short of the gateway, Siena had screeched to a stop and was now pointing in alarm. On the back of the trike, Langdon looked ahead and immediately shared her apprehension. In front of them, a long line of cars idled at a full stop. Traffic in the rotary had been halted by a police barricade, and more police cars were now arriving. Armed officers were walking from car to car, asking questions. That can't be for us, Langdon thought. Can it? A sweaty cyclist came pedaling toward them up the Viale Machiavelli away from the traffic. He was on a recumbent bike, his bare legs pumping out in front of him. Siena shouted out to him. Casi successo. Ichi lo esse, he shouted back, looking concerned. Carabinieri. He hurried past, looking eager to clear the area. Siena turned to Langdon, her expression grim. Roadblock. Military police. Sirens wailed in the distance behind them, and Siena spun in her seat, staring back up the Viale Machiavelli her face now masked with fear. We're trapped in the middle, Langdon thought, scanning the area for any exit at all an intersecting road, a park, a driveway but all he saw were private residences on their left and a high stone wall to their right. The sirens grew louder. Up there, Langdon urged, pointing thirty yards ahead to a deserted construction site where a portable cement mixer offered at least a little bit of cover. Sienna gunned the bike up onto the sidewalk and raced into the work area. They parked behind the cement mixer, quickly realizing that it offered barely enough concealment for the trike alone. Follow me, Sienna said, rushing toward a small portable tool shed nestled in the bushes against the stone wall. That's not a tool shed, Langdon realized, his nose crinkling as they got closer. That's a porta potty. As Langdon and Sienna arrived outside the construction worker's chemical toilet, they could hear police cars approaching from behind them. Sienna yanked the door handle, but it didn't budge. A heavy chain and padlock secured it. Langdon grabbed Sienna's arm and pulled her around behind the structure, forcing her into the narrow space between the toilet and the stone wall. The two of them barely fit, and the air smelled putrid and heavy. Langdon slid in behind her just as a jet-black Subaru Forester came into view with the word Carabinieri emblazoned on its side. The vehicle rolled slowly past their location. The Italian military police, Langdon thought, incredulous. He wondered if these officers also had orders to shoot on sight. Someone is dead serious about finding us, Sienna whispered. And somehow they did. GPS. Langdon wondered aloud. Maybe the projector has a tracking device in it. Sienna shook her head. Believe me, if that thing were traceable, the police would be right on top of us. Langdon shifted his tall frame, trying to get comfortable in the cramped surroundings. 
he found himself face to face with a collage of elegantly styled graffiti scrawled on the back of the porta potty. Leave it to the Italians. Most American porta potties were covered with sophomoric cartoons that vaguely resembled huge breasts or penises. The graffiti on this one, however, looked more like an art student's sketchbook a human eye, a well rendered hand, a man in profile, and a fantastical dragon. Destruction of property doesn't look like this everywhere in Italy, Siena said, apparently reading his mind. The Florence Art Institute is on the other side of this stone wall. As if to confirm Siena's statement, a group of students appeared in the distance, ambling toward them with art portfolios under their arms. They were chatting, lighting cigarettes, and puzzling over the roadblock in front of them at the Porta Romana. Langdon and Sienna crouched lower to stay out of sight of the students, and as they did so, Langdon was struck, most unexpectedly, by a curious thought. The half-buried sinners with their legs in the air. Perhaps it was on account of the smell of human waste, or possibly the recumbent bicyclist with bare legs flailing in front of him, but whatever the stimulus, Langdon had flashed on the putrid world of the malbulge and the naked legs protruding upside down from the earth. He turned suddenly to his companion. Siena, in our version of La Mappa, the upside-down legs were in the tenth ditch, right? The lowest level of the Malbalch. Siena gave him an odd look, as if this were hardly the time. Yes, at the bottom. For a split second Langdon was back in Vienna giving his lecture. He was standing on stage, only moments from his grand finale having just shown the audience Dorius engraving of Jerry on the winged monster with a poisonous stinging tail that lived just above the Malbalch. Before we meet Satan, Langdon declared, his deep voice resonating over the loudspeakers, we must pass through the ten ditches of the Malbalch, in which are punished the fraudulent those guilty of deliberate evil. Langdon advanced slides to show a detail of the Malbalch and then took the audience down through the ditches one by one. From top to bottom we have, the seducers whipped by demons, the flatterers adrift in human excrement, the clerical profiteers half buried upside down with their legs in the air, the sorcerers with their heads twisted backward, the corrupt politicians in boiling pitch, the hypocrites wearing heavy leaden cloaks, the thieves bitten by snakes, the fraudulent counselors consumed by fire, the sowers of discord hacked apart by demons, and finally, the liars, who are diseased beyond recognition. Langdon turned back to the audience. Dante most likely reserved this final ditch for the liars because a series of lies told about him led to his exile from his beloved Florence. Robert. The voice was Sienna's. Langdon snapped back to the present. Sienna was staring at him quizzically. What is it? Our version of La Mappa, he said excitedly. The art has been changed. He fished the projector out of his jacket pocket and shook it as best as he could in the close quarters. The agitator ball rattled loudly, but all the sirens drowned it out. Whoever created this image reconfigured the order of the levels in the Malbalch. When the device began to glow, Langdon pointed it at the flat surface before them. La Mappa del Inferno appeared, glowing brightly in the dim light. Botticelli on a chemical toilet, Langdon thought, ashamed. This had to be the least elegant place a Botticelli had ever been displayed. Langdon ran his eyes down through the ten ditches and began nodding excitedly. Yes, he exclaimed. This is wrong. The last ditch of the Malbalge is supposed to be full of diseased people, not people upside down. The tenth level is for the liars, not the clerical profiteers. Sienna looked intrigued. But, why would someone change that? Catrovisor, Langdon whispered, eyeing the little letters that had been added to each level. I don't think that's what this really says. Despite the injury that had erased Langdon's recollections of the last two days, he could now feel his memory working perfectly. He closed his eyes and held the two versions of La Mappa in his mind's eye to analyze their differences. The changes to the Malbalge were fewer than Langdon had imagined, and yet he felt like a veil had suddenly been lifted. Suddenly it was crystal clear. Seek and ye shall find. What is it? Sienna demanded. Langdon's mouth felt dry. I know why I'm here in Florence. You do. 
Yes, and I know where I'm supposed to go. Sienna grabbed his arm. Where? Langdon felt as if his feet had just touched solid ground for the first time since he'd awoken in the hospital. These ten letters, he whispered. They actually point to a precise location in the old city. That's where the answers are. Where in the old city? Sienna demanded. What did you figure out? The sounds of laughing voices echoed on the other side of the porta potty. Another group of art students was passing by, joking and chatting in various languages. Langdon peered cautiously around the cubicle, watching them go. Then he scanned for police. We've got to keep moving. I'll explain on the way. On the way. Sienna shook her head. We'll never get through the Porta Romana. Stay here for thirty seconds, he told her, and then follow my lead. With that, Langdon slipped away, leaving his newfound friend bewildered and alone. Chapter 21 Skuzi Robert Langdon chased after the group of students. Skusate. They all turned, and Langdon made a show of glancing around like a lost tourist. Davi el Estatuto Statel d'Arte. Langdon asked in broken Italian. A tattooed kid puffed coolly on a cigarette and snidely replied, Non parlamo italiano. His accent was French. One of the girls admonished her tattooed friend and politely pointed down the long wall toward the Porta Romana. P.I.U. Avanti, Semper Dritto. Straight ahead, Langdon translated. Grazie. On cue, Sienna emerged unseen from behind the porta potty and walked over. The willowy 32 year old approached the group and Langdon placed a welcoming hand on her shoulder. This is my sister, Sienna. She's an art teacher. The tattooed kid muttered, T-I-L-F, and his male friends laughed. Langdon ignored them. We're in Florence researching possible spots for a teaching year abroad. Can we walk in with you? Ma certo, the Italian girl said with a smile. As the group migrated toward the police at the Porta Romana, Sienna fell into conversation with the students while Langdon merged to the middle of the group, slouching low trying to stay out of sight. Seek and ye shall find, Langdon thought, his pulse racing with excitement as he pictured the ten ditches of the Malbalch. Catrovisor. These ten letters, Langdon had realized, stood at the core of one of the art world's most enigmatic mysteries, a centuries-old puzzle that had never been solved. In 1563, these ten letters had been used to spell a message high on a wall inside Florence's famed Palazzo Vecchio, painted some forty feet off the ground, barely visible without binoculars. It had remained hidden there in plain sight for centuries until the 1970s, when it was spotted by a now famous art diagnostician, who had spent decades trying to uncover its meaning. Despite numerous theories, the significance of the message remains an enigma to this day. For Langdon, the code felt like familiar ground a safe harbor from this strange and churning sea. After all, art history and ancient secrets were far more Langdon's realm than were biohazard tubes and gunfire. Up ahead, additional police cars had begun streaming into the Porta Romana. Jesus, the tattooed kids said. Whoever they're looking for must have done something terrible. The group arrived at the Art Institute's main gate on the right, where a crowd of students had gathered to watch the action at the Porta Romana. The school's minimum wage security guard was half-heartedly glancing at student IDs as kids streamed in, but he was clearly more interested in what was happening with the police. A loud screech of brakes echoed across the plaza as an all-too-familiar black van skidded into the Porta Romana. Langdon didn't need a second look. Without a word, he and Sienna seized the moment, slipping through the gate with their new friends. The entry road to the Istituto Stadel d'Arte was startlingly beautiful, almost regal in appearance. Massive oak trees arched gently in from either side, creating a canopy that framed the distant building a huge, faded yellow structure with a triple portico and an expansive oval lawn. This building, Langdon knew, had been commissioned, like so many in this city, by the same illustrious dynasty that had dominated Florentine politics during the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. The Medici. The name alone had become a symbol of Florence. 
During its three-century reign, the royal house of Medici amassed unfathomable wealth and influence, producing four popes, two queens of France, and the largest financial institution in all of Europe. To this day, modern banks use the accounting method invented by the Medici the dual-entry system of credits and debits. The Medici's greatest legacy, however, was not in finance or politics, but rather in art. Perhaps the most lavish patrons the art world has ever known, the Medici provided a generous stream of commissions that fueled the Renaissance. The list of luminaries receiving Medici patronage ranged from da Vinci to Galileo to Botticelli the latter's most famous painting, Birth of Venus, the result of a commission from Lorenzo de Medici, who requested a sexually provocative painting to hang over his cousin's marital bed as a wedding gift. Lorenzo de' Medici known in his day as Lorenzo the Magnificent on account of his benevolence was an accomplished artist and poet in his own right and was said to have a superb eye. In 1489 Lorenzo took a liking to the work of a young Florentine sculptor and invited the boy to move into the Medici Palace, where he could practice his craft surrounded by fine art, great poetry, and high culture. Under Medici tutelage the adolescent boy flourished and eventually went on to carve two of the most celebrated sculptures in all of history the Pieta and the David. Today we know him as Michelangelo a creative giant who is sometimes called the Medici's greatest gift to humankind. Considering the Medici's passion for art, Langdon imagined the family would be pleased to know that the building before him originally built as the Medici's primary horse stables had been transformed into the vibrant art institute. This tranquil site that now inspired young artists had been specifically chosen for the Medici's stables because of its proximity to one of the most beautiful riding areas in all of Florence. The Baboli Gardens Langdon glanced to his left, where a forest of treetops could be seen over a high wall. The massive expanse of the Baboli Gardens was now a popular tourist attraction. Langdon had little doubt that if he and Siena could gain entrance to the gardens, they could make their way across it bypassing the Porta Romana undetected. After all, the gardens were vast and had no shortage of hiding places forests, labyrinths, grottos, nymphia. More important, traversing the Baboli Gardens would eventually lead them to the Palazzo Pitti, the stone citadel that once housed the main seat of the Medici Grand Duchy, and whose 140 rooms remained one of Florence's most frequented tourist attractions. If we can reach the Palazzo Pitti, Langdon thought, the bridge to the old city is a stone's throw away. Langdon motioned as calmly as possible to the high wall that enclosed the gardens. How do we get into the gardens, he asked. I'd love to show my sister before we tour the institute. The tattooed kid shook his head. You can't get into the gardens from here. The entrance is way over at Pity Palace. You'd have to drive through Porta Romana and go around. Bullshit. Sienna blurted. Everyone turned and stared at her, including Langdon. Come on, she said, smirking coyly at the students as she stroked her blonde ponytail. You're telling me you guys don't sneak into the gardens to smoke weed and fool around. The kids all exchanged looks and then burst out laughing. The guy with the tattoos now looked utterly smitten. Ma'am, you should totally teach here. He walked Sienna to the side of the building and pointed around the corner to a rear parking lot see that shed on the left. There's an old platform behind it. Climb up on the roof, and you can jump down on the other side of the wall. Sienna was already on the move. She glanced back at Langdon with a patronizing smile. Come on, Brother Bob. Unless you're too old to jump a fence. Chapter 22 The silver-haired woman in the van leaned her head against the bulletproof window and closed her eyes. She felt like the world was spinning beneath her. The drugs they'd given her made her feel ill. I need medical attention, she thought. Even so, the armed guard beside her had strict orders, her needs were to be ignored until their task had been successfully completed. From the sounds of chaos around her, it was clear that would be no time soon. The dizziness was increasing now, and she was having trouble breathing. As she fought off a new wave of nausea, she wondered how life had managed to deliver her to this surreal crossroads. The answer was too complex to decipher in her current delirious state, but she had no doubt where it had all begun. New York 
two years ago. She had flown to Manhattan from Geneva, where she was serving as the director of the World Health Organization, a highly coveted and prestigious post that she had held for nearly a decade. A specialist in communicable disease and the epidemiology of epidemics, she had been invited to the UN to deliver a lecture assessing the threat of pandemic disease in third world countries. Her talk had been upbeat and reassuring, outlining several new early detection systems and treatment plans devised by the World Health Organization and others. She had received a standing ovation. Following the lecture, while she was in the hall talking to some lingering academics, a UN employee with a high-level diplomatic badge strode over and interrupted the conversation. Dr. Sinsky, we have just been contacted by the Council on Foreign Relations. There is someone there who would like to speak to you. A car is waiting outside. Puzzled and a bit unnerved, Dr. Elizabeth Sinsky excused herself and collected her overnight bag. As her limo raced up First Avenue, she began to feel strangely nervous. The Council on Foreign Relations? Elizabeth Sinsky, like most, had heard the rumors. Founded in the 1920s as a private think tank, the CFR had among its past membership nearly every Secretary of State, more than a half dozen presidents, a majority of CIA chiefs, senators, judges, as well as dynastic legends with names like Morgan, Rothschild, and Rockefeller. The membership's unparalleled collection of brain power, political influence, and wealth had earned the Council on Foreign Relations the reputation of being the most influential private club on earth. As director of the World Health Organization, Elizabeth was no stranger to rubbing shoulders with the big boys. Her long tenure at WHO, combined with her outspoken nature, had earned her a nod recently from a major news magazine that listed her among its 20 most influential people in the world. The face of World Health, they had written beneath her photo, which Elizabeth found ironic considering she had been such a sick child. Suffering from severe asthma by age six, she had been treated with a high dose of a promising new drug the first of the world's glucocorticoids, or steroid hormones which had cured her asthma symptoms in miraculous fashion. Sadly, the drug's unanticipated side effects had not emerged until years later when Sinsky passed through puberty and yet never developed a menstrual cycle. She would never forget the dark moment in the doctor's office, at 19, when she learned that the damage to her reproductive system was permanent. Elizabeth Sinsky could never have children. Time will heal the emptiness, her doctor assured, but the sadness and anger only grew inside her. Cruelly, the drugs that had robbed her of her ability to conceive a child had failed to rob her of her animal instincts to do so. For decades, she had battled her cravings to fulfill this impossible desire. Even now, at 61 years old, she still felt a pang of hollowness every time she saw a mother and infant. It's just ahead, Dr. Sinsky, the limo driver announced. Elizabeth ran a quick brush through her long silver ringlets and checked her face in the mirror. Before she knew it, the car had stopped and the driver was helping her out onto the sidewalk in an affluent section of Manhattan. I'll wait here for you, the driver said. We can go straight to the airport when you're ready. The New York headquarters of the Council on Foreign Relations was an unobtrusive neoclassical building on the corner of Park and 68th that had once been the home of a standard oil tycoon. Its exterior blended seamlessly with the elegant landscape surrounding it, offering no hint of its unique purpose. Dr. Sinsky, a portly female receptionist greeted her. This way, please. He's expecting you. Okay, but who is he? She followed the receptionist down a luxurious corridor to a closed door, on which the woman gave a quick knock before opening it and motioning for Elizabeth to enter. She went in, and the door closed behind her. The small, dark conference room was illuminated only by the glow of a video screen. In front of the screen, a very tall and lanky silhouette faced her. Though she couldn't make out his face, she sensed power here. Dr. Sinsky, the man's sharp voice declared. Thank you for joining me. The man's tautly precise accent suggested Elizabeth's homeland of Switzerland, or perhaps Germany. Please sit, he said, motioning to a chair near the front of the room. No introductions? Elizabeth sat. 
the bizarre image being projected on the video screen did nothing to calm her nerves. What in the world? I was at your presentation this morning, declared the silhouette. I came a long distance to hear you speak. An impressive performance. Thank you, she replied. Might I also say you are much more beautiful than I imagined, despite your age and your myopic view of world health. Elizabeth felt her jaw drop. The comment was offensive in all kinds of ways. Excuse me, she demanded, peering into the darkness. Who are you? And why have you called me here? Pardon my failed attempt at humor, the lanky shadow replied. The image on the screen will explain why you're here. Sinsky eyed the horrific visual a painting depicting a vast sea of humanity, throngs of sickly people, all climbing over one another in a dense tangle of naked bodies. The great artist Dory, the man announced. His spectacularly grim interpretation of Dante Alighieri's vision of hell. I hope it looks comfortable to you, because that's where we're headed. He paused, drifting slowly toward her. And let me tell you why. He kept moving toward her, seeming to grow taller with every step. If I were to take this piece of paper and tear it in two, he paused at a table, picked up a sheet of paper, and ripped it loudly in half. And then if I were to place the two halves on top of each other, he stacked the two halves. And then if I were to repeat the process, he again tore the papers, stacking them. I produce a stack of paper that is now four times the thickness of the original, correct? His eyes seemed to smolder in the darkness of the room. Elizabeth did not appreciate his condescending tone and aggressive posture. She said nothing. Hypothetically speaking, he continued, moving closer still, if the original sheet of paper is a mere one-tenth of a millimeter thick, and I were to repeat this process, say, fifty times, do you know how tall this stack would be? Elizabeth bristled. I do, she replied with more hostility than she intended. It would be one-tenth of a millimeter times two to the fiftieth power. It's called geometric progression. Might I ask what I'm doing here? The man smirked and gave an impressed nod. Yes, and can you guess what that actual value might look like? One-tenth of a millimeter times two to the fiftieth power? Do you know how tall our stack of paper has become? He paused only an instant. Our stack of paper, after only fifty doublings, now reaches almost all the way, to the Sunday. Elizabeth was not surprised. The staggering power of geometric growth was something she dealt with all the time in her work. Circles of contamination, replication of infected cells, death toll estimates. I apologize if I seem naive, she said, making no effort to hide her annoyance. But I'm missing your point. My point. He chuckled quietly. My point is that the history of our human population growth is even more dramatic. The Earth's population, like our stack of paper, had very meager beginnings, but alarming potential. He was pacing again. Consider this. It took the Earth's population thousands of years from the early dawn of man all the way to the early 1800s to reach one billion people. Then, astoundingly, it took only about a hundred years to double the population to two billion in the 1920s. After that, it took a mere 50 years for the population to double again to 4 billion in the 1970s. As you can imagine, we're well on track to reach 8 billion very soon. Just today, the human race added another quarter million people to planet Earth. A quarter million. And this happens every day rain or shine. Currently, every year, we're adding the equivalent of the entire country of Germany. The tall man stopped short hovering over Elizabeth. How old are you? Another offensive question, although as the head of the WHO, she was accustomed to handling antagonism with diplomacy. 61. Did you know that if you live another 19 years, until the age of 80, you will witness the population triple in your lifetime? One lifetime a tripling. Think of the implications. As you know, your World Health Organization has again increased its forecasts, predicting there will be some 9 billion people on Earth before the midpoint of this century. 
animal species are going extinct at a precipitously accelerated rate. The demand for dwindling natural resources is skyrocketing. Clean water is harder and harder to come by. By any biological gauge, our species has exceeded our sustainable numbers. And in the face of this disaster, the World Health Organization the gatekeeper of the planet's health is investing in things like curing diabetes, filling blood banks, battling cancer. He paused, staring directly at her. And so I brought you here to ask you directly why the hell the World Health Organization does not have the guts to deal with this issue head on. Elizabeth was seething now. Whoever you are, you know damned well the who takes over population very seriously. Recently we spent millions of dollars sending doctors into Africa to deliver free condoms and educate people about birth control. Ah, uh, yes, the lanky man derided. And an even bigger army of Catholic missionaries marched in on your heels and told the Africans that if they used the condoms, they'd all go to hell. Africa has a new environmental issue now landfills overflowing with unused condoms. Elizabeth strained to hold her tongue. He was correct on this point, and yet modern Catholics were starting to fight back against the Vatican's meddling in reproductive issues. Most notably, Melinda Gates, a devout Catholic herself, had bravely risked the wrath of her own church by pledging $560 million to help improve access to birth control around the world. Elizabeth Sinsky had gone on record many times saying that Bill and Melinda Gates deserved to be canonized for all they'd done through their foundation to improve world health. Sadly, the only institution capable of conferring sainthood somehow failed to see the Christian nature of their efforts. Dr. Sinsky, the shadow continued. What the World Health Organization fails to recognize is that there is only one global health issue. He pointed again to the grim image on the screen a sea of tangled, cloying humanity. And this is it. He paused. I realize you are a scientist, and therefore perhaps not a student of the classics or the fine arts, so let me offer another image that may speak to you in a language you can better understand. The room went dark for an instant, and the screen refreshed. The new image was one Elizabeth had seen many times, and it always brought an eerie sense of inevitability. A heavy silence settled in the room. Yes, the lanky man finally said. Silent terror is an apt response to this graph. Seeing it is a bit like staring into the headlight of an oncoming locomotive. Slowly, the man turned to Elizabeth and gave her a tight, condescending smile. Any questions, Dr. Sinsky? Just one, she fired back. Did you bring me here to lecture me or insult me? Neither. His voice turned eerily cajoling. I brought you here to work with you. I have no doubt you understand that overpopulation is a health issue. But what I fear you don't understand is that it will affect the very soul of man. Under the stress of overpopulation, those who have never considered stealing will become thieves to feed their families. Those who have never considered killing will kill to provide for their young. All of Dante's deadly sins greed, gluttony, treachery, murder and the rest will begin percolating, rising up to the surface of humanity, amplified by our evaporating comforts. We are facing a battle for the very soul of man. I'm a biologist. I save lives, not souls. Well, I can assure you that saving lives will become increasingly difficult in the coming years. Overpopulation breeds far more than spiritual discontent. There is a passage in Machiavelli yes, she interrupted, reciting her recollection of the famous quote. When every province of the world so teems with inhabitants that they can neither subsist where they are nor remove themselves elsewhere, the world will purge itself. She stared up at him. All of us at the who are familiar with that quotation. Good. Then you know that Machiavelli went on to talk about plagues as the world's natural way of self-purging. Yes, and as I mentioned in my talk, we are well aware of the direct correlation between population density and the likelihood of wide-scale epidemics, but we are constantly devising new detection and treatment methods. The WHO remains confident that we can prevent future pandemics. That's a pity. Elizabeth stared in disbelief. I beg your pardon. Dr. Sinsky, the man said with a strange laugh, you talk about controlling epidemics as if it's a good thing. 
she gaped up at the man in mute disbelief. There you have it, the lanky man declared, sounding like an attorney resting his case. Here I stand with the head of the World Health Organization the best the WHO has to offer. A terrifying thought if you consider it. I have shown you this image of impending misery. He refreshed the screen, again displaying the image of the bodies. I have reminded you of the awesome power of unchecked population growth. He pointed to his small stack of paper. I have enlightened you about the fact that we are on the brink of a spiritual collapse. He paused and turned directly toward her. And your response? Free condoms in Africa. The man gave a derisive sneer. This is like swinging a fly swatter at an incoming asteroid. The time bomb is no longer ticking. It has already gone off, and without drastic measures, exponential mathematics will become your new god, and he is a vengeful god. He will bring to you Dante's vision of hell right outside on Park Avenue, huddled masses wallowing in their own excrement. A global calling orchestrated by nature herself. Is that so? Elizabeth snapped. So tell me, in your vision of a sustainable future, what is the ideal population of Earth? What is the magic number at which humankind can hope to sustain itself indefinitely, and in relative comfort? The tall man smiled, clearly appreciating the question. Any environmental biologist or statistician will tell you that humankind's best chance of long-term survival occurs with a global population of around 4 billion. 4 billion. Elizabeth fired back. We're at 7 billion now, so it's a little late for that. The tall man's green eyes flashed fire. Is it? Chapter 23 Robert Langdon landed hard on the spongy earth just inside the retaining wall of the Baboli Garden's heavily wooded southern edge. Sienna landed beside him and stood up, brushing herself off and taking in their surroundings. They were standing in a glade of moss and ferns on the edge of a small forest. From here, the Palazzo Pitti was entirely obscured from view, and Langdon sensed they were about as far from the palace as one could get in the gardens. At least there were no workers or tourists out this far at this early hour. Langdon gazed at a peace-tone pathway that wound gracefully downhill into the forest before them. At the point where the path disappeared into the trees, a marble statue had been perfectly situated to receive the eye. Langdon was not surprised. The Baboli Gardens had enjoyed the exceptional design talents of Niccolo Tribolo, Giorgio Vasari, and Bernardo Buontalenti a brain trust of aesthetic talent that had created on this one eleven-acre canvas a walkable masterpiece. If we head northeast, we'll reach the palace, Langdon said, pointing down the path. We can mix there with the tourists and exit unseen. I'm guessing it opens at nine. Langdon glanced down to check the time but saw only his bare wrist where his Mickey Mouse watch had once been strapped. He wondered absently if it was still at the hospital with the rest of his clothing and if he'd ever be able to retrieve it. Sienna planted her feet defiantly. Robert, before we take another step, I want to know where we're going. What did you figure out back there? The Malbolch? You said it was out of sequence. Langdon motioned toward a wooded area just ahead. Let's get out of sight first. He led her down a pathway that curled into an enclosed hollow A room, in the parlance of landscape architecture where there were some faubois benches and a small fountain. The air beneath the trees was decidedly colder. Langdon took the projector from his pocket and began shaking it. Sienna, whoever created this digital image not only added letters to the sinners in the Malbolch, but he also changed the order of the sins. He hopped up on the bench, towering over Siena, and aimed the projector down at his feet. Botticelli's Mappa del Inferno materialized faintly on the flat bench top beside Siena. Langdon motioned to the tiered area at the bottom of the funnel. See the letters in the ten ditches of the Malbolge. Siena found them on the projection and read from top to bottom. Catrovisor. Right. Meaningless. But then you realized the ten ditches had been shuffled around. Easier than that, actually. If these levels were a deck of ten cards, the deck was not so much shuffled as simply cut once. After the cut, the cards remain in the correct order, but they start with the wrong card. Langdon pointed down at the ten ditches of the Malbolge. 
according to Dante's text, our top level should be the seducers whipped by demons. And yet, in this version, the seducers appear, way down in the seventh ditch. Sienna studied the now fading image beside her and nodded. Okay, I see that. The first ditch is now the seventh. Langdon pocketed the projector and jumped back down onto the pathway. He grabbed a small stick and began scratching letters on a patch of dirt just off the path. Here are the letters as they appear in our modified version of Hell. C-A-T-R-O-V-A-C-E-R Catrovacer, Sienna Reed. Yes. And here is where the deck was cut. Langdon now drew a line beneath the seventh letter and waited while Sienna studied his handiwork. C-A-T-R-O-V-A-C-E-R -E okay, she said quickly. Catrova. Sir. Yes, and to put the cards back in order, we simply uncut the deck and place the bottom on top. The two have swapped places. Sienna eyed the letters. Sir. Catrova. She shrugged, looking unimpressed. Still meaningless, Sir Catrova, Langdon repeated. After a pause, he said the words again, delighting them together. Sir Catrova. Finally, he said them with a pause in the middle. Circa, Trova. Sienna gasped audibly and her eyes shot up to meet Langdon's. Yes, Langdon said with a smile. Circa Trova. The two Italian words Circa and Trova literally meant seek and find. When combined as a phrase Circa Trova they were synonymous with the biblical aphorism seek and ye shall find. Your hallucinations. Sienna exclaimed. Breathless. The woman with the veil. She kept telling you to seek and find. She jumped to her feet. Robert, do you realize what this means? It means the words Circa Trova were already in your subconscious. Don't you see? You must have deciphered this phrase before you arrived at the hospital. You had probably seen this projector's image already, but had forgotten. She's right, he realized having been so fixated on the cipher itself that it never occurred to him that he might have been through all of this already. Robert, you said earlier that law map points to a specific location in the old city. But I still don't understand where. Sir Katrova doesn't ring any bells for you. She shrugged. Langdon smiled inwardly. Finally, something Sienna doesn't know. As it turns out, this phrase points very specifically to a famous mural that hangs in the Palazzo Vecchio Giorgio Vasari's Battaglia di Marciano in the Hall of the 500. Near the top of the painting, barely visible, Vasari painted the words Circa Trova in tiny letters. Plenty of theories exist as to why he did this, but no conclusive proof has ever been discovered. The high-pitched whine of a small aircraft suddenly buzzed overhead, streaking in out of nowhere and skimming the wooded canopy just above them. The sound was very close, and Langdon and Sienna froze as the craft raced past. As the aircraft departed, Langdon peered up at it through the trees. Toy helicopter, he said, exhaling as he watched the three-foot-long, radio-controlled chopper banking in the distance. It sounded like a giant, angry mosquito. Sienna, however, still looked wary. Stay down. Sure enough. The little chopper banked fully and was now coming back their way, skimming the treetops, sailing past them again, this time off to their left above another glade. That's not a toy, she whispered. It's a reconnaissance drone. Probably has a video camera on board sending live images back to, somebody. Langdon's jaw tightened as he watched the chopper streak off in the direction from which it had appeared the Porta Romana and the Art Institute. I don't know what you did. Sienna said, but some powerful people are clearly very eager to find you. The helicopter banked yet again and began a slow pass along the perimeter wall they had just jumped. Someone at the Art Institute must have seen us and said something, Sienna said, heading down the path. We've got to get out of here. Now. As the drone buzzed away toward the far end of the gardens, Langdon used his foot to erase the letters he'd written on the pathway and then hurried after Sienna. His mind swirled with thoughts of Circa Trova, the Giorgio Vasari mural, as well as with Sienna's revelation that Langdon must have already deciphered the projector's message. 
Seek and ye shall find. Suddenly, just as they entered a second glade, a startling thought hit Langdon. He skidded to a stop on the wooded path, a bemused look on his face. Sienna stopped, too. Robert? What is it? I'm innocent, he declared. What are you talking about? The people chasing me. I assumed it was because I had done something terrible. Yes, at the hospital you kept repeating very sorry. I know. But I thought I was speaking English. Sienna looked at him with surprise. You were speaking English. Langdon's blue eyes were now filled with excitement. Sienna, when I kept saying very sorry, I wasn't apologizing. I was mumbling about the secret message in the mural at Palazzo Vecchio. He could still hear the recording of his own delirious voice. V, sorry. V, sorry. Sienna looked lost. Don't you see? Langdon was grinning now. I wasn't saying very sorry, very sorry. I was saying the artist's name V.A., sorry, Vasari. Chapter 24 Vayantha hit the brakes hard. Her motorcycle fishtailed, screeching loudly as it left a long skid mark on the Viale del Poggio Imperiale, finally coming to an abrupt stop behind an unexpected line of traffic. The Viale del Poggio was at a standstill. I don't have time for this. Vayantha craned her neck over the cars, trying to see what was causing the holdup. She had already been forced to drive in a wide circle to avoid the SRS team and all the chaos at the apartment building and now she needed to get into the old city to clear out of the hotel room where she had been stationed for the last few days of this mission. I've been disavowed I need to get the hell out of town. Her string of bad luck, however, seemed to be continuing. The route she had selected into the old city appeared to be blocked. In no mood to wait, Vayantha revved the bike off to one side of the traffic and sped along the narrow breakdown lane until she could see the snarled intersection. Up ahead was a clogged rotary where six major thoroughfares converged. This was the Porta Romana one of Florence's most trafficked intersections the gateway to the old city. What the hell is going on here? Vayantha now saw that the entire area was swarming with police a roadblock or checkpoint of some sort. Moments later, she spotted something at the center of the action that left her baffled a familiar black van around which several black-clad agents were calling out orders to the local authorities. These men, without a doubt, were members of the SRS team, and yet Vayantha could not imagine what they were doing here. Unless... Vayantha swallowed hard, scarcely daring to imagine the possibility. Has Langdon eluded Bruder as well? It seemed unthinkable, the chances of escape had been near zero. Then again, Langdon was not working alone, and Vayantha had experienced firsthand how resourceful the blonde woman could be. Nearby, a police officer appeared, walking from car to car, showing a photo of a handsome man with thick brown hair. Vayanthi instantly recognized the photo as a press shot of Robert Langdon. Her heart soared. Bruder missed him. Langdon is still in play. An experienced strategist, Vayanthi immediately began assessing how this development changed her situation. Option 1 Flee is required. Vayantha had blown a critical job for the provost and had been disavowed because of it. If she were lucky, she would face a formal inquiry and probable career termination. If, however, she were unlucky and had underestimated the severity of her employer, she might spend the rest of her life looking over her shoulder and wondering if the consortium was lurking just out of sight. There is a second option now. Complete your mission. Staying on task was in direct opposition to her disavowal protocol, and yet with Langdon still on the run, Vayantha now had the opportunity to continue with her original directive. If Bruder fails to catch Langdon, she thought, her pulse quickening. And if I succeed? Vayantha knew it was a long shot, but if Langdon managed to elude Bruder entirely, and if Vayantha could still step in and finish the job, she would single-handedly have saved the day for the consortium and the provost would have no choice but to be lenient. I'll keep my job, she thought. Probably even be promoted. In a flash, Vayantha realized that her entire future now revolved around a single critical undertaking. 
I must locate Langdon, before Bruder does. It would not be easy. Bruder had at his disposal endless manpower as well as a vast array of advanced surveillance technologies. Vayantha was working alone. She did, however, possess one piece of information that Bruder, the provost, and the police did not have. I have a very good idea where Langdon will go. Revving the throttle on her BMW, she spun it 180 degrees around and headed back the way she came. Ponte alle grazie, she thought, picturing the bridge to the north. There existed more than one route into the old city. Chapter 25 Not an Apology, Langdon mused. An artist's name. Vasari, Sienna stammered, taking a full step backward on the path. The artist who hid the words Circa Trova in his mural. Langdon couldn't help but smile. Vasari. Vasari. In addition to shedding a ray of light on his strange predicament, this revelation also meant Langdon was no longer wondering what terrible thing he might have done, for which he had been profusely saying he was very sorry. Robert, you clearly had seen this Botticelli image on the projector before you were injured, and you knew it contained a code that pointed to Vasari's mural. That's why you woke up and kept repeating Vasari's name. Langdon tried to calculate what all of this meant. Giorgio Vasari a 16th century artist, architect, and writer was a man Langdon often referred to as the world's first art historian. Despite the hundreds of paintings Vasari created, and the dozens of buildings he designed, his most enduring legacy was his seminal book, Lives of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, a collection of biographies of Italian artists, which to this day remains requisite reading for students of art history. The words Circa Trova had placed Vasari back in the mainstream consciousness about 30 years ago when his secret message was discovered high on his sprawling mural in the Palazzo Vecchio's Hall of the 500. The tiny letters appeared on a green battle flag, barely visible among the chaos of the war scene. While consensus had yet to be reached as to why Vasari added this strange message to his mural, the leading theory was that it was a clue to future generations of the existence of a lost Leonardo da Vinci fresco hidden in a three-centimeter gap behind that wall. Sienna was glancing nervously up through the trees. There's still one thing I don't understand. If you weren't saying very sorry, very sorry, then why are people trying to kill you? Langdon had been wondering the same thing. The distant buzz of the surveillance drone was getting louder again, and Langdon knew the time had come for a decision. He failed to see how Vasari's Battaglia di Marciano could possibly relate to Dante's Inferno, or the gunshot wound he had suffered the night before, and yet he finally saw a tangible path before him. Circa Trova. Seek and find. Again Langdon saw the silver-haired woman calling out to him from across the river. Time is running out. If there were answers, Langdon sensed, they would be at the Palazzo Vecchio. He now flashed on an old adage from early Grecian free divers who hunted lobsters in the coral caves of the Aegean Islands. When swimming into a dark tunnel, there arrives a point of no return when you no longer have enough breath to double back. Your only choice is to swim forward into the unknown, and pray for an exit. Langdon wondered if they had reached that point. He eyed the maze of garden pathways before them. If he and Sienna could reach the Pity Palace and exit the gardens, then the old city was just a short walk across the most famous footbridge in the world the Ponte Vecchio. It was always crowded and would provide good cover. From there, the Palazzo Vecchio was only a few blocks away. The drone hummed closer now, and Langdon felt momentarily overwhelmed by exhaustion. The realization that he had not been saying very sorry left him feeling conflicted about running from the police. Eventually, they're going to catch me, Sienna, Langdon said. It might be better for me to stop running. Sienna looked at him with alarm. Robert, every time you stop, someone starts shooting at you. You need to figure out what you're involved in. You need to look at that Vasari mural and hope it jars your memory. Maybe it will help you learn where this projector came from and why you are carrying it. Langdon pictured the spike-haired woman coldly killing Dr. Marconi, the soldiers firing on them, the Italian military police gathering in the Porta Romana, and now a surveillance drone tracking them through the Baboli Gardens. He fell silent, 
rubbing his tired eyes as he considered his options. Robert. Sienna's voice rose. There's one other thing, something that didn't seem important, but now seems like it might be. Langdon raised his eyes, reacting to the gravity in her tone. I intended to tell you at the apartment, she said, but, what is it? Sienna pursed her lips, looking uncomfortable. When you arrived at the hospital, you were delirious and trying to communicate. Yes, Langdon said, mumbling Vasari, Vasari. Yes, but before that, before we got out the recorder, in the first moments after you arrived, you said one other thing I remember. You only said it once, but I'm positive I understood. What did I say? Sienna glanced up toward the drone and then back at Langdon. You said, I hold the key to finding it, if I fail, then all is death. Langdon could only stare. Sienna continued. I thought you were referring to the object in your jacket pocket, but now I'm not so sure. If I fail, then all is death? The words hit Langdon hard. The haunting images of death flickered before him. Dante's Inferno, the biohazard symbol, the plague doctor. Yet again, the face of the beautiful silver-haired woman pleaded with him across the blood-red river. Seek and find. Time is running out. Sienna's voice pulled him back. Whatever this projector ultimately points to, or whatever you are trying to find, it must be something extremely dangerous. The fact that people are trying to kill us, her voice cracked slightly, and she took a moment to regroup. Think about it. They just shot at you in broad daylight, shot at me an innocent bystander. Nobody seems to be looking to negotiate. Your own government turned on you, you called them for help, and they sent someone to kill you. Langdon stared vacantly at the ground. Whether the U.S. consulate had shared Langdon's location with the assassin, or whether the consulate itself had sent the assassin, was irrelevant. The upshot was the same. My own government is not on my side. Langdon looked into Sienna's brown eyes and saw bravery there. What have I gotten her involved in? I wish I knew what we were looking for. That would help put all of this into perspective. Sienna nodded. Whatever it is, I think we need to find it. At least it would give us leverage. Her logic was hard to refute. Still Langdon felt something nagging at him. If I fail, then all is death. All morning he'd been running up against macabre symbols of biohazards, plagues, and Dante's hell. Admittedly, he had no clear proof of what he was looking for, but he would be naive not to consider at least the possibility that this situation involved a deadly disease or large-scale biological threat. But if this were true, why would his own government be trying to eliminate him? Do they think I'm somehow involved in a potential attack? It made no sense at all. There was something else going on here. Langdon thought again of the silver-haired woman. There's also the woman from my visions. I feel I need to find her. Then trust your feelings, Sienna said. In your condition, the best compass you have is your subconscious mind. It's basic psychology if your gut is telling you to trust that woman, then I think you should do exactly what she keeps telling you to do. Seek and find, they said in unison. Langdon exhaled, knowing his path was clear. All I can do is keep swimming down this tunnel. With hardening resolve, he turned and began taking in his surroundings, trying to get his bearings. Which way out of the gardens? They were standing beneath the trees at the edge of a wide open plaza where several paths intersected. In the distance to their left, Langdon spied an elliptical-shaped lagoon with a small island adorned with lemon trees and statuary. The Isolato, he thought, recognizing the famous sculpture of Perseus on a half-submerged horse bounding through the water. The pity palace is that way, Langdon said, pointing east, away from the Isolato, toward the garden's main thoroughfare the Viato Loni, which ran east-west along the entire length of the grounds. The Viato Loni was as wide as a two-lane road and lined by a row of slender, 400-year-old cypress trees. There's no cover, Sienna said, eyeing the uncamouflaged avenue and motioning up at the circling drone. You're right, 
Langdon said with a lopsided grin. Which is why we're taking the tunnel beside it. He pointed again, this time to a dense hedgerow adjacent to the mouth of the Viato Loni. The wall of dense greenery had a small arched opening cut into it. Beyond the opening, a slender footpath stretched out into the distance a tunnel running parallel with the Viato Loni. It was enclosed on either side by a phalanx of pruned whole mokes, which had been carefully trained since the 1600s to arch inward over the path, intertwining overhead and providing an awning of foliage. The pathway's name, La Serchiata literally circular or hoop derived from its canopy of curved trees resembling barrel stays or serchi. Sienna hurried over to the opening and peered into the shaded channel. Immediately she turned back to him with a smile. Better. Wasting no time, she slipped through the opening and hurried off among the trees. Langdon had always considered La Serchiata one of Florence's most peaceful spots. Today, however, as he watched Sienna disappear down the darkened alley, he thought again of the Grecian free divers swimming into corral tunnels and praying they'd reach an exit. Langdon quickly said his own little prayer and hurried after her. A half mile behind them, outside the Art Institute, Agent Bruder strode through a bustle of police and students, his icy gaze parting the crowds before him. He made his way to the makeshift command post that his surveillance specialist had set up on the hood of his black van. From the aerial drone, the specialist said, handing Bruder a tablet screen. Taken a few minutes ago. Bruder examined the video stills, pausing on a blurry enlargement of two faces a dark-haired man and a blonde ponytailed woman both huddled in the shadows and peering skyward through a canopy of trees. Robert Langdon. Sienna Brooks. Zero doubt. Bruder turned his attention to the map of the Baboli Gardens, which was spread out on the hood. They made a poor choice, he thought, eyeing the garden layout. While it was sprawling and intricate, with plenty of hiding places, the gardens also appeared to be surrounded on all sides by high walls. The Baboli Gardens were the closest thing to a natural killbox that Bruder had ever seen in the field. They'll never get out. Local authorities are sealing all exits, the agent said. And commencing a sweep. Keep me informed, Bruder said. Slowly, he raised his eyes to the van's thick polycarbonate window, beyond which he could see the silver-haired woman seated in the back of the vehicle. The drugs they had given her had definitely dulled her senses more than Bruder had imagined. Nonetheless, he could tell by the fearful look in her eyes that she still had a firm grasp on precisely what was going on. She does not look happy, Bruder thought. Then again, why would she? Chapter 26 A Spire of Water Shot 20 Feet in the Air Langdon watched it fall gently back to earth and knew they were getting close. They had reached the end of La Serchiata's leafy tunnel and dashed across an open lawn into a grove of cork trees. Now they were looking out at the Baboli's most famous spouting fountain Stoldo Lorenzi's bronze of Neptune clutching his three-pronged trident. Irreverently known by locals as the Fountain of the Fork. This water feature was considered the central point of the gardens. Sienna stopped at the edge of the grove and peered upward through the trees. I don't see the drone. Langdon no longer heard it either, and yet the fountain was quite loud. Must have needed to refuel, Sienna said. This is our chance. Which way? Langdon led her to the left, and they began descending a steep incline. As they emerged from the trees, the pity palace came into view. Nice little house, Sienna whispered. Typical Medici understatement, he replied wryly. Still almost a quarter mile away, the pity palace's stone facade dominated the landscape, stretching out to their left and right. Its exterior of bulging, rusticated stonework lent the building an air of unyielding authority that was further accentuated by a powerful repetition of shuttered windows and arch topped apertures. Traditionally, formal palaces were situated on high ground so that anyone in the gardens had to look uphill at the building. The Pity Palace, however, was situated in a low valley near the Arno River, meaning that people in the Baboli Gardens looked downhill at the palace. This effect was only more dramatic. One architect had described the palace as appearing to have been built by nature herself, as if the massive stones in a landslide had tumbled down the long escarpment and landed in an elegant, 
barricade-like pile at the bottom. Despite its less defensible position in the low ground, the solid stone structure of the Pitti Palace was so imposing that Napoleon had once used it as a power base while in Florence. Look, Siena said, pointing to the nearest doors of the palace. Good news. Langdon had seen it, too. On this strange morning, the most welcome sight was not the palace itself, but the tourists streaming out of the building into the lower gardens. The palace was open, which meant that Langdon and Siena would have no trouble slipping inside and passing through the building to escape the gardens. Once outside the palace, Langdon knew they would see the Arno River to their right, and beyond that, the spires of the old city. He and Siena kept moving, half jogging now down the steep embankment. As they descended, they traversed the Baboli Amphitheatre the site of the very first opera performance in history which lay nestled like a horseshoe on the side of a hill. Beyond that, they passed the obelisk of Ramses II and the unfortunate piece of art that was positioned at its base. The guidebooks referred to the piece as a colossal stone basin from Rome's Baths of Caracalla, but Langdon always saw it for what it truly was the world's largest bathtub. They really need to put that thing somewhere else. They finally reached the rear of the palace and slowed to a calm walk, mixing inconspicuously with the first tourists of the day. Moving against the tide, they descended a narrow tunnel into the Cortile, an inner courtyard where visitors were seated enjoying a morning espresso in the palace's makeshift café. The smell of fresh ground coffee filled the air, and Langdon felt a sudden longing to sit down and enjoy a civilized breakfast. Today's not the day, he thought as they pressed on entering the wide stone passageway that led toward the palace's main doors. As they neared the doorway, Langdon and Siena collided with a growing bottleneck of stalled tourists who seemed to be assembling in the portico to observe something outside. Langdon peered through the crowd to the area in front of the palace. The pity's grand entrance was as blunt and unwelcoming as he recalled it. Rather than a manicured lawn and landscaping, the front yard was a vast expanse of pavement that stretched across an entire hillside, flowing down to the Via Dei Gicardini like a massive paved ski slope. At the bottom of the hill, Langdon now saw the reason for the crowd of onlookers. Down in Piazza Dei Pitti, a half-dozen police cars had streamed in from all directions. A small army of officers were advancing up the hill, unholstering their weapons and fanning out to secure the front of the palace. Chapter 27 As the police entered the Pitti Palace, Siena and Langdon were already on the move, retracing their steps through the interior of the palace and away from the arriving police. They hurried through the cortile and past the café, where a buzz was spreading, tourists rubbernecking in an attempt to locate the source of the commotion. Siena was amazed the authorities had found them so quickly. The drone must have disappeared because it had already spotted us. She and Langdon found the same narrow tunnel through which they had descended from the gardens and without hesitation plunged back into the passageway and bounded up the stairs. The end of the staircase banked left along a high retaining wall. As they dashed along the wall, it grew shorter beside them, until finally they could see over it into the vast expanse of the Baboli Gardens. Langdon instantly grabbed Sienna's arm and yanked her backward, ducking out of sight behind the retaining wall. Siena had seen it, too. Three hundred yards away, on the slope above the amphitheatre, a phalanx of police descended, searching groves, interviewing tourists, coordinating with one another on handheld radios. We're trapped. Siena had never imagined, when she and Robert Langdon first met, that it would lead to this. This is more than I bargained for. When Siena had left the hospital with Langdon, she thought they were fleeing a woman with spiked hair and a gun. Now they were running from an entire military team and the Italian authorities. Their chances of escape, she was now realizing, were almost zero. Is there any other way out? Sienna demanded, short of breath. I don't think so, Langdon said. This garden is a walled city, just like, he paused suddenly, turning and looking east. Just like the Vatican. A strange glint of hope flickered across his face. Siena had no idea what the Vatican had to do with their current predicament, but Langdon suddenly began nodding, gazing east along the back of the palace. It's a long shot, he said, hustling her along with him now. 
but there might be a different way to get out of here. Two figures materialized suddenly before them, having rounded the corner of the retaining wall, nearly bumping into Sienna and Langdon. Both figures were wearing black, and for one frightening instant, Sienna thought they were the soldiers she had encountered at the apartment building. As they passed, though, she saw they were only tourists Italian, she guessed, from all the stylish black leather. Having an idea, Sienna caught one of the tourists' arms and smiled up at him as warmly as possible. Piodersi Davi la Galleria del Costume, she asked in rapid Italian, requesting directions to the palace's famed costume gallery. Io e mio fratello siamo in ritardo per una visita privata. My brother and I are late for a private tour. Certo. The man grinned at them both, looking eager to help. Proscite dritto per il sentiero. He turned and pointed west, along the retaining wall, directly away from whatever Langdon had been looking at. Molte grazie. Sienna chirped with another smile as the two men headed off. Langdon gave Sienna an impressed nod, apparently understanding her motives. If the police began questioning tourists, they might hear that Langdon and Sienna were headed for the costume gallery, which, according to the map on the wall before them, was at the far western end of the palace, as far as possible from the direction in which they were now headed. We need to get to that path over there, Langdon said, motioning across an open plaza toward a walkway that ran down another hill, away from the palace. The peace tone walkway was sheltered on the uphill side by massive hedges, providing plenty of cover from the authorities now descending the hill, only a hundred yards away. Sienna calculated that their chances of getting across the open area to the sheltered path were very slim. Tourists were gathering there, watching the police with curiosity. The faint thrum of the drone became audible again, approaching in the distance. Now or never, Langdon said, grabbing her hand and pulling her with him out into the open plaza, where they began winding through the crowd of gathering tourists. Sienna fought the urge to break into a run, but Langdon held firmly on to her, walking briskly but calmly through the throng. When they finally reached the opening to the pathway, Sienna glanced back over her shoulder to see if they had been detected. The only police officers in sight were all facing the other way, their eyes turned skyward toward the sound of the incoming drone. She faced front and hurried with Langdon down the path. Before them now, the skyline of old Florence poked above the trees, visible directly ahead in the distance. She saw the red-tiled cupola of the Duomo and the green, red and white spire of Giotto's bell tower. For an instant, she could also make out the crenellated spire of the Palazzo Vecchio their seemingly impossible destination but as they descended the pathway, the high perimeter walls blotted out the view, engulfing them again. By the time they reached the bottom of the hill, Sienna was out of breath and wondering if Langdon had any idea where they were going. The path led directly into a maze garden, but Langdon confidently turned left into a wide gravel patio, which he skirted, staying behind a hedge in the shadows of the overhanging trees. The patio was deserted, more of an employee parking lot than a tourist area. Where are we going? Sienna finally asked, breathless. Almost there. Almost where? The entire patio was enclosed by walls that were at least three stories tall. The only exit Sienna saw was a vehicle gateway on the left, which was sealed by a massive wrought iron grate that looked like it dated back to the original palace in the days of marauding armies. Beyond the barricade, she could see police gathered in the Piazza Dei Pitti. Staying along the perimeter vegetation, Langdon pushed onward, heading directly for the wall in front of them. Sienna scanned the sheer face for any open doorway, but all she saw was a niche containing what had to be the most hideous statue she had ever seen. Good God, the Medici could afford any artwork on earth, and they chose this. The statue before them depicted an obese, naked dwarf straddling a giant turtle. The dwarf's testicles were squashed against the turtle's shell, and the turtle's mouth was dribbling water, as if he were ill. I know, Langdon said, without breaking stride. That's Braccio di Bartolo a famous court dwarf. If you ask me, they should put him out back in the giant bathtub. Langdon turned sharply to his right, 
heading down a set of stairs that Sienna had been unable to see until now. A way out. The flash of hope was short-lived. As she turned the corner and headed down the stairs behind Langdon, she realized they were dashing into a dead-end a cul-de-sac whose walls were twice as high as the others. Furthermore, Sienna now sensed that their long journey was about to terminate at the mouth of a gaping cavern, a deep grotto carved out of the rear wall. This can't be where he's taking us. Over the cave's yawning entrance, dagger-like stalactites loomed portentously. In the cavity beyond, oozing geological features twisted and dripped down the walls as if the stone were melting, morphing into shapes that included, to Sienna's alarm, half-buried humanoids extruding from the walls as if being consumed by the stone. The entire vision reminded Sienna of something out of Botticelli's Mappa del Inferno. Langdon, for some reason, seemed unfazed, and continued running directly toward the cave's entrance. He'd made a comment earlier about Vatican City, but Sienna was fairly certain there were no freakish caverns inside the walls of the Holy See. As they drew nearer, Sienna's eyes moved to the sprawling entablature above the entrance a ghostly compilation of stalactites and nebulous stone extrusions that seemed to be engulfing two reclining women, who were flanked by a shield embedded with six balls, or pal, the famed crest of the Medici. Langdon suddenly cut to his left, away from the entrance and toward a feature Sienna had previously missed a small grey door to the left of the cavern. Weathered and wooden, it appeared of little significance like a storage closet or room for landscaping supplies. Langdon rushed to the door, clearly hoping he could open it, but the door had no handle only a brass keyhole and, apparently, could be opened only from within. Damn it! Langdon's eyes now shone with concern, his earlier hopefulness all but erased. I had hoped without warning, the piercing whine of the drone echoed loudly off the high walls around them. Sienna turned to see the drone rising up over the palace and clawing its way in their direction. Langdon clearly saw it, too, because he grabbed Sienna's hand and dashed toward the cavern. They ducked out of sight in the nick of time beneath the grotto's stalactite overhang. A fitting end, she thought. Dashing through the gates of hell. Chapter 28 A quarter mile to the east, Vayantha parked her motorcycle. She had crossed into the old city via the Ponte alle Grazie and then circled around to the Ponte Vecchio the famed pedestrian bridge connecting the Pitti Palace to the old city. After locking her helmet to the bike, she strode out onto the bridge and mixed with the early morning tourists. A cool March breeze blew steadily up the river, ruffling Vayantha's short spiked hair, reminding her that Langdon knew what she looked like. She paused at the stall of one of the bridge's many vendors and bought an Ammo Forenza baseball cap, pulling it low over her face. She smoothed her leather suit over the bulge of her handgun and took up a position near the center of the bridge, casually leaning against a pillar and facing the Pity Palace. From here she was able to survey all the pedestrians crossing the Arno into the heart of Florence. Langdon is on foot, she told herself. If he finds a way around the Porta Romana, this bridge is his most logical route into the old city. To the west, in the direction of the Pity Palace, she could hear sirens and wondered if this was good or bad news. Are they still looking for him? Or have they caught him? As Vayantha strained her ears for some indication as to what was going on, a new sound suddenly became audible a high-pitched whine somewhere overhead. Her eyes turned instinctively skyward and she spotted it at once a small remote-controlled helicopter rising fast over the palace and swooping down over the treetops in the direction of the northeast corner of the Baboli Gardens. A surveillance drone, Vayantha thought with a surge of hope. If it's in the air, Bruder has yet to find Langdon. The drone was approaching fast. Apparently it was surveying the northeast corner of the gardens, the area closest to Ponte Vecchio and Vayantha's position, which gave her additional encouragement. If Langdon eluded Bruder, he would definitely be moving in this direction. As Vayantha watched, however, the drone suddenly dive-bombed out of sight behind the high stone wall. She could hear it hovering in place somewhere below the tree line, apparently having located something of interest. Chapter 29 Seek and Ye Shall Find, Langdon thought, huddled in the dim grotto with Sienna. We sought an exit, and found a dead end. The amorphous fountain in the center of the cave offered good cover, 
and yet as Langdon peered out from behind it, he sensed it was too late. The drone had just swooped down into the walled cul-de-sac, stopping abruptly outside the cavern, where it now hovered at a standstill, only ten feet off the ground, facing the grotto, buzzing intensely like some kind of infuriated insect, awaiting its prey. Langdon pulled back and whispered the grim news to Sienna. I think it knows we're here. The drone's high-pitched whine was nearly deafening inside the cavern, the noise reflecting sharply off the stone walls. Langdon found it hard to believe they were being held hostage by a miniature mechanical helicopter, and yet he knew that trying to run from it was fruitless. So what do we do now? Just wait? His original plan to access what lay behind the little grey door had been a reasonable one, except he hadn't realized the door was openable only from within. As Langdon's eyes adjusted to the grotto's dark interior, he surveyed their unusual surroundings, wondering if there was any other exit. He saw nothing promising. The interior of the cavern was adorned with sculpted animals and humans, all in various stages of consumption by the strange oozing walls. Dejected, Langdon raised his eyes to the ceiling of stalactites hanging ominously overhead. A good place to die. The Buontalenti Grotto so named for its architect, Bernardo Buontalenti was arguably the most curious-looking space in all of Florence. Intended as a kind of funhouse for young guests at the Pitti Palace, the three-chambered suite of caverns was decorated in a blend of naturalistic fantasy and gothic excess, composed of what appeared to be dripping concretions and flowing pumice that seemed either to be consuming or exuding the multitude of carved figures. In the days of the Medici, the grotto was accented by having water flow down the interior walls, which served both to cool the space during the hot Tuscan summers and to create the effect of an actual cavern. Langdon and Sienna were hidden in the first and largest chamber behind an indistinct central fountain. They were surrounded by colorful figures of shepherds, peasants, musicians, animals, and even copies of Michelangelo's four prisoners, all of which seemed to be struggling to break free of the fluid-looking rock that engulfed them. High above, the morning light filtered down through an oculus in the ceiling, which had once held a giant glass ball filled with water in which bright red carp swam in the sunlight. Langdon wondered how the original Renaissance visitors here would have reacted at the sight of a real-life helicopter a fantastical dream of Italy's own Leonardo da Vinci hovering outside the grotto. It was at that moment that the drone's shrill whine stopped. It hadn't faded away, rather, it had just, abruptly stopped. Puzzled, Langdon peered out from behind the fountain and saw that the drone had landed. It was now sitting idle on the gravel plaza, looking much less ominous, especially because the stinger-like video lens on the front was facing away from them, off to one side, in the direction of the little grey door. Langdon's sense of relief was fleeting. A hundred yards behind the drone, near the statue of the dwarf and turtle, Three heavily armed soldiers were now striding purposefully down the stairs, heading directly toward the grotto. The soldiers were dressed in familiar black uniforms with green medallions on their shoulders. Their muscular lead man had vacant eyes that reminded Langdon of the plague mask in his visions. I am death. Langdon did not see their van or the mysterious silver-haired woman anywhere. I am life. As the soldiers approached, one of them stopped at the bottom of the stairs and turned around, facing backward, apparently to prevent anyone else from descending into this area. The other two kept coming toward the grotto. Langdon and Sienna sprang into motion again although probably only delaying the inevitable shuffling backward on all fours into the second cavern, which was smaller, deeper, and darker. It, too, was dominated by a central piece of art in this case a statue of two intertwined lovers behind which Langdon and Sienna now hid anew. Veiled in shadow, Langdon carefully peered out around the base of the statue and watched their approaching assailants. As the two soldiers reached the drone, one stopped and crouched down to tend to it, picking it up and examining the camera. Did the device spot us? Langdon wondered, fearing he knew the answer. The third and last soldier, the muscular one with the cold eyes, was still moving with icy focus in Langdon's direction. The man approached until he was nearly at the mouth of the cave. He's coming in. Langdon prepared to pull back behind the statue and tell Sienna it was over, but in that instant, 
he witnessed something unexpected. The soldier, rather than entering the grotto, suddenly peeled off to the left and disappeared. Where is he going? He doesn't know we're here? A few moments later, Langdon heard pounding a fist knocking on wood. The little grey door, Langdon thought. He must know where it leads. Pity Palace security guard Ernesto Russo had always wanted to play European football, but at 29 years old and overweight, he had finally begun to accept that his childhood dream would never come true. For the past three years, Ernesto had worked as a guard here at the Pity Palace, always in the same closet size office, always with the same dull job. Ernesto was no stranger to curious tourists knocking on the little grey door outside the office in which he was stationed, and he usually just ignored them until they stopped. Today, however, the banging was intense and continuous. Annoyed, he refocused on his television set, which was loudly playing a football rerun Fiorentina vs Juventus. The knocking only grew louder. Finally, cursing the tourists, he marched out of his office down the narrow corridor toward the sound. Halfway there, he stopped at the massive steel grate that remained sealed across this hallway except at a few specific hours. He entered the combination on the padlock and unlocked the grate, pulling it to one side. After stepping through, he followed protocol and relocked the grate behind him. Then he walked to the grey wooden door. Ikayaso, he yelled through the door, hoping the person outside would hear. non sipo enterer. The banging continued. Ernesto gritted his teeth. New Yorkers, he wagered. They want what they want. The only reason their Red Bulls soccer team was having any success on the world stage was that they'd pilfered one of Europe's best coaches. The banging continued, and Ernesto reluctantly unlocked the door and pushed it open a few inches. Ikayaso. The banging finally stopped, and Ernesto found himself face to face with a soldier whose eyes were so cold they literally made Ernesto step back. The man held up an official carnet bearing an acronym Ernesto did not recognize. Cosa succeed? Ernesto demanded, alarmed. What's going on? Behind the soldier, a second was crouched down, tinkering with what appeared to be a toy helicopter. Still farther away, another soldier stood guard on the staircase. Ernesto heard police sirens nearby. Do you speak English? The soldier's accent was definitely not New York. Europe somewhere? Ernesto nodded. A bit, yes. Has anyone come through this door this morning? No, signore. Nessuno. Excellent. Keep it locked. Nobody in or out. Is that clear? Ernesto shrugged. That was his job anyway. S.I., I understand. Non deventurer, N.E. Uskire Nessuno. Tell me, please, is this door the sole entrance? Ernesto considered the question. Technically, nowadays this door was considered an exit, which was why it had no handle on the outside, but he understood what the man was asking. Yes, el acceso is this door only. No other way. The original entrance inside the palace had been sealed for many years. And are there any other hidden exits from the Baboli Gardens? Other than the traditional gates? No, signore. Big walls everywhere. This only secret exit. The soldier nodded. Thank you for your help. He motioned for Ernesto to close and lock the door. Puzzled, Ernesto obeyed. Then he headed back up the corridor, unlocked the steel grate, moved through it, relocked it behind him, and returned to his football match. Chapter 30 Langdon and Sienna had seized an opportunity. While the muscular soldier was pounding on the door, they had crawled deeper into the grotto and were now huddled in the final chamber. The tiny space was adorned with rough-hewn mosaics and satyrs. At its center stood a life-size sculpture of a bathing Venus, who, fittingly, seemed to be glancing nervously over her shoulder. Langdon and Sienna had ensconced themselves on the far side of the statue's narrow plinth, where they now waited staring back at the single globular stalagmite that climbed the deepest wall of the grotto. All exits confirmed secure, shouted a soldier somewhere outside. 
he was speaking English with a faint accent that Langdon couldn't place. Send the drone back up. I'll check this cave here. Langdon could feel Sienna's body tighten beside him. Seconds later, heavy boots were padding into the grotto. The footsteps advanced quickly through the first chamber, growing louder still as they entered the second chamber, coming directly toward them. Langdon and Sienna huddled closer. Hey, a different voice shouted in the distance. We've got them. The footsteps stopped short. Langdon could now hear someone running loudly down the gravel walkway toward the grotto. Positive ID, the breathless voice declared. We just spoke to a couple of tourists. A few minutes ago, the man and the woman asked them directions to the palace's costume gallery, which is over at the west end of the palazzo. Langdon glanced at Sienna, who seemed to be smiling ever so faintly. The soldier regained his breath, continuing. The western exits were the first to be sealed, and confidence is high that we've got them trapped inside the gardens. Execute your mission, the nearer soldier replied. And call me the instant you've succeeded. There was a flurry of departing footsteps on gravel, the sound of the drone lifting off again, and then, thankfully, total silence. Langdon was about to twist sideways in order to peer around the plinth, when Sienna grabbed his arm, stopping him. She held a finger to her lips and nodded at a faint humanoid shadow on the rear wall. The lead soldier was still standing silently in the mouth of the grotto. What is he waiting for? It's Bruder, he said suddenly. We've got them cornered. I should have confirmation for you shortly. The man had placed a phone call, and his voice sounded unnervingly close, as if he were standing right beside them. The cavern was acting like a parabolic microphone collecting all the sound and focusing it at the rear. There's more, Bruder said. I just received an update from forensics. The woman's apartment appears to be a sublet. Under furnished. Clearly short term. We located the biotube, but the projector was not present. I repeat, the projector was not present. We assume it's still in Langdon's possession. Langdon felt a chill to hear the soldier speak his own name. The footsteps grew louder, and Langdon realized that the man was moving into the grotto. His gait lacked the intensity of a few moments before and sounded now as if he were simply wandering, exploring the grotto as he talked on the phone. Correct, the man said. Forensics also confirmed a single outbound call shortly before we stormed the apartment. The U.S. consulate, Langdon thought remembering his phone conversation and the quick arrival of the spike-haired assassin. The woman seemed to have disappeared, replaced by an entire team of trained soldiers. We can't outrun them forever. The sound of the soldiers' boots on the stone floor was now only about twenty feet away and closing. The man had entered the second chamber, and if he continued to the end, he would certainly spot the two of them crouched behind Venus's narrow base. Sienna Brooks the man declared suddenly, the words crystal clear. Sienna startled beside Langdon, her eyes reeling upward, clearly expecting to see the soldier staring down at her. But nobody was there. They're going through her laptop now, the voice continued, about ten feet away. I don't have a report yet, but it is definitely the same machine we traced when Langdon accessed his Harvard email account. On hearing this news, Sienna turned to Langdon in disbelief, gaping at him with an expression of shock, and then betrayal. Langdon was equally stunned. That's how they tracked us. It hadn't even occurred to him at the time. I just needed information. Before Langdon could convey an apology, Sienna had turned away, her expression going blank. That's correct, the soldier said, arriving at the entrance to the third chamber a mere six feet from Langdon and Sienna. Two more steps and he would see them for certain. Exactly, he declared, taking one step closer. Suddenly the soldier paused. Hold on a second. Langdon froze, bracing to be discovered. Hold on, I'm losing you, the soldier said, and then retreated a few steps into the second chamber. Bad connection. Go ahead, he listened for a moment then replied. Yes, I agree, 
but at least we know who we're dealing with. With that, his footsteps faded out of the grotto, moved across a gravel surface, and then disappeared completely. Langdon's shoulders softened, and he turned to Sienna, whose eyes burned with a mixture of fear and anger. You used my laptop, she demanded. To check your email. I'm sorry. I thought you'd understand. I needed to find out that's how they found us. And now they know my name. I apologize, Sienna. I didn't realize, Langdon was racked by guilt. Sienna turned away, staring blankly at the bulbous stalagmite on the rear wall. Neither one of them said anything for nearly a minute. Langdon wondered if Sienna remembered the personal items that had been stacked on her desk the playbill from A Midsummer Night's Dream and press clippings about her life as a young prodigy. Does she suspect I saw them? If so, she wasn't asking, and Langdon was in enough trouble with her already that he was not about to mention it. They know who I am, Sienna repeated, her voice so faint that Langdon could barely hear her. Over the next ten seconds, Sienna took several slow breaths as if trying to absorb this new reality. As she did so, Langdon sensed that her resolve was slowly hardening. Without warning, Sienna scrambled to her feet. We should go, she said. It won't take long for them to figure out we're not in the costume gallery. Langdon stood up with her. Yes, but go, where? Vatican City. I beg your pardon. I finally figured out what you meant before what Vatican City has in common with the Baboli Gardens. She motioned in the direction of the little grey door. That's the entrance, right? Langdon managed a nod. Actually, that's the exit, but I figured it was worth a shot. Unfortunately, we can't get through. Langdon had heard enough of the guards' exchange with the soldier to know this doorway was not an option. But if we could get through, Sienna said, a hint of mischief returning to her voice, do you know what that would mean? A faint smile now crossed her lips. It would mean that twice today you and I have been helped by the same Renaissance artist. Langdon had to chuckle, having had the same thought a few minutes ago. Vasari. Vasari. Sienna grinned more broadly now, and Langdon sensed she had forgiven him, at least for the moment. I think it's a sign from above, she declared sounding half serious. We should go through that door. Okay, and we'll just march right past the guard. Sienna cracked her knuckles and headed out of the grotto. No, I'll have a word with him. She glanced back at Langdon, the fire returning to her eyes. Trust me, Professor, I can be quite persuasive when I have to be. The pounding on the little grey door had returned. Firm and relentless. Security guard Ernesto Russo grumbled in frustration. The strange, cold-eyed soldier was apparently back, but his timing could not have been worse. The televised football match was in overtime with Fiorentina a man short and hanging by a thread. The pounding continued. Ernesto was no fool. He knew there was some kind of trouble out there this morning all the sirens and soldiers but he had never been one to involve himself in matters that didn't affect him directly. Pazo e Caluice Bada ai Fatti Altrui. Then again, the soldier was clearly someone of importance, and ignoring him was probably unwise. Jobs in Italy were hard to find these days, even boring ones. Stealing a last glance at the game, Ernesto headed off toward the pounding on the door. He still couldn't believe he was paid to sit in his tiny office all day and watch television. Perhaps twice a day. A VIP tour would arrive outside the space, having walked all the way from the Uffizi Gallery. Ernesto would greet them, unlock the metal grate, and permit the group to pass through to the little grey door, where their tour would end in the Baboli Gardens. Now, as the pounding grew more intense, Ernesto opened the steel grate, moved through it, and then closed and locked it behind him. S.I., he shouted above the sounds of pounding as he hurried to the grey door. No reply. The pounding continued. Insama. He finally unlocked the door and pulled it open, expecting to see the same lifeless gaze from a moment ago. But the face at the door was far more attractive. Chow, a pretty blonde woman said, 
smiling sweetly at him. She held out a folded piece of paper, which he instinctively reached out to accept. In the instant he grasped the paper and realized it was nothing but a piece of trash off the ground, the woman seized his wrist with her slender hands and plunged a thumb into the bony carpal area just beneath the palm of his hand. Ernesto felt as if a knife had just severed his wrist. The slicing stab was followed by an electric numbness. The woman stepped toward him, and the pressure increased exponentially, starting the pain cycle all over again. He staggered backward, trying to pull his arm free, but his legs went numb and buckled beneath him, and he slumped to his knees. The rest happened in an instant. A tall man in a dark suit appeared in the open doorway, slipped inside, and quickly closed the grey door behind him. Ernesto reached for his radio, but a soft hand behind his neck squeezed once, and his muscles seized up, leaving him gasping for breath. The woman took the radio as the tall man approached, looking as alarmed by her actions as Ernesto was. Dim Mac, the blonde said casually to the tall man. Chinese pressure points. There's a reason they've been around for three millennia. The man watched in wonder. Non vogliamo farti del male, the woman whispered to Ernesto, easing the pressure on his neck. We don't want to hurt you. The instant the pressure decreased, Ernesto tried to twist free, but the pressure promptly returned, and his muscles seized again. He gasped in pain, barely able to breathe. Dabimo passer she said. We need to get through. She motioned to the steel grate, which Ernesto had thankfully locked behind him. Davi la cave. Non si el ho, he managed. I don't have the key. The tall man advanced past them to the grating and examined the mechanism. It's a combination lock, he called back to the woman, his accent American. The woman knelt down next to Ernesto, her brown eyes like ice. Quali la combinazion, she demanded. Non posso, he replied. I'm not permitted something happened at the top of his spine, and Ernesto felt his entire body go limp. An instant later, he blacked out. When he came to, Ernesto sensed he had been drifting in and out of consciousness for several minutes. He recalled some discussion, more stabs of pain, being dragged, perhaps. It was all a blur. As the cobwebs cleared, he saw a strange sight his shoes lying on the floor nearby with their laces removed. It was then that he realized he could barely move. He was lying on his side with his hands and feet bound behind him, apparently with his shoelaces. He tried to yell, but no sound came. One of his own socks was stuffed in his mouth. The true moment of fear, however, came an instant later when he looked up and saw his television set playing the football match. I'm in my office. Inside the grate. In the distance, Ernesto could hear the sound of running footsteps departing along the corridor, and then, slowly, they faded to silence. Non e possible. Somehow, the blonde woman had persuaded Ernesto to do the one thing he was hired never to do reveal the combination for the lock on the entrance to the famed Vasari corridor. Chapter 31 Dr. Elizabeth Sinsky felt the waves of nausea and dizziness coming faster now. She was slumped in the back seat of the van parked in front of the Pity Palace. The soldier seated beside her was watching her with growing concern. Moments earlier, the soldier's radio had blared something about a costume gallery awakening Elizabeth from the darkness of her mind, where she had been dreaming of the green eyed monster. She had been back in the darkened room at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, listening to the maniacal ravings of the mysterious stranger who had summoned her there. The shadowy man paced at the front of the room a lanky silhouette against the grisly projected image of the naked and dying throngs inspired by Dante's Inferno. Someone needs to fight this war, the figure concluded, or this is our future. Mathematics guarantees it. Mankind is hovering now in a purgatory of procrastination and indecision and personal greed, but the rings of hell await, just beneath our feet, waiting to consume us all. Elizabeth was still reeling from the monstrous ideas this man had just laid out before her. She could stand it no longer and jumped to her feet. What you're suggesting is our only remaining option, the man interjected. Actually, she replied, 
I was going to say criminal. The man shrugged. The path to paradise passes directly through hell. Dante taught us that. You're mad. Mad, the man repeated, sounding hurt. Me? I think not. Madness is the who staring into the abyss and denying it is there. Madness is an ostrich who sticks her head in the sand while a pack of hyenas closes in around her. Before Elizabeth could defend her organization, the man had changed the image on the screen. And speaking of hyenas, he said, pointing to the new image. Here is the pack of hyenas currently circling humankind, and they are closing in fast. Elizabeth was surprised to see the familiar image before her. It was a graph published by the WHO the previous year delineating key environmental issues deemed by the WHO to have the greatest impact on global health. The list included, among others, demand for clean water, global surface temperatures, ozone depletion, consumption of ocean resources, species extinction, CO2 concentration, deforestation, and global sea levels. All of these negative indicators had been on the rise over the last century. Now, however, they were all accelerating at terrifying rates. Elizabeth had the same reaction that she always had when she saw this graph a sense of helplessness. She was a scientist and believed in the usefulness of statistics, and this graph painted a chilling picture not of the distant future, but of the very near future. At many times in her life, Elizabeth Sinsky had been haunted by her inability to conceive a child. Yet, when she saw this graph, she almost felt relieved she had not brought a child into the world. This is the future I would be giving my child? Over the last fifty years, the tall man declared, our sins against Mother Nature have grown exponentially. He paused. I fear for the soul of humankind. When the WHO published this graph, the world's politicians, power brokers and environmentalists held emergency summits, all trying to assess which of these problems were most severe and which we could actually hope to solve. The outcome? Privately, they put their heads in their hands and wept. Publicly, they assured us all that they were working on solutions but that these are complex issues. These issues are complex. Bullshit, the man erupted. You know damned well this graph depicts the simplest of relationships a function based on a single variable. Every single line on this graph climbs in direct proportion to one value the value that everyone is afraid to discuss. Global population. Actually, I think it's a bit more a bit more complicated. Actually, it's not. There is nothing simpler. If you want more available clean water per capita, you need fewer people on Earth. If you want to decrease vehicle emissions, you need fewer drivers. If you want the oceans to replenish their fish, you need fewer people eating fish. He glared down at her, his tone becoming even more forceful. Open your eyes. We are on the brink of the end of humanity, and our world leaders are sitting in boardrooms commissioning studies on solar power, recycling, and hybrid automobiles? How is it that you a highly educated woman of science don't see? Ozone depletion, lack of water, and pollution are not the disease they are the symptoms. The disease is overpopulation. And unless we face world population head-on, we are doing nothing more than sticking a band-aid on a fast-growing cancerous tumor. You perceive the human race as a cancer. Elizabeth demanded. Cancer is nothing more than a healthy cell that starts replicating out of control. I realize you find my ideas distasteful, but I can assure you that you will find the alternative far less tasteful when it arrives. If we do not take bold action, then bold, she sputtered. Bold is not the word you are looking for. Try insane. Dr. Sinsky, the man said, his voice now eerily calm. I called you here specifically because I was hoping that you a sage voice at the World Health Organization might be willing to work with me and explore a possible solution. Elizabeth stared in disbelief. You think the World Health Organization is going to partner with you, exploring an idea like this? Actually, yes, he said. Your organization is made up of doctors, and when doctors have a patient with gangrene, they do not hesitate to cut off his leg to save his life. Sometimes the only course of action is the lesser of two evils. 
This is quite different. No. This is identical. The only difference is scale. Elizabeth had heard enough. She stood abruptly. I have a plane to catch. The tall man took a threatening step in her direction, blocking her exit. Fair warning. With or without your cooperation, I can very easily explore this idea on my own. Fair warning, she fired back. I consider this a terrorist threat and will treat it as such. She took out her phone. The man laughed. You're going to report me for talking in hypotheticals? Unfortunately, you'll have to wait to make your call. This room is electronically shielded. Your phone won't have a signal. I don't need a signal, you lunatic. Elizabeth raised her phone, and before the man realized what was happening, she clicked a snapshot of his face. The flash reflected in his green eyes, and for a moment she thought he looked familiar. Whoever you are, she said, you did the wrong thing by calling me here. By the time I reach the airport, I will know who you are, and you will be on the watch lists at the WHO, the CDC, and the ECDC as a potential bioterrorist. We will have people on you day and night. If you try to purchase materials, we will know about it. If you build a lab, we will know about it. There is nowhere you can hide. The man stood in tense silence for a long moment, as if he were going to lunge at her phone. Finally, he relaxed and stepped aside with an eerie grin. Then it appears our dance has begun. Chapter 32 I.L. Corrido I.O. Vazariano The Vasari Corridor was designed by Giorgio Vasari in 1564 under orders of the Medici ruler, Grand Duke Cosimo I to provide safe passage from his residence at the Pitti Palace to his administrative offices, across the Arno River in the Palazzo Vecchio. Similar to Vatican City's famed Passetto, the Vasari Corridor was the quintessential secret passageway. It stretched nearly a full kilometre from the eastern corner of the Baboli Gardens to the heart of the old palace itself, crossing the Ponte Vecchio and snaking through the Uffizi Gallery in between. Nowadays, the Vasari Corridor still served as a safe haven, although not for Medici aristocrats but for artwork, with its seemingly endless expanse of secure wall space, the corridor was home to countless rare paintings overflow from the world-famous Uffizi Gallery, through which the corridor passed. Langdon had travelled the passageway a few years before as part of a leisurely private tour. On that afternoon, he had paused to admire the corridor's mind-boggling array of paintings including the most extensive collection of self-portraits in the world. He had also stopped several times to peer out of the corridor's occasional viewing portals, which permitted travelers to gauge their progress along the elevated walkway. This morning, however, Langdon and Sienna were moving through the corridor at a run, eager to put as much distance as possible between themselves and their pursuers at the other end. Langdon wondered how long it would take for the bound guard to be discovered. As the tunnel stretched out before them, Langdon sensed it leading them closer with every step to what they were searching for. Circa Trova, the eyes of death, and an answer as to who is chasing me. The distant whine of the surveillance drone was far behind them now. The farther they progressed into the tunnel, the more Langdon was reminded of just how ambitious an architectural feat this passageway had been. Elevated above the city for nearly its entire length, the Vasari Corridor was like a broad serpent, snaking through the buildings, all the way from the Pitti Palace, across the Arno, into the heart of old Florence. The narrow, whitewashed passageway seemed to stretch for eternity, occasionally turning briefly left or right to avoid an obstacle, but always moving east, across the Arno. The sudden sound of voices echoed ahead of them in the corridor, and Sienna skidded to a stop. Langdon halted, too, and immediately placed a calm hand on her shoulder, motioning to a nearby viewing portal. Tourists down below. Langdon and Sienna moved to the portal and peered out, seeing that they were currently perched above the Ponte Vecchio the medieval stone bridge that serves as a pedestrian walkway into the old city. Below them, the day's first tourists were enjoying the market that has been held on the bridge since the 1400s. Today the vendors are mostly goldsmiths and jewelers, but that has not always been the case. Originally, the bridge had been home to Florence's vast, open-air meat market, 
but the butchers were banished in 1593 after the rancid odor of spoiled meat had wafted up into the Vasari corridor and assaulted the delicate nostrils of the Grand Duke. Down there on the bridge somewhere, Langdon recalled, was the precise spot where one of Florence's most infamous crimes had been committed. In 1216, a young nobleman named Bondel Monti had rejected his family's arranged marriage for the sake of his true love, and for that decision he was brutally killed on this very bridge. His death, long considered Florence's bloodiest murder, was so named because it had triggered a rift between two powerful political factions the Guelphs and Ghibellines who had then waged war ruthlessly for centuries against each other. Because the ensuing political feud had brought about Dante's exile from Florence, the poet had bitterly immortalized the event in his divine comedy, O Bondel Monti, through another's counsel, you fled your wedding pledge, and brought such evil. To this day, Three separate plagues each quoting a different line from Canto 16 of Dante's Paradiso could be found near the murder site. One of them was situated at the mouth of the Ponte Vecchio and ominously declared, but Florence, in her final piece, was fated to offer up unto that mutilated stone guardian upon her bridge. A victim. Langdon raised his eyes now from the bridge to the murky waters it spanned. Off to the east, the lone spire of the Palazzo Vecchio beckoned. Even though Langdon and Siena were only halfway across the Arno River, he had no doubt they had long since passed the point of no return. Thirty feet below, on the cobblestones of the Ponte Vecchio, Vayanthi anxiously scanned the oncoming crowd, never imagining that her only redemption had, just moments before, passed directly overhead. Chapter 33 Deep in the bowels of the anchored vessel the Mendacium Facilitator Nalton sat alone in his cubicle and tried in vain to focus on his work. Filled with trepidation, he had gone back to viewing the video and, for the past hour, had been analyzing the nine-minute soliloquy that hovered somewhere between genius and madness. Nalton fast-forwarded from the beginning, looking for any clue he might have missed. He skipped past the submerged plaque, past the suspended bag of murky yellow-brown liquid, and found the moment that the beak-nosed shadow appeared a deformed silhouette cast upon a dripping cavern wall, illuminated by a soft red glow. Nalton listened to the muffled voice, attempting to decipher the elaborate language. About halfway through the speech, the shadow on the wall suddenly loomed larger and the sound of the voice intensified. Dante's hell is not fiction, it is prophecy. Wretched misery. Torturous woe. This is the landscape of tomorrow. Mankind, if unchecked, functions like a plague, a cancer, our numbers intensifying with each successive generation until the earthly comforts that once nourished our virtue and brotherhood have dwindled to nothing, unveiling the monsters within us, fighting to the death to feed our young. This is Dante's nine-ringed hell. This is what awaits. As the future hurls herself toward us, Fueled by the unyielding mathematics of Malthus, we teeter above the first ring of hell, preparing to plummet faster than we ever fathomed. Nalton paused the video. The mathematics of Malthus? A quick internet search led him to information about a prominent 19th-century English mathematician and demographist named Thomas Robert Malthus, who had famously predicted an eventual global collapse due to overpopulation. Malthus's biography, much to Nalton's alarm, included a harrowing excerpt from his book An Essay on the Principle of Population, The Power of Population is so superior to the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man, that premature death must in some shape or other visit the human race. The vices of mankind are active and able ministers of depopulation. They are the precursors in the great army of destruction, and often finish the dreadful work themselves. But should they fail in this war of extermination, sickly seasons, epidemics, pestilence, and plague, advance in terrific array, and sweep off their thousands and ten thousands. Should success be still incomplete, gigantic inevitable famine stalks in the rear, and with one mighty blow levels the population with the food of the world. With his heart pounding, Nalton glanced back at the paused image of the beak-nosed shadow. Mankind, if unchecked, functions like a cancer. Unchecked. Nalton did not like the sound of that. With a hesitant finger, he started the video again. The muffled voice continued. 
to do nothing is to welcome Dante's hell, cramped and starving, weltering in sin. And so boldly I have taken action. Some will recoil in horror, but all salvation comes at a price. One day the world will grasp the beauty of my sacrifice. For I am your salvation. I am the shade. I am the gateway to the post-human age. Chapter 34 The Palazzo Vecchio resembles a giant chess piece. With its robust quadrangular facade and rusticated square-cut battlements, the massive rook-like building is aptly situated, guarding the southeast corner of the Piazza della Signoria. The building's unusual single spire, rising off-center from within the square fortress, cuts a distinctive profile against the skyline and has become an inimitable symbol of Florence. Built as a potent seat of Italian government, the building imposes on its arriving visitors an intimidating array of masculine statuary. Amanita's muscular Neptune stands naked atop four seahorses, a symbol of Florence's dominance in the sea. A replica of Michelangelo's David arguably the world's most admired male nude stands in all his glory at the Palazzo entrance. David is joined by Hercules and Caucus two more colossal naked men who, in concert with a host of Neptune's satyrs, bring to more than a dozen the total number of exposed penises that greet visitors to the Palazzo. Normally, Langdon's visits to the Palazzo Vecchio had begun here on the Piazza della Signoria, which, despite its overabundance of phalluses, had always been one of his favorite plazas in all of Europe. No trip to the Piazza was complete without sipping an espresso at Café Rivoire followed by a visit to the Medici Lions in the Loggia dei Lanzi the Piazza's open-air sculpture gallery. Today, however, Langdon and his companion plan to enter the Palazzo Vecchio via the Vasari Corridor, much as Medici dukes might have done in their day by passing the famous Uffizi Gallery and following the corridor as it snaked above bridges, over roads and through buildings, leading directly into the heart of the old palace. Thus far, they had heard no trace of footsteps behind them but Langdon was still anxious to exit the corridor. And now we've arrived, Langdon realized, eyeing the heavy wooden door before them. The entrance to the old palace. The door, despite its substantial locking mechanism, was equipped with a horizontal push bar, which provided emergency exit capability while preventing anyone on the other side from entering the Vasari corridor without a key card. Langdon placed his ear to the door and listened. Hearing nothing on the other side, he put his hands against the bar and pushed gently. The lock clicked. As the wooden portal creaked open a few inches, Langdon peered into the world beyond. A small alcove. Empty. Silent. With a small sigh of relief, Langdon stepped through and motioned for Sienna to follow. We're in. Standing in a quiet alcove somewhere inside the Palazzo Vecchio, Langdon waited a moment and tried to get his bearings. In front of them, a long hallway ran perpendicular to the alcove. To their left, in the distance, voices echoed up the corridor, calm and jovial. The Palazzo Vecchio, much like the United States Capitol building, was both a tourist attraction and a governmental office. At this hour, the voices they heard were most likely those of civic employees bustling in and out of offices, getting ready for the day. Langdon and Sienna inched toward the hallway and peered around the corner. Sure enough, at the end of the hallway was an atrium in which a dozen or so government employees stood around sipping morning espressi and chatting with colleagues before work. The Vasari mural, Sienna whispered, you said it's in the hall of the 500. Langdon nodded and pointed across the crowded atrium toward a portico that opened into a stone hallway. Unfortunately, it's through that atrium. You're sure? Langdon nodded. We'll never make it through without being seen. They're government workers. They'll have no interest in us. Just walk like you belong here. Sienna reached up and gently smoothed out Langdon's Brioni suit jacket and adjusted his collar. You look very presentable, Robert. She gave him a demure smile, adjusted her own sweater, and set out. Langdon hurried after her both of them striding purposefully toward the atrium. As they entered, Sienna began talking to him in rapid Italian something about farm subsidies gesticulating passionately as she spoke. They kept to the outer wall, maintaining their distance from the others. To Langdon's amazement, 
not one single employee gave them a second glance. When they were beyond the atrium, they quickly pressed onward toward the hallway. Langdon recalled the Shakespeare playbill. Mischievous Puck. You're quite an actress, he whispered. I've had to be, she said reflexively, her voice strangely distant. Once again, Langdon sensed there was more heartache in this young woman's past than he knew, and he felt a deepening sense of remorse for having entangled her in his dangerous predicament. He reminded himself that there was nothing to be done now, except to see it through. Keep swimming through the tunnel, and pray for light. As they neared their portico, Langdon was relieved to see that his memory had served him well. A small plaque with an arrow pointed around the corner into the hallway and announced, I El Salon Dei Cinquecento. The Hall of the Five Hundred, Langdon thought, wondering what answers awaited within. The truth can be glimpsed only through the eyes of death. What could this mean? The room may still be locked, Langdon warned as they neared the corner. Although the Hall of the Five Hundred was a popular tourist destination, the palazzo did not appear to be open yet to tourists this morning. Do you hear that? Sienna asked, stopping short. Langdon heard it. A loud humming noise was coming from just around the corner. Please tell me it's not an indoor drone. Cautiously, Langdon peered around the corner of the portico. Thirty yards away stood the surprisingly simple wooden door that opened into the Hall of the Five Hundred. Regrettably, directly between them stood a portly custodian pushing an electric floor buffing machine in weary circles. Guardian of the Gate Langdon's attention shifted to three symbols on a plastic sign outside the door. Decipherable to even the least experienced of symbologists, these universal icons were, a video camera with an X through it, a drinking cup with an X through it, and a pair of boxy stick figures, one female, one male. Langdon took charge, striding swiftly toward the custodian, breaking into a jog as he drew nearer. Sienna rushed behind him to keep up. The custodian glanced up, looking startled. Signori. He held out his arms for Langdon and Sienna to stop. Langdon gave the man a pained smile more of a win ce and motioned apologetically toward the symbols near the door. Toilet, he declared, his voice pinched. It was not a question. The custodian hesitated a moment, looking ready to deny their request, and then finally, watching Langdon shift uncomfortably before him, he gave a sympathetic nod and waved them through. When they reached the door, Langdon gave Sienna a quick wink. Compassion is a universal language. Chapter 35 At one time, the Hall of the Five Hundred was the largest room in the world. It had been built in 1494 to provide a meeting hall for the entire Concilio Majori the Republic's Grand Council of precisely 500 members from which the hall drew its name. Some years later, at the behest of Cosimo I, the room was renovated and enlarged substantially. Cosimo I, the most powerful man in Italy, chose as the project's overseer and architect the great Giorgio Vasari. In an exceptional feat of engineering, Vasari had raised the original roof substantially and permitted natural light to flow in through high transoms on all four sides of the room, resulting in an elegant showroom for some of Florence's finest architecture, sculpture, and painting. For Langdon, it was always the floor of this room that first drew his eye, immediately announcing that this was no ordinary space. The crimson stone parquet was overlaid with a black grid, giving the 12,000 square foot expanse an air of solidity, depth, and balance. Langdon raised his eyes slowly to the far side of the room, where six dynamic sculptures the labors of Hercules lined the wall like a phalanx of soldiers. Langdon intentionally ignored the oft-maligned Hercules and Diomedes, whose naked bodies were locked in an awkward-looking wrestling match, which included a creative penile grip that always made Langdon cringe. Far easier on the eyes was Michelangelo's breathtaking genius of victory, which stood to the right, dominating the central niche in the south wall. At nearly nine feet tall, this sculpture had been intended for the tomb of the ultra-conservative Pope Julius II I.L. Papa Terry Bile a commission Langdon had always found ironic, considering the Vatican's stance on homosexuality. The statue depicted Tommaso Dei Cavalieri, 
the young man with whom Michelangelo had been in love for much of his life and to whom he composed over 300 sonnets. I can't believe I've never been here, Sienna whispered beside him, her voice suddenly quiet and reverent. This is, beautiful. Langdon nodded, recalling his first visit to this space on the occasion of a spectacular concert of classical music featuring the world-renowned pianist Muriel Kemal. Although this grand hall was originally intended for private political meetings and audiences with the Grand Duke, nowadays it more commonly featured popular musicians, lecturers and gala dinners from art historian Maurizio Siracini to the Gucci Museum's star-studded, black and white gala opening. Langdon sometimes wondered how Cosimo I would feel about sharing his austere private hall with CEOs and fashion models. Langdon lifted his gaze now to the enormous murals adorning the walls. Their bizarre history included a failed experimental painting technique by Leonardo da Vinci, which resulted in a melting masterpiece. There had also been an artistic showdown spearheaded by Piero Soderini and Machiavelli, which pitted against each other two titans of the Renaissance Michelangelo and Leonardo commanding them to create murals on opposite walls of the same room. Today, however, Langdon was more interested in one of the room's other historical oddities. Circa Trova Which one is the Vasari? Sienna asked, scanning the murals. Nearly all of them, Langdon replied knowing that as part of the room's renovation, Vasari and his assistants had repainted almost everything in it, from the original wall murals to the 39 coffered panels adorning its famed hanging ceiling. But that mural there, Langdon said, pointing to the mural on their far right, is the one we came to see Vasari's Battle of Marciano. The military confrontation was absolutely massive 55 feet long and more than three stories tall. It was rendered in ruddy shades of brown and green a violent panorama of soldiers, horses, spears, and banners all colliding on a pastoral hillside. Vasari, Vasari, Sienna whispered. And hidden in there somewhere is his secret message. Langdon nodded as he squinted toward the top of the huge mural, trying to locate the particular green battle flag on which Vasari had painted his mysterious message Circa Trova. It's almost impossible to see from down here without binoculars, Langdon said, pointing, but in the top middle section, if you look just below the two farmhouses on the hillside, there's a tiny, tilted green flag and I see it. Sienna said, pointing to the upper right quadrant, precisely in the right spot. Langdon wished he had younger eyes. The two walked closer to the towering mural, and Langdon gazed up at its splendor. Finally. They were here. The only problem now was that Langdon was not sure why they were here. He stood in silence for several long moments, staring up at the details of Vasari's masterpiece. If I fail, then all is death. A door creaked open behind them, and the custodian with the floor buffer peered in, looking uncertain. Sienna gave a friendly wave. The custodian eyed them a moment and then closed the door. We don't have much time. Robert, Sienna urged. You need to think. Does the painting ring any bells for you? Any memories at all? Langdon scrutinized the chaotic battle scene above them. The truth can be glimpsed only through the eyes of death. Langdon had thought perhaps the mural included a corpse whose dead eyes were gazing blankly off toward some other clue in the painting, or perhaps even elsewhere in the room. Unfortunately, Langdon now saw that there were dozens of dead bodies in the mural, none of them particularly noteworthy and none with dead eyes directed anywhere in particular. The truth can be glimpsed only through the eyes of death. He tried to envision connecting lines from one corpse to another, wondering if a shape might emerge, but he saw nothing. Langdon's head was throbbing again as he frantically plumbed the depths of his memory. Somewhere down there, the voice of the silver-haired woman kept whispering, Seek and ye shall find. Find what? Langdon wanted to shout. He forced himself to close his eyes and exhale slowly. He rolled his shoulders a few times and tried to free himself from all conscious thought, hoping to tap into his gut instinct. Very sorry. Vasari. Circa Trova. The truth can be glimpsed only through the eyes of death. His gut told him, without a doubt that he was standing in the right location. And while he was not yet sure why, 
he had the distinct sense that he was moments away from finding what he had come here seeking. Agent Bruder stared blankly at the red velvet pantaloons and tunic in the display case before him and cursed under his breath. His SRS team had searched the entire costume gallery and Langdon and Sienna Brooks were nowhere to be found. Surveillance and response support, he thought angrily. Since when does a college professor elude SRS? Where the hell did they go? Every exit was sealed, one of his men insisted. The only possibility is that they are still in the gardens. While this seemed logical, Bruder had the sinking sensation that Langdon and Sienna Brooks had found some other way out. Get the drone back in the air, Bruder snapped. And tell the local authorities to widen the search area outside the walls. God damn it. As his men dashed off, Bruder grabbed his phone and called the person in charge. It's Bruder, he said. I'm afraid we've got a serious problem. A number of them actually. Chapter 36 The truth can be glimpsed only through the eyes of death. Sienna repeated the words to herself as she continued to search every inch of Vasari's brutal battle scene, hoping something might stand out. She saw eyes of death everywhere. Which ones are we looking for? She wondered if maybe the eyes of death were a reference to all the rotting corpses strewn across Europe by the Black Death. At least that would explain the plague mask. Out of the blue, a childhood nursery rhyme jumped into Sienna's mind, ring around the rosy. A pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes. We all fall down. She used to recite the poem as a schoolgirl in England until she heard that it derived from the Great Plague of London in 1665. Allegedly, a ring around the rosy was a reference to a rose-colored pustule on the skin that developed a ring around it and indicated that one was infected. Sufferers would carry a pocket full of posies in an effort to mask the smell of their own decaying bodies as well as the stench of the city itself, where hundreds of plague victims drop dead daily their bodies then cremated. Ashes, ashes. We all fall down. For the love of God, Langdon blurted suddenly, wheeling around toward the opposite wall. Sienna looked over. What's wrong? That's the name of a piece of art that was once on display here. For the love of God. Bewildered, Sienna watched Langdon hurry across the room to a small glass door, which he tried to open. It was locked. He put his face to the glass, cupping his hands around his eyes and peering inside. Whatever Langdon was looking for, Sienna hoped he spotted it in a hurry, the custodian had just reappeared, now with a look of deepening suspicion at the sight of Langdon sauntering off to snoop at a locked door. Sienna waved cheerfully to the custodian, but the man glared at her for a long cold beat and then disappeared. Low studio low. Positioned behind a glass door, Directly opposite the hidden words Circa Trova in the Hall of the 500, was nestled a tiny windowless chamber. Designed by Vasari as a secret study for Francesco I, the rectangular studiolo rose to a rounded, barrel-vaulted ceiling, which gave those inside the feeling of being inside a giant treasure chest. Fittingly, the interior glistened with objects of beauty. More than 30 rare paintings adorned the walls and ceiling, mounted so close to one another that they left virtually no empty wall space. The Fall of Icarus An Allegory of Human Life Nature Presenting Prometheus with Spectacular Gems As Langdon peered through the glass into the dazzling space beyond, he whispered to himself, The Eyes of Death. Langdon had first been inside Lo Studiolo during a private secret passages tour of the Palazzo a few years back and had been stunned to learn about the plethora of hidden doors, stairs and passageways that honeycombed the Palazzo, including several hidden behind paintings inside Lo Studiolo. The secret passages, however, were not what had just sparked Langdon's interest. Instead he had flashed on a bold piece of modern art that he had once seen on display here for the love of God a controversial piece by Damien Hirst, which had caused an uproar when it was shown inside Vasari's famed studio low. A life-size cast of a human skull in solid platinum, its surface had been entirely covered with more than 8,000 glittering, pave-set diamonds. The effect was striking. The skull's empty eye sockets glistened with light and life creating a troubling juxtaposition of opposing symbols life and death, beauty and horror. 
Although Hearst's diamond skull had long since been removed from Lo Studio Lo, Langdon's recollection of it had sparked an idea. The eyes of death, he thought. A skull certainly qualifies, doesn't it? Skulls were a recurring theme in Dante's Inferno, most famously Count Ugolino's brutal punishment in the lowest circle of hell that of being sentenced to gnaw eternally on the skull of a wicked archbishop. Are we looking for a skull? The enigmatic studio Lo, Langdon knew, had been built in the tradition of a cabinet of curiosities. Nearly all of its paintings were secretly hinged, swinging open to reveal hidden cupboards in which the Duke had kept strange possessions of interest to him rare mineral samples, beautiful feathers, a perfect fossil of a nautilus shell, and even, allegedly, a monk's tibia decorated with hand-pounded silver. Unfortunately, Langdon suspected all the cupboard items had been removed long ago, and he had never heard of any skull on display here other than Hearst's piece. His thoughts were cut short by the loud slam of a door on the far side of the hall. The brisk click of footsteps approached quickly across the salon. Signore, an angry voice shouted. I else alone nani apertu. Langdon turned to see a female employee marching toward him. She was petite, with short brown hair. She was also extremely pregnant. The woman moved snappily toward them, tapping her watch and shouting something about the hall not yet being open. As she drew near, she made eye contact with Langdon, and immediately stopped short, covering her mouth in shock. Professor Langdon, she exclaimed, looking embarrassed. I'm so sorry. I didn't know you were here. Welcome back. Langdon froze. He was quite certain he had never seen this woman before in his life. Chapter 37 I almost didn't recognize you, Professor, the woman gushed in accented English as she approached Langdon. It's your clothing. She smiled warmly and gave Langdon's Brioni suit an appreciative nod. Very fashionable. You look almost Italian. Langdon's mouth went bone dry, but he managed a polite smile as the woman joined him. Good morning, he stumbled. How are you? She laughed, holding her belly. Exhausted. Little Catalina kicked all night. The woman glanced around the room, looking puzzled. I.L. Duomino didn't mention you were coming back today. I assume he's with you. I.L. Duomino? Langdon had no idea who she was talking about. The woman apparently saw his confusion and gave a reassuring chuckle. It's okay, everybody in Florence calls him by that nickname. He doesn't mind. She glanced around. Did he let you in? He did, Sienna said, arriving from across the hall, but he had a breakfast meeting. He said you wouldn't mind if we stayed to look around. Sienna enthusiastically extended her hand. I'm Sienna. Robert's sister. The woman gave Sienna's hand an overly official handshake. I'm Marta Alvarez. Aren't you the lucky one having Professor Langdon as a private guide? Yes, Sienna enthused, barely hiding the roll of her eyes. He's so smart. There was an awkward pause as the woman studied Sienna. Funny, she said, I don't see any family resemblance at all. Except perhaps your height. Langdon sensed an impending train wreck. Now or never. Marta, Langdon interrupted, hoping he had heard her name correctly, I'm sorry to trouble you, but, well. I guess you can probably imagine why I'm here. Actually, no, she replied, her eyes narrowing. I can't for the life of me imagine what you would be doing here. Langdon's pulse quickened, and in the awkward silence that followed, he realized his gamble was about to crash and burn. Suddenly Marta broke into a broad smile and laughed out loud. Professor, I'm joking. Of course, I can guess why you returned. Frankly, I don't know why you find it so fascinating, but since you and I.L. Duomino spent almost an hour up there last night, I'm guessing you've come back to show your sister. Right, he managed. Exactly. I'd love to show Sienna, if that's not, an inconvenience. Marta glanced up to the second-floor balcony and shrugged. No problem. I'm headed up there now. 
Langdon's heart pounded as he looked up to the second-story balcony at the rear of the hall. I was up there last night. He remembered nothing. The balcony, he knew, in addition to being at the exact same height as the word Circatrova, also served as the entrance to the Palazzo's museum, which Langdon visited whenever he was here. Marta was about to lead them across the hall, when she paused, as if having second thoughts. Actually, Professor, are you sure we can't find something a bit less grim to show your lovely sister? Langdon had no idea how to respond. We're seeing something grim. Sienna asked. What is it? He hasn't told me. Marta gave a coy smile and glanced at Langdon. Professor, would you like me to tell your sister about it, or would you prefer to do so yourself? Langdon nearly jumped at the opportunity. By all means, Marta, why don't you tell her all about it? Marta turned back to Sienna, speaking very slowly now. I don't know what your brother has told you, but we're going up to the museum to see a very unusual mask. Sienna's eyes widened a bit. What kind of mask? One of those ugly plague masks they wear at Carnavale. Good guess, Marta said, but no, it's not a plague mask. It's a much different kind of mask. It's called a death mask. Langdon's gasp of revelation was audible, and Marta scowled at him, apparently thinking he was being overly dramatic in an attempt to frighten his sister. Don't listen to your brother, she said. Death masks were a very common practice in the 1500s. It's essentially just a plaster cast of someone's face, taken a few moments after that person dies. The death mask. Langdon felt the first moment of clarity he'd felt since waking up in Florence. Dante's Inferno, Circa Trova. Looking through the eyes of death. The mask. Sienna asked, whose face was used to cast the mask. Langdon put his hand on Sienna's shoulder and answered as calmly as possible. A famous Italian poet. His name was Dante Alieri. Chapter 38 The Mediterranean sun shone brightly on the decks of the Mendacium as it rocked over the Adriatic swells. Feeling weary, the provost drained his second scotch and gazed blankly out his office window. The news from Florence was not good. Perhaps it was on account of his first taste of alcohol in a very long time, but he was feeling strangely disoriented and powerless, as if his ship had lost its engines and were drifting aimlessly on the tide. The sensation was a foreign one to the provost. In his world, there always existed a dependable compass protocol and it had never failed to show the way. Protocol was what enabled him to make difficult decisions without ever looking back. It had been protocol that required Vayantha's disavowal, and the provost had carried out the deed with no hesitation. I will deal with her once this current crisis has passed. It had been protocol that required the provost to know as little as possible about all of his clients. He had decided long ago that the consortium had no ethical responsibility to judge them. Provide the service. Trust the client. Ask no questions. Like the directors of most companies, the provost simply offered services with the assumption that those services would be implemented within the framework of the law. After all, Volvo had no responsibility to ensure that soccer moms didn't speed through school zones, any more than Dell would be held responsible if someone used one of their computers to hack into a bank account. Now, with everything unraveling, the provost quietly cursed the trusted contact who had suggested this client to the consortium. He will be low maintenance and easy money, the contact had assured him. The man is brilliant, a star in his field, and absurdly wealthy. He simply needs to disappear for a year or two. He wants to buy some time off the grid to work on an important project. The provost had agreed without much thought. Long-term relocations were always easy money, and the provost trusted his contact's instincts. As expected, the job had been very easy money. That is, until last week. Now, in the wake of the chaos created by this man, the provost found himself pacing in circles around a bottle of scotch and counting the days until his responsibilities to this client were over. The phone on his desk rang, and the provost saw it was Nalton, one of his top facilitators, calling from downstairs. Yes, he answered. 
Sir, Nalton began, an uneasy edge in his voice. I hate to bother you with this, but as you may know, we're tasked with uploading a video to the media tomorrow. Yes, the provost replied. Is it prepped? It is, but I thought you might want to preview it before upload. The provost paused, puzzled by the comment. Does the video mention us by name or compromise us in some way? No, sir, but the content is quite disturbing. The client appears on screen and says stop right there, the provost ordered, stunned that a senior facilitator would dare suggest such a blatant breach of protocol. The content is immaterial. Whatever it says, his video would have been released with or without us. The client could just as easily have released this video electronically, but he hired us. He paid us. He trusted us. Yes, sir. You were not hired to be a film critic, the provost admonished. You were hired to keep promises. Do your job. On the Ponte Vecchio, Vayantha waited, her sharp eyes scanning the hundreds of faces on the bridge. She had been vigilant and felt certain that Langdon had not yet passed her, but the drone had fallen silent, its tracking apparently no longer required. Bruder must have caught him. Reluctantly, she began to ponder the grim prospect of a consortium inquiry. Or worse. Vayanthi again pictured the two agents who had been disavowed, never heard from again. They simply moved to different work, she assured herself. Nonetheless, she now found herself wondering if she should just drive into the hills of Tuscany, disappear, and use her skills to find a new life. But how long could I hide from them? Countless targets had learned firsthand that when the consortium set you in its sights, privacy became an illusion. It was only a matter of time. Is my career really ending like this? She wondered, still unable to accept that her 12-year tenure at the consortium would be terminated over a series of unlucky breaks. For a year she had vigilantly overseen the needs of the consortium's green-eyed client. It was not my fault he jumped to his death and yet I seemed to be falling along with him. Her only chance at redemption had been to outfox Bruder, but she'd known from the start that this was a long shot. I had my chance last night, and I failed. As Vayanth reluctantly turned back toward her motorcycle, she became suddenly aware of a distant sound, a familiar high-pitched whine. Puzzled, she glanced up. To her surprise, the surveillance drone had just lifted off again, this time near the farthest end of the Pity Palace. Vayantha watched as the tiny craft began flying desperate circles over the palace. The drone's deployment could mean only one thing. They still don't have Langdon. Where the hell is he? The piercing whine overhead again pulled Dr. Elizabeth Sinsky from her delirium. The drone is up again? But I thought. She shifted in the back seat of the van, where the same young agent was still seated beside her. She closed her eyes again, fighting the pain and nausea. Mostly, though, she fought the fear. Time is running out. Even though her enemy had jumped to his death, she still saw his silhouette in her dreams, lecturing her in the darkness of the Council on Foreign Relations. It is imperative that someone take bold action, he had declared, his green eyes flashing. If not us, who? If not now, when? Elizabeth knew she should have stopped him right then when she had the chance. She would never forget storming out of that meeting and fuming in the back of the limo as she headed across Manhattan toward JFK International Airport. Eager to know who the hell this maniac could be, she pulled out her cell phone to look at the surprise snapshot she had taken of him. When she saw the photo, she gasped aloud. Dr. Elizabeth Sinsky knew exactly who this man was. The good news was that he would be very easy to track. The bad news was that he was a genius in his field a very dangerous person should he choose to be. Nothing is more creative, nor destructive, than a brilliant mind with a purpose. By the time she arrived at the airport 30 minutes later, she had called her team and placed this man on the bioterrorism watch lists of every relevant agency on Earth the CIA, the CDC, the ECDC, and all of their sister organizations around the world. That's all I can do until I get back to Geneva, she thought. Exhausted, 
she carried her overnight bag to check in and handed the attendant her passport and ticket. Oh, Dr. Sinsky, the attendant said with a smile. A very nice gentleman just left a message for you. I'm sorry. Elizabeth knew of nobody who had access to her flight information. He was very tall, the attendant said. With green eyes. Elizabeth literally dropped her bag. He's here? How? She spun around, looking at the faces behind her. He left already, the attendant said, but he wanted us to give you this. She handed Elizabeth a folded piece of stationery. Shaking, Elizabeth unfolded the paper and read the handwritten note. It was a famous quote derived from the work of Dante Alighieri. The darkest places in hell are reserved for those who maintain their neutrality in times of moral crisis. Chapter 39 Marta Alvarez gazed tiredly up the steep staircase that ascended from the Hall of the 500 to the Second Floor Museum. Paso Farsala, she told herself. I can do it. As an arts and culture administrator at the Palazzo Vecchio, Marta had climbed these stairs countless times, but recently, being more than eight months pregnant, she found the ascent significantly more taxing. Marta, are you sure we don't want to take the elevator? Robert Langdon looked concerned and motioned to the small service elevator nearby, which the Palazzo had installed for handicapped visitors. Marta smiled appreciatively but shook her head. As I told you last night, my doctor says the exercise is good for the baby. Besides, Professor, I know you're claustrophobic. Langdon seemed strangely startled by her comment. Oh, right. I forgot I mentioned that. Forgot he mentioned it. Marta puzzled. It was less than twelve hours ago, and we discussed at length the childhood incident that led to the fear. Last night, while Langdon's morbidly obese companion, Il Duomino, ascended in the elevator, Langdon had accompanied Marta on foot. En route Langdon had shared with her a vivid description of a boyhood fall into an abandoned well that had left him with a nearly debilitating fear of cramped spaces. Now, while Langdon's younger sister bounded ahead, her blonde ponytail swinging behind her, Langdon and Marta ascended methodically, pausing several times so she could catch her breath. I'm surprised you want to see the mask again, she said. Considering all the pieces in Florence, this one seems among the least interesting. Langdon gave a noncommittal shrug. I've returned mainly so Sienna can see it. Thank you, by the way, for letting us in again. Of course. Langdon's reputation would have sufficed last night to persuade Marta to open the gallery for him, but the fact that he had been accompanied by Il Duomino meant that she really had no choice. Ignazio Busoni the man known as Il Duomino was something of a celebrity in the Florence cultural world. The longtime director of the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo, Ignazio oversaw all aspects of Florence's most prominent historical site Il Duomo the massive, red-domed cathedral that dominated both the history and the skyline of Florence. His passion for the landmark, combined with his body weight of nearly 400 pounds and his perpetually red face, resulted in his good-natured nickname of Il Duomino the Little Dome. Marta had no idea how Langdon had become acquainted with Il Duomino, but the latter had called her last evening and said he wanted to bring a guest for a private viewing of the Dante Death Mask. When the mystery guest turned out to be the famous American symbologist and art historian Robert Langdon, Marta had felt a bit of a thrill at having the opportunity to usher these two famous men into the Palazzo's gallery. Now, as they reached the top of the stairs, Marta placed her hands on her hips, breathing deeply. Sienna was already at the balcony railing, peering back down into the hall of the 500. My favorite view of the room, Marta panted. You get an entirely different perspective on the murals. I imagine your brother told you about the mysterious message hidden in that one there. She pointed. Sienna nodded enthusiastically. Circa Trova. As Langdon gazed toward the room, Marta watched him. In the light of the mezzanine windows, she couldn't help but notice that Langdon did not look as striking as he had last night. She liked his new suit, but he needed a shave, and his face seemed pale and weary. Also, his hair, which was thick and full last night, looked matted this morning, 
as if he had yet to take a shower. Marta turned back to the mural before he caught her staring. We're standing at nearly the exact height as Circa Trova, Marta said. You can almost see the words with the naked eye. Langdon's sister seemed indifferent to the mural. Tell me about Dante's death mask. Why is it here at the Palazzo Vecchio? Like brother, like sister, Marta thought with an inward groan, still perplexed that the mask held such fascination for them. Then again, the Dante death mask had a very strange history, especially recently, and Langdon was not the first to show a nearly maniacal fascination with it. Well, tell me, what do you know about Dante? The pretty, young blonde shrugged. Just what everyone learns in school. Dante was an Italian poet most famous for writing the Divine Comedy, which describes his imagined journey through hell. Partially correct, Marta replied. In his poem, Dante eventually escapes hell, continues through purgatory, and finally arrives in paradise. If you ever read the Divine Comedy, you'll see his journey is divided into three parts Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. Marta motioned for them to follow her along the balcony toward the museum entrance. The reason the mask resides here in the Palazzo Vecchio has nothing to do with the Divine Comedy, though. It has to do with real history. Dante lived in Florence, and he loved this city as much as anyone could ever love a city. He was a very prominent and powerful Florentine, but there was a shift in political power, and Dante supported the wrong side, so he was exiled thrown outside the city walls and told he could never come back. Marta paused to catch her breath as they approached the museum entrance. Hands again on her hips, she leaned back and continued talking. Some people claim that Dante's exile is the reason why his death mask looks so sad, but I have another theory. I'm a bit of a romantic, and I think the sad face has more to do with a woman named Beatrice. You see, Dante spent his entire life desperately in love with a young woman named Beatrice Portinari. But sadly, Beatrice married another man, which meant Dante had to live not only without his beloved Florence, but also without the woman he so deeply loved. His love for Beatrice became a central theme in the Divine Comedy. Interesting, Sienna said in a tone that suggested she had not heard a word. And yet I'm still not clear on why the death mask is kept here inside the palazzo. Marta found the young woman's insistence both unusual and bordering on impolite. Well, she continued, walking again, when Dante died, he was still forbidden to enter Florence, and his body was buried in Ravenna. But because his true love, Beatrice, was buried in Florence, and because Dante so loved Florence, bringing his death mask here seemed like a kind-hearted tribute to the man. I see, Sienna said. And the choice of this building in particular. The Palazzo Vecchio is the oldest symbol of Florence and, in Dante's time, was the heart of the city. In fact, there is a famous painting in the cathedral that shows Dante standing outside the walled city, banished, while visible in the background is his cherished Palazzo Tower. In many ways, by keeping his death mask here, we feel like Dante has finally been allowed to come home. That's nice, Sienna said, finally seeming satisfied. Thank you. Marta arrived at the door of the museum and rapped three times. Sono io, Marta. Buongiorno. Some keys rattled inside and the door opened. An elderly guard smiled tiredly at her and checked his watch. E un po presto, he said with a smile. A little early. By way of explanation, Marta motioned to Langdon, and the guard immediately brightened. Signore. Bentornado. Welcome back. Grazie, Langdon replied amiably as the guard motioned them all inside. They moved through a small foyer where the guard disarmed a security system and then unlocked a second, heavier door. As the door swung open, he stepped aside, sweeping his arm out with a flourish. Echo il museo. Marta smiled her thanks and led her guests inside. The space that made up this museum had originally been designed as government offices, which meant that rather than a sprawling, wide-open gallery space, it was a labyrinth of moderate-size rooms and hallways which encircled half of the building. The Dante death mask is around the corner, 
Marta told Siena. It's displayed in a narrow space called El Andito, which is essentially just a walkway between two larger rooms. An antique cabinet against the sidewall holds the mask, which keeps it invisible until you draw even with it. For this reason, many visitors walk right past the mask without even noticing it. Langdon was striding faster now, eyes straight ahead, as if the mask held some kind of strange power over him. Marta nudged Sienna and whispered, Obviously, your brother is not interested in any of our other pieces, but as long as you're here, you shouldn't miss our bust of Machiavelli or the Mappa Mundi globe in the Hall of Maps. Sienna nodded politely and kept moving, her eyes also straight ahead. Marta was barely able to keep pace. As they reached the third room, she had fallen behind a bit and finally stopped short. Professor, she called out, panting. Perhaps you, want to show your sister, some of the gallery, before we see his mask. Langdon turned, seeming distracted, as if returning to the present from some far-off thought. Excuse me. Marta breathlessly pointed to a nearby display case. One of the earliest, printed copies of the Divine Comedy. When Langdon finally saw Marta dabbing her forehead and trying to catch her breath, he looked mortified. Marta, forgive me. Of course, yes, a quick glance at the text would be wonderful. Langdon hurried back, permitting Marta to guide them over to the antique case. Inside was a well-worn, leather-bound book, propped open to an ornate title page, La Divina Commedia, Dante Alieri. Incredible, Langdon said, sounding surprised. I recognize the frontispiece. I didn't know you had one of the original New Mister editions. Of course you knew, Marta thought, puzzled. I showed this to you last night. In the mid-1400s, Langdon said hurriedly to Siena, Johann Neumister created the first printed edition of this work. Several hundred copies were printed, but only about a dozen survived. They're very rare. It now seemed to Marta that Langdon had been playing dumb so he could show off for his younger sibling. It seemed a rather unbecoming immodesty for a professor whose reputation was one of academic humility. This copy is on loan from the Laurentian Library, Marta offered. If you and Robert have not visited there, you should. They have a spectacular staircase designed by Michelangelo, which leads up to the world's first public reading room. The books there were actually chained to the seats so nobody could take them out. Of course, many of the books were the only copies in the world. Amazing, Sienna said, glancing deeper into the museum. And the mask is this way. What's the hurry? Marta needed another minute to regain her breath. Yes, but you might be interested to hear about this. She pointed across an alcove toward a small staircase that disappeared into the ceiling. That goes up to a viewing platform in the rafters where you can actually look down on Vasari's famous hanging ceiling. I'd be happy to wait here if you'd like to please, Marta, Sienna interjected. I'd love to see the mask. We're a little short on time. Marta stared at the pretty, young woman, perplexed. She very much disliked the new fashion of strangers calling each other by their first names. I'm Senora Alvarez. She silently chided. And I'm doing you a favor. Okay, Sienna, Marta said curtly. The mask is right this way. Marta wasted no more time offering Langdon and his sister informed commentary as they made their way through the winding suite of gallery rooms toward the mask. Last night, Langdon and I.L. Duomino had spent nearly a half hour in the narrow andito, viewing the mask. Marta, intrigued by the men's curiosity for the piece, had asked if their fascination was related somehow to the unusual series of events surrounding the mask over this past year. Langdon and I.L. Duomino had been coy, offering no real answer. Now, as they approached the andito, Langdon began explaining to his sister the simple process used to create a death mask. His description, Marta was pleased to hear, was perfectly accurate unlike his bogus claim that he had not previously seen the museum's rare copy of the Divine Comedy. Shortly after death, Langdon described, the deceased is laid out, and his face is coated with olive oil. Then a layer of wet plaster is caked onto the skin,
covering everything mouth, nose, eyelids from the hairline down to the neck. Once hardened, the plaster is easily lifted off and used as a mold into which fresh plaster is poured. This plaster hardens into a perfectly detailed replica of the deceased's face. The practice was particularly widespread in commemorating eminent persons and men of genius Dante, Shakespeare, Voltaire, Tasso, Keats they all had death masks made. And here we are at last, Marta announced as the trio arrived outside the Andito. She stepped aside and motioned for Langdon's sister to enter first. The mask is in the display case against the wall on your left. We ask that you please stay outside the stanchions. Thank you. Sienna entered the narrow corridor, walked toward the display case, and peered inside. Her eyes instantly went wide, and she glanced back at her brother with an expression of dread. Marta had seen the reaction a thousand times, visitors were often jolted and repulsed by their first glimpse of the mask Dante's eerily crinkled visage, hooked nose, and closed eyes. Langdon strode in right behind Sienna, arriving beside her and looking into the display case. He immediately stepped back, his face also registering surprise. Marta groaned. Che e se gerato. She followed them in. But when she gazed into the cabinet, she, too, gasped out loud. Oh mio dio. Marta Alvarez had expected to see Dante's familiar dead face staring back at her, but instead, all she saw was the red satin interior of the cabinet and the peg on which the mask normally hung. Marta covered her mouth and stared in horror at the empty display case. Her breathing accelerated and she grabbed one of the stanchions for support. Finally, she tore her eyes from the bare cabinet and wheeled in the direction of the night guards at the main entrance. La Mascara de Dante, she shouted like a madwoman. La Mascara de Dante Esperita. Chapter 40 Marta Alvarez trembled before the empty display cabinet. She hoped the tightness spreading through her abdomen was panic and not labor pains. The Dante death mask is gone. The two security guards were now on full alert, having arrived in the Andito, seen the empty case, and sprung into action. One had rushed to the nearby video control room to access security camera footage from last night, while the other had just finished phoning in the robbery to the police. La Polizia arriver at Traventi Minuti the guard told Marta as he hung up with the police. Venti minuti, she demanded. Twenty minutes. We've had a major art theft. The guard explained that he had been told most of the city police were currently handling a far more serious crisis and they were trying to find an available agent to come and take a statement. Che cosa potreb esserci de piu grave, she ranted. What can be more serious? Langdon and Sienna shared an anxious glance, and Marta sensed that her two guests were suffering from sensory overload. Not surprising. Having simply stopped by for a quick look at the mask, they were now witnessing the aftermath of a major art theft. Last night, somehow, someone had gained access to the gallery and stolen Dante's death mask. Marta knew there were far more valuable pieces in the museum that could have been stolen, so she tried to count her blessings. Nonetheless, this was the first theft in this museum's history. I don't even know the protocol. Marta felt suddenly weak, and she again reached out to one of the stanchions for support. Both gallery guards appeared mystified as they had recounted to Marta their exact actions and the events of last night, at around 10 o'clock, Marta had entered with Il Duomino and Langdon. A short while later, the threesome had exited together. The guards had relocked the doors, reset the alarm, and as far as they knew, nobody had been in or out of the gallery since that moment. Impossible. Marta had scolded in Italian. The mask was in the cabinet when the three of us left last night, so obviously somebody has been inside the gallery since then. The guards showed their palms, looking bewildered. Noi non abbiamo visto nessuno. Now, with the police on the way, Marta moved as rapidly as her pregnant body permitted in the direction of the security control room. Langdon and Sienna fell into step nervously behind her. The security video, Marta thought. That will show us precisely who was in here last night. Three blocks away, on the Ponte Vecchio, 
Vayantha moved into the shadows as a pair of police officers filtered through the crowd, canvassing the area with photos of Langdon. As the officers neared Vayantha, one of their radios blared a routine all-points bulletin from dispatch. The announcement was brief and in Italian, but Vayantha caught the gist, any available officer in the area of the Palazzo Vecchio should report to take a statement at the Palazzo Museum. The officers barely flinched, but Vayantha's ears pricked up. Il Museo di Palazzo Vecchio Last night's debacle the fiasco that had all but destroyed her career had occurred in the alleyways just outside the Palazzo Vecchio. The police bulletin continued, in static-filled Italian that was mostly unintelligible, except for two words that stood out clearly, the name Dante Alieri. Her body instantly tensed. Dante Alieri. Most certainly this was not coincidence. She spun in the direction of the Palazzo Vecchio and located its crenellated tower peeking over the rooftops of the nearby buildings. What exactly happened at the museum? She wondered. And when? The specifics aside, Vayantha had been a field analyst long enough to know that coincidence was far less common than most people imagined. The Palazzo Vecchio Museum. And Dante? This had to relate to Langdon. Vayantha had suspected all along that Langdon would return to the old city. It only made sense the old city was where Langdon had been last night when everything had started to come undone. Now, in the light of day, Vayantha wondered if Langdon had somehow returned to the area around the Palazzo Vecchio to find whatever it was he was seeking. She was certain Langdon had not crossed this bridge into the old city. There were plenty of other bridges and yet they seemed to be impossibly far on foot from the Baboli Gardens. Beneath her, she noticed a four-man crew shell scheming across the water and passing under the bridge. The Hull Reed Societa Canatieri Forenza slash Florence Rowing Club. The shell's distinctive red and white oars rose and fell in perfect unison. Could Langdon have taken a boat across? It seemed unlikely and yet something told her the police bulletin regarding the Palazzo Vecchio was a cue she should heed. All cameras out, per favori, a woman called in accented English. Vayantha turned to see a frilly orange pom-pom waving on a stick as a female tour guide attempted to herd her brood of duckling tourists across the Ponte Vecchio. Above you is Vasari's largest masterpiece, the guide exclaimed with practiced enthusiasm, lifting her pom-pom into the air and directing everyone's gaze upward. Vayantha hadn't noticed it before, but there appeared to be a second-story structure that ran across the top of the shops like a narrow apartment. The Vasari Corridor, the guide announced. It's nearly one kilometer long and provided the Medici family with a secure passageway between the Pitti Palace and the Palazzo Vecchio. Vayantha's eyes widened as she took in the tunnel-like structure above her. She'd heard of the corridor, but knew very little about it. It leads to the Palazzo Vecchio. For those rare few with VIP connections, the guide continued, they can access the corridor even today. It's a spectacular art gallery that stretches all the way from the Palazzo Vecchio to the northeast corner of the Baboli Gardens. Whatever the guide said next, Vayantha did not hear. She was already dashing for her motorcycle. Chapter 41 The stitches in Langdon's scalp were throbbing again as he and Sienna squeezed inside the video control room with Marta and the two guards. The cramped space was nothing more than a converted vestment chamber with a bank of whirring hard drives and computer monitors. The air inside was stiflingly hot and smelled of stale cigarette smoke. Langdon felt the walls closing in around him immediately. Marta took a seat in front of the video monitor, which was already in playback mode and displayed a grainy black and white image of the Andito, shot from above the door. The timestamp on screen indicated that the footage had been queued to mid-morning yesterday precisely 24 hours ago apparently just before the museum opened and long before the arrival of Langdon and the mysterious Il Duomino that evening. The guard fast-forwarded through the video, and Langdon watched as an influx of tourists flowed rapidly into the Andito, moving in hurried jerky motions. The mask itself was not visible from this perspective but clearly it was still in its display case as tourists repeatedly paused to peer inside or take photos before moving on. Please hurry, Langdon thought, knowing the police were on their way. He wondered if he and Sienna should just excuse themselves and run, but they needed to see this video, 
whatever was on this recording would answer a lot of questions about what the hell was going on. The video playback continued, faster now, and afternoon shadows began moving across the room. Tourists zipped in and out until finally the crowds began to thin, and then abruptly disappeared entirely. As the timestamp raced past 1,700 hours, the museum lights went out, and all was quiet. 5 p.m. Closing time. Amanti La Velocita, Marta commanded, leaning forward in her chair and staring at the screen. The guard let the video race on, the timestamp advancing quickly, until suddenly, at around 10 p.m., the lights in the museum flickered back on. The guard quickly slowed the tape back to regular speed. A moment later, the familiar pregnant shape of Marta Alvarez came into view. She was followed closely by Langdon, who entered wearing his familiar Harris Tweed Camberley jacket, pressed cockies and his own cordovan loafers. He even saw the glint of his Mickey Mouse watch peeking out from under his sleeve as he walked. There I am, before I got shot. Langdon found it deeply unsettling to watch himself doing things of which he had absolutely no recollection. I was here last night, looking at the death mask. Somehow, between then and now, he had managed to lose his clothing, his Mickey Mouse watch, and two days of his life. As the video continued, he and Sienna crowded in close behind Marta and the guards for a better view. The silent footage continued showing Langdon and Marta arriving at the display case and admiring the mask. As they were doing this, a broad shadow darkened the doorway behind him, and a morbidly obese man shuffled into the frame. He was dressed in a tan suit, carried a briefcase, and barely fit through the door. His bulging gut made even the pregnant Marta look slender. Langdon recognized the man at once. Ignacio. That's Ignacio Busoni. Langdon whispered in Siena's ear. Director of the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo. An acquaintance of mine for several years. I'd just never heard him called Il Duomino. A fitting epithet, Siena replied quietly. In years past, Langdon had consulted Ignazio on artifacts and history relating to Il Duomo the basilica for which he was responsible but a visit to the Palazzo Vecchio seemed outside Ignazio's domain. Then again, Ignazio Busoni, in addition to being an influential figure in the Florentine art world, was a Dante enthusiast and scholar. A logical source of information on Dante's death mask. As Langdon returned his focus to the video, Marta could now be seen waiting patiently against the rear wall of the Andito while Langdon and Ignazio leaned out over the stanchions to get the closest possible look at the mask. As the men continued their examination and discussion, the minutes wore on and Marta could be seen discreetly checking her watch behind their backs. Langdon wished the security tape included audio. What were Ignacio and I talking about? What are we looking for? Just then, on screen, Langdon stepped over the stanchions and crouched down directly in front of the cabinet, his face only inches from the glass. Marta immediately intervened, apparently admonishing him, and Langdon apologetically stepped back. Sorry I was so strict, Marta now said, glancing back at him over her shoulder. But as I told you, the display case is an antique and extremely fragile. The mask's owner insists we keep people behind the stanchions. He won't even permit our staff to open the case without him present. Her words took a moment to register. The mask's owner? Langdon had assumed the mask was the property of the museum. Sienna looked equally surprised and chimed in immediately. The museum doesn't own the mask. Marta shook her head, her eyes now back on the screen. A wealthy patron offered to buy Dante's death mask from our collection and yet leave it on permanent display here. He offered a small fortune, and we happily accepted. Hold on, Sienna said. He paid for the mask, and let you keep it. Common arrangement, Langdon said. Philanthropic acquisition a way for donors to make major grants to museums without registering the gift as charity. The donor was an unusual man, Marta said. A genuine scholar of Dante, and yet a bit, how do you say, fanatico. Who is he? Sienna demanded, her casual tone laced with urgency. Who? Marta frowned, 
still staring at the screen. Well, you probably read about him in the news recently the Swiss billionaire Bertrand Zabrist. For Langdon the name seemed only vaguely familiar, but Sienna grabbed Langdon's arm and squeezed it hard, looking as if she'd seen a ghost. Oh, yes, Sienna said haltingly, her face ashen. Bertrand Zabrist. Famous biochemist. Made a fortune in biological patents at a young age. She paused, swallowing hard. She leaned over and whispered to Langdon. Zabrist basically invented the field of germline manipulation. Langdon had no idea what germline manipulation was, but it had an ominous ring, especially in light of the recent spate of images involving plagues and death. He wondered if Sienna knew so much about Zabrist because she was well-read in the field of medicine, or perhaps because they had both been child prodigies. Do savants follow each other's work? I first heard of Zabrist a few years ago, Sienna explained, when he made some highly provocative declarations in the media about population growth. She paused, her face gloomy. Zabrist is a proponent of the population apocalypse equation. I beg your pardon. Essentially it's a mathematical recognition that the Earth's population is rising, people are living longer, and our natural resources are waning. The equation predicts that the current trend can have no outcome other than the apocalyptic collapse of society. Zabrist has publicly predicted that the human race will not survive another century, unless we have some kind of mass extinction event. Sienna sighed heavily and locked eyes with Langdon. In fact, Zabrist was once quoted as saying that the best thing that ever happened to Europe was the Black Death. Langdon stared at her in shock. The hair on his neck bristled as, once again, the image of the plague mask flashed through his mind. He had been trying all morning to resist the notion that his current dilemma related to a deadly plague, but that notion was getting more and more difficult to refute. For Bertrand Zabras to describe the Black Death as the best thing ever to happen to Europe was certainly appalling, and yet Langdon knew that many historians had chronicled the long-term socio-economic benefits of the mass extinction that had occurred in Europe in the 1300s. Prior to the plague, overpopulation, famine, and economic hardship had defined the Dark Ages. The sudden arrival of the Black Death, while horrific, had effectively thinned the human herd, creating an abundance of food and opportunity, which, according to many historians, had been a primary catalyst for bringing about the Renaissance. As Langdon pictured the biohazard symbol on the tube that had contained the modified map of Dante's Inferno, a chilling thought struck him. The eerie little projector had been created by someone, and Bertrand Zabrist a biochemist and Dante fanatic now seemed to be a logical candidate. The father of genetic germline manipulation. Langdon sensed pieces of the puzzle now falling into place. Regrettably, the picture coming into focus felt increasingly frightening. Fast forward through this part, Marta ordered the guard sounding eager to get past the real-time playback of Langdon and Ignazio Busoni studying the mask so she could find out who had broken into the museum and stolen it. The guard hit the fast-forward button, and the time stamp accelerated. Three minutes, six minutes, eight minutes. On screen, Marta could be seen standing behind the men, shifting her weight with increasing frequency and repeatedly checking her watch. I'm sorry we talked so long, Langdon said. You look uncomfortable. My own fault, Marta replied. You both insisted that I should go home and the guards could let you out, but I felt that would be rude. Suddenly, on screen, Marta disappeared. The guard slowed the video to normal speed. It's okay, Marta said. I remember going to the restroom. The guard nodded and reached again for the fast forward button, but before he pressed it, Marta grabbed his arm. Asked Betty. She cocked her head and stared at the monitor in confusion. Langdon had seen it, too. What in the world? On screen, Langdon had just reached into the pocket of his tweed coat and produced a pair of surgical gloves, which he was now pulling onto his hands. Simultaneously, Il Duomino positioned himself behind Langdon, peering down the hallway where Marta had moments earlier trudged off to use the restroom. After a moment the obese man nodded to Langdon in a way that seemed to mean that the coast was clear. What the hell are we doing? 
Langdon watched himself on the video as his gloved hand reached out and found the edge of the cabinet door, and then, ever so gently, pulled back until the antique hinge shifted and the door swung slowly open, exposing the Dante death mask. Marta Alvarez let out a horrified gasp and brought her hands to her face. Sharing Marta's horror, Langdon watched himself in utter disbelief as he reached into the case, gently gripped the Dante death mask with both hands, and lifted it out. Dio me salvi. Marta exploded, heaving herself to her feet and spinning around to face Langdon. Cos ha fato? Perchi. Before Langdon could respond, one of the guards whipped out a black beretta and aimed it directly at Langdon's chest. Jesus! Robert Langdon stared down the barrel of the guard's handgun and felt the tiny room closing in around him. Marta Alvarez was on her feet now, glaring up at him with an incredulous look of betrayal on her face. On the security monitor behind her, Langdon was now holding the mask up to the light and studying it. I took it out only for a moment, Langdon insisted praying that this was true. Ignacio assured me you wouldn't mind. Marta did not reply. She looked stupefied, clearly trying to imagine why Langdon had lied to her, and indeed how in the world Langdon could have calmly stood by and let the tape play when he knew what it would reveal. I had no idea I opened the case. Robert, Sienna whispered. Look. You found something. Sienna remained riveted on the playback focusing on getting answers despite their predicament. On screen, Langdon was now holding the mask up and angling it toward the light, his attention apparently drawn to something of interest on the back of the artifact. From this camera angle, for a split second, the raised mask partially blocked Langdon's face in such a way that Dante's dead eyes were aligned with Langdon's. He remembered the pronouncement the truth can be glimpsed only through the eyes of death and felt a chill. Langdon had no idea what he might have been examining on the back of the mask, but at that moment in the video, as he shared his discovery with Ignacio, the obese man recoiled, immediately fumbling for his spectacles and looking again, and again. He began shaking his head vigorously and pacing the andito in an agitated state. Suddenly both men glanced up, clearly having heard something in the hallway most likely Marta returning from the restroom. Hurriedly. Langdon pulled from his pocket a large Ziploc bag, into which he sealed the death mask before gently handing it to Ignacio, who placed it, with seeming reluctance, inside his briefcase. Langdon quickly closed the antique glass door on the now empty display case, and the two men strode briskly up the hall to encounter Marta before she could discover their theft. Both guards now had their guns trained on Langdon. Marta wobbled on her feet, grasping the table for support. I don't understand, she sputtered. You and Ignacio Busoni stole the Dante death mask. No. Langdon insisted, bluffing as best as he could. We had permission from the owner to take the mask out of the building for the night. Permission from the owner, she questioned. From Bertrand Zabrist. Yes. Mr. Zabrist agreed to let us examine some markings on the back. We met with him yesterday afternoon. Marta's eyes shot daggers. Professor, I am quite certain you did not meet with Bertrand Zabrist yesterday afternoon. We most certainly did. Sienna placed her restraining hand on Langdon's arm. Robert, she gave a grim sigh. Six days ago, Bertrand Zabrist threw himself off the top of the Badia Tower only a few blocks away from here. Chapter 42 Vayantha had abandoned her motorcycle just north of the Palazzo Vecchio and was approaching on foot along the perimeter of the Piazza della Signoria. As she wound her way through the Loggia Dei Lanzi's outdoor statuary, she could not help but notice that all the figures seemed to be enacting a variation on a single theme, violent displays of male dominance over women. The Rape of the Sabines The Rape of Polyxena Perseus holding the severed head of Medusa Lovely, Vayantha thought, pulling her cap low over her eyes and edging her way through the morning crowd toward the entrance of the palace, which was just admitting the first tourists of the day. From all appearances, it was business as usual here at the Palazzo Vecchio. No police, Vayantha thought. At least not yet. She zipped her jacket high around her neck, making certain that her weapon was concealed, and headed through the entrance. 
Following signs for Il Museo di Palazzo, she passed through two ornate atriums and then up a massive staircase toward the second floor. As she climbed, she replayed the police dispatch in her head. Il Museo di Palazzo Vecchio. Dante Alieri. Langdon has to be here. The signs for the museum led Vayanthia into a massive, spectacularly adorned gallery the Hall of the 500 where a scattering of tourists mingled, admiring the colossal murals on the walls. Vayantha had no interest in observing the art here and quickly located another museum sign in the far right-hand corner of the room, pointing up a staircase. As she made her way across the hall, she noticed a group of university kids all gathered around a single sculpture, laughing and taking pictures. The plaque read, Hercules and Diomedes. Vayanthi eyed the statues and groaned. The sculpture depicted the two heroes of Greek mythology both stark naked locked in a wrestling match. Hercules was holding Diomedes upside down, preparing to throw him, while Diomedes was tightly gripping Hercules' penis, as if to say, Are you sure you want to throw me? Vayantha winced. Talk about having someone by the balls. She removed her eyes from the peculiar statue and quickly climbed the stairs toward the museum. She arrived on a high balcony that overlooked the hall. A dozen or so tourists were waiting outside the museum entrance. Delayed opening, one cheerful tourist offered, peeking out from behind his camcorder. Any idea why? she asked. Nope, but what a great view while we wait. The man swung his arm out over the expanse of the hall of the 500 below. Vayantha walked to the edge and peered at the expansive room beneath them. Downstairs, a lone police officer was just arriving, drawing very little attention as he moved, without any sense of urgency, across the room toward the staircase. He's coming up to take a statement, Vayanthi imagined. The man's lugubrious trudge up the stairs indicated this was a routine response call nothing like the chaotic search for Langdon at the Porta Romana. If Langdon is here, why aren't they swarming the building? Either Vayantha had assumed incorrectly that Langdon was here, or the local police and brooder had not yet put two and two together. As the officer reached the top of the stairs and ambled toward the museum entrance, Vayantha casually turned away and pretended to gaze out a window. Considering her disavowal and the long reach of the provost, she was not taking any chances of being recognized. Aspeta, a voice shouted somewhere. Vayantha's heart skipped a beat as the officer stopped directly behind her. The voice, she realized, was coming from his walkie-talkie. Attendee Irene Fortsi, the voice repeated. Wait for support? Vayantha sensed that something had just changed. Just then, outside the window, Vayantha noticed a black object growing larger in the distant sky. It was flying toward the Palazzo Vecchio from the direction of the Baboli Gardens. The drone, Vayantha realized. Bruder knows. And he's headed this way. Consortium facilitator Lawrence Knowlton was still kicking himself for phoning the provost. He knew better than to suggest that the provost preview the client's video before it was uploaded to the media tomorrow. The content was irrelevant. Protocol is king. Knowlton still recalled the mantra taught to young facilitators when they started handling tasks for the organization. Don't ask. Just task. Reluctantly, he placed the little red memory stick in the queue for tomorrow morning, wondering what the media would make of the bizarre message. Would they even play it? Of course they will. It's from Bertrand Zabrist. Not only was Zabrist a staggeringly successful figure in the biomedical world, but he was already in the news as a result of his suicide last week. This nine-minute video would play like a message from the grave, and its ominously macabre quality would make it nearly impossible for people to turn it off. This video will go viral within minutes of its release. Chapter 43 Marta Alvarez was seething as she stepped out of the cramped video room, having left Langdon and his rude little sister at gunpoint with the guards. She marched over to a window and peered down at the Piazza della Signoria, relieved to see a police car parked out front. It's about time. Marta still could not fathom why a man as respected in his profession as Robert Langdon would so blatantly deceive her, take advantage of the professional courtesy she had offered, and steal a priceless artifact. 
and Ignazio Busoni assisted him? Unthinkable. Intent on giving Ignazio a piece of her mind, Marta pulled out her cell phone and dialed Il Duomino's office, which was several blocks away at the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo. The line rang only once. Ufficio di Ignazio Busoni, a familiar woman's voice answered. Marta was friendly with Ignazio's secretary but was in no mood for small talk. Eugenia, sono Marta. Devo parlar con Ignazio. There was an odd pause on the line and then suddenly the secretary burst into hysterical sobbing. Cosa succeed? Marta demanded. What's wrong? Eugenia tearfully told Marta that she had just arrived at the office to learn that Ignazio had suffered a massive heart attack last night in an alleyway near the Duomo. It was around midnight when he had called for an ambulance, but the medics hadn't arrived in time. Busoni was dead. Marta's legs nearly buckled beneath her. This morning she'd heard on the news that an unnamed city official had died the previous night, but she never imagined it was Ignazio. Eugenia, ask El Tammy, Marta urged, trying to remain calm as she quickly explained what she had just witnessed on the Palazzo video cameras the Dante death mask stolen by Ignazio and Robert Langdon, who was now being held at gunpoint. Marta had no idea what response she expected Eugenia to make but it most certainly was not what she heard. Roberto Langdon. Eugenia demanded. SEI con Langdon Aura. You're with Langdon now. Eugenia seemed to be missing the point. Yes, but the mask Devo parlor con we. Eugenia all but shouted. I need to speak to him. Inside the security room, Langdon's head continued to throb as the guards aimed their weapons directly at him. Abruptly, the door opened, and Marta Alvarez appeared. Through the open door Langdon heard the distant whine of the drone somewhere outside, its ominous buzz accompanied by the wail of approaching sirens. They found out where we are. He arrived at a La Polizia, Marta told the guards, sending one of them out to usher the authorities into the museum. The other remained behind, gun barrel still aimed at Langdon. To Langdon's surprise, Marta held out a cell phone to him. Someone wants to speak to you, she said, sounding mystified. You'll need to take it out here to have a connection. The group migrated from the stuffy control room into the gallery space just outside, where sunlight poured through large windows offering a spectacular view of Piazza della Signoria below. Although he was still at gunpoint, Langdon felt relieved to be out of the enclosed space. Marta motioned him over near the window and handed him the phone. Langdon took it uncertain, and raised it to his ear. Yes? This is Robert Langdon. Signore, the woman said in tentative, accented English. I am Eugenia Antonucci, the secretary of Ignazio Busoni. You and I, we meet yesterday night when you arrive his office. Langdon recalled nothing. Yes. I'm very sorry to say you this, but Ignazio, he died of heart attack yesterday night. Langdon's grip tightened on the phone. Ignazio Busoni is dead. The woman was weeping now, her voice full of sadness. Ignazio call me before he die. He leave me a message and tell me to be sure you hear it. I will play it for you. Langdon heard some rustling, and moments later, a faint breathless recording of the voice of Ignazio Busoni reached his ears. Eugenia, the man panted, clearly in pain. Please be sure Robert Langdon hears this message. I'm in trouble. I don't think I'll make it back to the office. Ignazio groaned and there was a long silence. When he began speaking again, his voice was weaker. Robert, I hope you escaped. They're still after me, and I'm... I'm not well. I'm trying to reach a doctor, but, there was another long pause as if I.L. Duomino were mustering his last bit of energy, and then. Robert, listen carefully. What you seek is safely hidden. The gates are open to you, but you must hurry. Paradise 25. He paused a long moment and then whispered, Godspeed. Then the message ended. Langdon's heart raced, and he knew he had just witnessed the final words of a dying man. That these words had been directed at him did nothing to relieve his anxiety. 
Paradise 25? The gates are open to me? Langdon considered it. What gates does he mean? The only thing that made any sense at all was that Ignacio had said that the mask was safely hidden. Eugenia came back on the line. Professor, do you understand this? Some of it, yes. Is there something I can do? Langdon considered this question a long moment. Make sure nobody else hears this message. Even the police? A detective arrives soon to take my statement. Langdon stiffened. He looked at the guard who was aiming a gun at him. Quickly, Langdon turned toward the window and lowered his voice, hurriedly whispering, Eugenia, this will sound strange, but for Ignacio's sake, I need you to delete that message and do not mention to the police that you spoke to me. Is that clear? The situation is very complicated and Langdon felt a gun barrel press into his side and turned to see the armed guard, inches away, holding out his free hand and demanding Marta's phone. On the line, there was a long pause, and Eugenia finally said, Mr. Langdon, my boss trusted you, so I will, too. Then she was gone. Langdon handed the phone back to the guard. Ignacio Busoni is dead, he said to Sienna. He died of a heart attack last night after leaving this museum. Langdon paused. The mask is safe. Ignacio hid it before he died. And I think he left me a clue about where to find it. Paradise 25 Hope flashed in Sienna's eyes, but when Langdon turned back to Marta, she looked skeptical. Marta, Langdon said. I can retrieve Dante's mask for you, but you'll need to let us go. Immediately. Marta laughed out loud. I will do no such thing. You're the one who stole the mask. The police are arriving Senora Alvarez, Sienna interrupted loudly. Me despias, ma non le abbiamo detto la verita. Langdon did a double take. What is Sienna doing? He had understood her words. Mrs. Alvarez, I'm sorry, but we have not been honest with you. Marta looked equally startled by Sienna's words, although much of her shock seemed to be over the fact that Sienna was suddenly speaking fluent, unaccented Italian. Inanzitato, non sono la sorella di Robert Langdon, Sienna declared in an apologetic tone. First off, I am not Robert Langdon's sister. Chapter 44 Marta Alvarez took an unsteady step backward and folded her arms, studying the young blonde woman before her. Me despias. Sienna continued, still speaking fluent Italian. Le abbiamo mentito su molte cose. We have lied to you about many things. The guard looked as perplexed as Marta, although he held his position. Sienna spoke rapidly now, still in Italian, telling Marta that she worked at a Florence hospital where Langdon had arrived the previous night with a bullet wound to the head. She explained that Langdon recalled nothing of the events that had brought him there and that he was as surprised by the security video as Marta had been. Show her your wound, Sienna ordered Langdon. When Marta saw the stitches beneath Langdon's matted hair, she sat down on the windowsill and held her face in her hands for several seconds. In the past ten minutes, Marta had learned not only that the Dante death mask had been stolen during her watch, but that the two thieves had been a respected American professor and her trusted Florentine colleague, who was now dead. Furthermore, the young Sienna Brooks, whom Marta had imagined to be the white-eyed American sister of Robert Langdon, turned out to be a doctor, admitting to a lie, and doing so in fluent Italian. Marta, Langdon said, his voice deep and understanding. I know it must be hard to believe, but I truly don't remember last night at all. I have no idea why Ignacio and I took the mask. Marta sensed from his eyes that he was telling the truth. I'll return the mask to you, Langdon said. You have my word. But I can't retrieve it unless you let us go. The situation is complicated. You need to let us go, right away. Despite wanting the priceless mask returned, Marta had no intention of letting anyone go. Where are the police? She looked down at the lone police car in the Piazza della Signoria. It seemed strange that the officers had not yet reached the museum. 
Marta also heard a strange buzzing noise in the distance it sounded like someone was using a power saw. And it was getting louder. What is that? Langdon's tone was beseeching now. Marta, you know Ignacio. He would never have removed the mask without a good reason. There's a bigger picture here. The owner of the mask, Bertrand Zabrist, was a very confused man. We think he may be involved in something terrible. I don't have time to explain it all, but I'm begging you to trust us. Marta could only stare. None of this seemed to make any sense at all. Mrs. Alvarez, Sienna said, fixing Marta with a stony look. If you care about your future, and that of your baby, then you need to let us leave, right now. Marta folded her hands protectively across her abdomen, not at all pleased by the veiled threat to her unborn child. The high-pitched buzz outside was definitely getting louder, and when Marta peered out the window, she couldn't see the source of the noise, but she did see something else. The guard saw it, too, his eyes widening. Down in the Piazza della Signoria, the crowds had parted to make way for a long line of police cars that were arriving without sirens, led by two black vans, which now skidded to a stop outside the palace doors. Soldiers in black uniforms jumped out, carrying large guns, and ran into the palace. Marta felt a surge of fear. Who the hell is that? The security guard looked equally alarmed. The high-pitched buzzing sound grew suddenly piercing and Marta withdrew in distress as she glimpsed a small helicopter rising into view just outside the window. The machine hovered no more than ten yards away, almost as if it were staring in at the people in the room. It was a small craft, maybe a yard long, with a long black cylinder mounted on the front. The cylinder was pointed directly at them. It's going to shoot. Sienna shouted. Sta perspirare. Everybody down. To Diatera. She dropped to her knees beneath the windowsill, and Marta went cold with terror as she instinctively followed suit. The guard dropped down, too, reflexively aiming his gun at the little machine. From Marta's awkward crouch below the windowsill, she could see that Langdon was still standing, staring at Sienna with an odd look, clearly not believing there was any danger. Sienna was on the ground for only an instant before she bounded back up grabbed Langdon by the wrist, and began pulling him in the direction of the hallway. An instant later, they were fleeing together toward the main entrance of the building. The guard spun on his knees and crouched like a sniper raising his weapon down the hallway in the direction of the departing duo. Non speri. Marta ordered him. Non possono scapare. Don't shoot. They can't possibly escape. Langdon and Sienna disappeared around a corner and Marta knew it would be only a matter of seconds before the duo collided with the authorities coming in the other way. Faster. Sienna urged, rushing with Langdon back the way they'd come in. She was hoping they could make it to the main entrance before running into the police head-on, but she now realized the chances of this were close to zero. Langdon apparently had similar doubts. Without warning, he skidded to a full stop in a wide intersection of hallways. We'll never make it out this way. Come on. Sienna motioned urgently for him to follow. Robert, we can't just stand here. Langdon seemed distracted, gazing to his left, down a short corridor that appeared to dead end in a small, dimly lit chamber. The walls of the room were covered with antique maps, and at the center of the room stood a massive iron globe. Langdon eyed the huge metal sphere and began nodding slowly, and then more vigorously. This way, Langdon declared, dashing off toward the iron globe. Robert. Sienna followed against her better judgment. The corridor clearly led deeper into the museum, away from the exit. Robert, she gasped, finally catching up to him. Where are you taking us? Through Armenia, he replied. What? Armenia, Langdon repeated, his eyes dead ahead. Trust me. One story below, hidden among frightened tourists on the balcony of the Hall of the 500, Vayantha kept her head down as Bruder's SRS team thundered past her into the museum. Downstairs, the sound of slamming doors resonated through the hall as police sealed the area. If Langdon were indeed here, 
he was trapped. Unfortunately, Vayantha was, too. Chapter 45 With its warm oak wainscoting and coffered wooden ceilings, the Hall of Geographical Maps feels a world away from the stark stone and plaster interior of the Palazzo Vecchio. Originally the building's cloakroom, this grand space contains dozens of closets and cabinets once used to store the portable assets of the Grand Duke. On this day, the walls were adorned with maps 53 illuminations hand-painted on leather depicting the world as it was known in the 1550s. The hall's dramatic collection of cartography is dominated by the presence of a massive globe that stands in the center of the room. Known as the Mundi. The six-foot-tall sphere had been the largest rotating globe of its era and was said to spin almost effortlessly with just the touch of a finger. Today the globe serves as more of a final stop for tourists who have threaded their way through the long succession of gallery rooms and reached a dead end, where they circle the globe and depart the way they came. Langdon and Siena arrived breathless in the Hall of Maps. Before them, the Mappa Mundi rose majestically, but Langdon didn't even glance at it his eyes moving instead to the outer walls of the room. We need to find Armenia. Langdon said. The map of Armenia. Clearly nonplussed by his request, Sienna hurried off to the room's right-hand wall in search of a map of Armenia. Langdon immediately began a similar search along the left-hand wall, tracing his way around the perimeter of the room. Arabia, Spain, Greece. Each country was portrayed in remarkable detail considering that the drawings had been made more than 500 years ago, at a time when much of the world had yet to be mapped or explored. Where is Armenia? Compared to his usually vivid eidetic memories, Langdon's recollections of his secret passages tour here several years ago felt cloudy, due in no small part to the second glass of Gaja Nebbiolo he'd enjoyed with lunch prior to the tour. Fittingly, the word Nebbiolo meant little fog. Even so, Langdon now distinctly recalled being shown a single map in this room Armenia a map that possessed a unique property. I know it's in here, Langdon thought, continuing to scan the seemingly endless line of maps. Armenia. Sienna announced. Over here. Langdon spun toward where she was standing in the deep right-hand corner of the room. He rushed over, and Sienna pointed to the map of Armenia with an expression that seemed to say, we found Armenia so what? Langdon knew they didn't have time for explanations. Instead, he simply reached out, grabbed the map's massive wooden frame, and heaved it toward him. The entire map swung into the room, along with a large section of the wall and wainscoting, revealing a hidden passageway. All right, then, Sienna said, sounding impressed. Armenia it is. Without hesitation, Sienna hurried through the opening, moving fearlessly into the dim space beyond. Langdon followed her and quickly pulled the wall closed behind them. Despite his foggy recollections of the secret passages tour, Langdon recalled this passageway clearly. He and Sienna had just passed, as it were, through the looking glass into the Palazzo Invisibile the clandestine world that existed behind the walls of the Palazzo Vecchio a secret domain that had been accessible solely to the then reigning duke and those closest to him. Langdon paused a moment inside the doorway and took in their new surroundings a pale stone hallway lit only by faint natural light that filtered through a series of leaded windows. The passageway descended fifty yards or so to a wooden door. He turned now to his left where a narrow ascending staircase was blocked by a chain swag. A sign above the stairs warned, Usita Vidita. Langdon headed for the stairs. No. Sienna warned. It says no exit. Thanks, Langdon said with a wry smile. I can read the Italian. He unhooked the chain swag, carried it back to the secret door and quickly used it to immobilize the rotating wall threading the chain through the door handle and around a nearby fixture so the door could not be pulled open from the other side. Oh, Sienna said sheepishly. Good thinking. It won't keep them out for long, Langdon said. But we won't need much time. Follow me. When the map of Armenia finally crashed open, Agent Bruder and his men streamed down the narrow corridor in pursuit, heading for the wooden door at the far end. When they burst through, Bruder felt a blast of cold air hit him head-on, and was momentarily blinded by bright sunlight. 
he had arrived on an exterior walkway, which threaded along the rooftop of the palazzo. His eye traced the path, which led directly to another door, some fifty yards away, and re-entered the building. Bruder glanced to the left of the walkway, where the high, vaulted roof of the Hall of the Five Hundred rose like a mountain. Impossible to traverse. Bruder turned now to his right, where the walkway was bordered by a sheer cliff that plummeted down into a deep light well. Instant death. His eyes refocused straight ahead. This way. Bruder and his men dashed along the walkway toward the second door while the surveillance drone circled like a vulture overhead. When Bruder and his men burst through the doorway, they all slid to an abrupt stop, nearly piling up on one another. They were standing in a tiny stone chamber that had no exit other than the door through which they had just come. A lone wooden desk stood against the wall. Overhead, the grotesque figures depicted in the chamber's ceiling frescoes seemed to stare down at them mockingly. It was a dead end. One of Bruder's men hurried over and scanned the informational placard on the wall. Hold on, he said. This says there's a fenestra in here some kind of secret window. Bruder looked around but saw no secret window. He marched over and read the placard himself. Apparently this space had once been the private study of Duchess Bianca Capello and included a secret window una fenestra segrata through which Bianca could covertly watch her husband deliver speeches down below in the Hall of the Five Hundred. Bruder's eyes searched the room again now locating a small lattice-covered opening discreetly hidden in the side wall. Did they escape through there? He stalked over and examined the opening, which appeared to be too small for someone of Langdon's size to get through. Bruder pressed his face to the grid and peered through, confirming for certain that nobody had escaped this way, on the other side of the lattice was a sheer drop, straight down several stories, to the floor of the Hall of the Five Hundred. So where the hell did they go? As Bruder turned back into the tiny stone chamber, he felt all of the day's frustration mounting within him. In a rare moment of unrestrained emotion, Agent Bruder threw back his head and let out a bellow of rage. The noise was deafening in the tiny space. Far below, in the Hall of the Five Hundred, tourists and police officers all spun and stared up at the latticed opening high on the wall. From the sounds of things, the Duchess's secret study was now being used to cage a wild animal. Sienna Brooks and Robert Langdon stood in total darkness. Minutes earlier, Sienna had watched Langdon cleverly use the chain to seal the rotating map of Armenia, then turn and flee. To her surprise, however, instead of heading down the corridor, Langdon had gone up the steep staircase that had been marked us at Avidita. Robert, she whispered in confusion. The sign said no exit. And besides, I thought we wanted to go down. We do, Langdon said, glancing over his shoulder. But sometimes you need to go up, to go down. He gave her an encouraging wink. Remember Satan's navel. What is he talking about? Sienna bounded after him, feeling lost. Did you ever read Inferno? Langdon asked. Yes but I think I was seven. An instant later, it dawned on her. Oh, Satan's navel, she said. Now I remember. It had taken a moment, but Sienna now realized that Langdon was referring to the finale of Dante's Inferno. In these cantos, in order to escape hell, Dante has to climb down the hairy stomach of the massive Satan, and when he reaches Satan's navel the alleged center of the earth the earth's gravity suddenly switches directions, and Dante, in order to continue climbing down to purgatory, suddenly has to start climbing up. Sienna remembered little of the inferno other than her disappointment in witnessing the absurd actions of gravity at the center of the earth, apparently Dante's genius did not include a grasp of the physics of vector forces. They reached the top of the stairs, and Langdon opened the lone door they found there, on it was written, Sala dei modelli di architetura. Langdon ushered her inside, closing and bolting the door behind them. The room was small and plain, containing a series of cases that displayed wooden models of Vasari's architectural designs for the interior of the palazzo. Sienna barely noticed the models. She did, however, notice that the room had no doors, no windows, and, as advertised, no exit. 
In the mid-1300s, Langdon whispered, the Duke of Athens assumed power in the palace and built this secret escape route in case he was attacked. It's called the Duke of Athens Stairway, and it descends to a tiny escape hatch on a side street. If we can get there, nobody will see us exit. He pointed to one of the models. Look. See it there on the side. He brought me up here to show me models. Sienna shot an anxious glance at the miniature and saw the secret staircase descending all the way from the top of the palace down to street level, stealthily hidden between the inner and outer walls of the building. I can see the stairs, Robert, Sienna said testily, but they are on the complete opposite side of the palace. We'll never get over there. A little faith, he said with a lopsided grin. A sudden crash emanating from downstairs told them that the map of Armenia had just been breached. They stood stone still as they listened to the footfalls of soldiers departing down the corridor, none of them ever thinking that their quarry would climb higher still, especially up a tiny staircase marked no exit. When the sounds below had subsided, Langdon strode with confidence across the exhibit room, snaking through the displays, heading directly for what looked like a large cupboard in the far wall. The cupboard was about one yard square and positioned three feet off the floor. Without hesitation, Langdon grabbed the handle and heaved open the door. Sienna recoiled with surprise. The space within appeared to be a cavernous void, as if the cupboard door were a portal into another world. Beyond was only blackness. Follow me, Langdon said. He grabbed a lone flashlight that was hanging on the wall beside the opening. Then, with surprising agility and strength, the professor hoisted himself up through the opening and disappeared into the rabbit hole. Chapter 46 L.A. Safita, Langdon thought. The most dramatic attic on earth. The air inside the void smelled musty and ancient, as if centuries of plaster dust had now become so fine and light that it refused to settle and instead hung suspended in the atmosphere. The vast space creaked and groaned, giving Langdon the sense that he had just climbed into the belly of a living beast. Once he had found solid footing on a broad horizontal truss cord, he raised his flashlight letting the beam pierce the darkness. Spreading out before him was a seemingly endless tunnel, crisscrossed by a wooden web of triangles and rectangles formed by the intersections of posts, beams, cords, and other structural elements that made up the invisible skeleton of the Hall of the Five Hundred. This enormous attic space was one Langdon had viewed during his Nebiolofogged secret passages tour a few years ago. The cupboard-like viewing window had been cut in the wall of the architectural model room so visitors could inspect the models of the truss work and then peer through the opening with a flashlight and see the real thing. Now that Langdon was actually inside the garret, he was surprised by how much the truss architecture resembled that of an old New England barn traditional king post and strut assembly with Jupiter's arrow point connections. Sienna had also climbed through the opening and now steadied herself on the beam beside him, looking disoriented. Langdon swung the flashlight back and forth to show her the unusual landscape. From this end, the view down the length of the garret was like peering through a long line of isosceles triangles that telescoped into the distance, extending out towards some distant vanishing point. Beneath their feet, the garret had no floorboards, and its horizontal supporting beams were entirely exposed, resembling a series of massive railroad ties. Langdon pointed straight down the long shaft speaking in hushed tones. This space is directly over the hall of the 500. If we can get to the other end, I know how to reach the Duke of Athens stairway. Sienna cast a skeptical eye into the labyrinth of beams and supports that stretched before them. The only apparent way to advance through the garret would be to jump between the struts like kids on a train track. The struts were large each consisting of numerous beams strapped together with white iron clasps into a single powerful sheaf plenty large enough to balance on. The challenge, however, was that the separation between the struts was much too far to leap across safely. I can't possibly jump between those beams, Sienna whispered. Langdon doubted he could either, and falling would be certain death. He aimed the flashlight down through the open space between the struts. Eight feet below them, suspended by iron rods, hung a dusty horizontal expanse of floor of sorts which extended as far as they could see. Despite its appearance of solidity, 
Langdon knew the floor consisted primarily of stretched fabric covered in dust. This was the backside of the hall of the 500s suspended ceiling a sprawling expanse of wooden lacuners that framed 39 Vasari canvases, all mounted horizontally in a kind of patchwork quilt configuration. Sienna pointed down to the dusty expanse beneath them. Can we climb down there and walk across? Not unless you want to fall through a Vasari canvas into the hall of the 500. Actually, there's a better way, Langdon said calmly, not wanting to frighten her. He began moving down the strut toward the central backbone of the garret. On his previous visit, in addition to peering through the viewing window in the room of architectural models, Langdon had explored the garret on foot, entering through a doorway at the other end of the attic. If his wine-impaired memory served him, a sturdy boardwalk ran along the central spine of the garret, providing tourists access to a large viewing deck in the center of the space. However, when Langdon arrived at the center of the strut, he found a boardwalk that in no way resembled the one he recalled from his tour. How much Nebbiolo did I drink that day? Rather than a sturdy, tourist-worthy structure, he was looking at a hodgepodge of loose planks that had been laid perpendicularly across the beams to create a rudimentary catwalk more of a tightrope than a bridge. Apparently, the sturdy tourist walkway that originated at the other end extended only as far as the central viewing platform. From there, the tourists evidently retraced their steps. This jerry-rigged balance beam that Langdon and Sienna now faced was most likely installed so engineers could service the remaining attic space at this end. Looks like we're walking the plank, Langdon said, eyeing the narrow boards with uncertainty. Sienna shrugged, unfazed. No worse than Venice in flood season. Langdon realized she had a point. On his most recent research trip to Venice, St. Mark's Square had been under a foot of water, and he had walked from the Hotel Daniele to the Basilica on wooden planks propped between cinder blocks and inverted buckets. Of course, the prospect of possibly getting one's loafers wet was a far cry from that of plunging through a Renaissance masterpiece to one's death. Pushing the thought from his mind, Langdon stepped out onto the narrow board with a feigned self-assurance that he hoped would calm any worries Sienna might secretly be harboring. Nonetheless, despite his confident exterior, his heart was pounding as he moved across the first plank. As he neared the middle, the plank bowed beneath his weight, creaking ominously. He pressed on, faster now, finally reaching the other side and the relative safety of the second strut. Exhaling, Langdon turned to shine the light for Sienna and also offer any coaxing words she might need. She apparently needed none. As soon as his beam illuminated the plank, she was scheming along its length with remarkable dexterity. The board barely bent beneath her slender body, and within seconds she had joined him on the other side. Encouraged. Langdon turned back and headed out across the next plank. Sienna waited until he had crossed and could turn around and shine the light for her, and then she followed, staying right with him. Settling into a steady rhythm, they pressed on two figures moving one after the other by the light of a single flashlight. From somewhere beneath them, the sound of police walkie-talkies crackled up through the thin ceiling. Langdon permitted himself a faint smile. We're hovering above the hall of the 500, weightless and invisible. So, Robert, Sienna whispered. You said Ignazio told you where to find the mask. He did, but in a kind of code. Langdon quickly explained that Ignazio had apparently not wanted to blurt out the mask's location on the answering machine, and so he had shared the information in a more cryptic manner. He referenced Paradise which I assume is an allusion to the final section of the Divine Comedy. His exact words were, Paradise 25. Sienna glanced up. He must mean Canto 25. I agree, Langdon said. A canto was the rough equivalent of a chapter, the word hearkening back to the oral tradition of singing epic poems. The Divine Comedy contained precisely 100 cantos in all, divided into three sections. Inferno 134 Purgatorio 133 Paradiso 133 Paradise 25, Langdon thought, wishing his eidetic memory were strong enough to recall the entire text. Not even close we need to find a copy of the text. There's more, Langdon continued. The last thing Ignazio said to me was, 
the gates are open to you, but you must hurry. He paused, glancing back at Siena. Canto 25 probably makes reference to a specific location here in Florence. Apparently, some place with gates. Siena frowned. But this city probably has dozens of gates. Yes, which is why we need to read Canto 25 of Paradise. He gave her a hopeful smile. You don't, by any chance, know the entire Divine Comedy by heart, do you? She gave him a dumb look. Fourteen thousand lines of archaic Italian that I read as a kid. She shook her head. You're the one with the freakish memory, Professor. I'm just a doctor. As they pressed on, Langdon found it sad somehow that Sienna, even after all they'd been through together, apparently still preferred to withhold the truth about her exceptional intellect. She's just a doctor. Langdon had to chuckle. Most humble doctor on earth, he thought, recalling the clippings he'd read about her special skills skills that, unfortunately but not surprisingly, did not include total recall of one of history's longest epic poems. In silence, they continued on, crossing several more beams. Finally, up ahead Langdon saw a hardening shape in the darkness. The viewing platform. The precarious planking on which they were walking led directly to a much sturdier structure with guardrails. If they climbed onto the platform, they could continue on along the walkway until they exited the garret through a doorway, which, as Langdon recalled, was very close to the Duke of Athens' stairway. As they neared the platform, Langdon glanced down at the ceiling suspended eight feet below. So far all the lunettes beneath them had been similar. The upcoming lunette, however, was massive far larger than the others. The apotheosis of Cosimo I, Langdon mused. This vast, circular lunette was Vasari's most precious painting the central lunette in the entire Hall of the 500. Langdon often showed slides of this work to his students pointing out its similarities to the apotheosis of Washington in the U.S. Capitol a humble reminder that fledgling America had adopted far more from Italy than merely the concept of a republic. Today, however, Langdon was more interested in hurrying past the apotheosis than in studying it. As he hastened his pace, he turned his head ever so slightly to whisper back to Siena that they were nearly there. As he did so, his right foot missed the center of the plank and his borrowed loafer landed half off the edge. His ankle rolled, and Langdon lurched forward, half stumbling, half running, trying to make a quick stutter step to regain his balance. But it was too late. His knees hit the plank hard, and his hands strained desperately forward, trying to reach the crossing strut. The flashlight went clattering into the dark space beneath them, landing on the canvas, which caught it like a net. Langdon's legs pumped, barely propelling him to safety on the next strut as the plank fell away beneath him, landing with a crash eight feet below on the wooden lacunar surrounding the canvas of Vasari's apotheosis. The sound echoed through the garret. Horrified, Langdon scrambled to his feet and turned back toward Siena. In the dim glow of the abandoned flashlight, which lay on the canvas below, Langdon could see that Siena was standing on the strut behind him now trapped, with no way across. Her eyes conveyed what Langdon already knew. The noise of the falling plank had almost certainly given them away. Vayantha's eyes bolted upward to the ornate ceiling. Rats in the attic, the man with the camcorder joked nervously as the sound reverberated down. Big rats, Vayantha thought, gazing up at the circular painting in the center of the hall ceiling. A small cloud of dust was now filtering down from between the lacuners, and Vayantha could swear she saw a slight bulge in the canvas, almost as if someone were pushing on it from the other side. Maybe one of the officers dropped his gun off the viewing platform, the man said, eyeing the lump in the painting. What do you think they're looking for? All this activity is very exciting. A viewing platform? Vayantha demanded. People can actually go up there. Sure. He motioned to the museum entrance. Just inside that door is a door that leads up to a catwalk in the attic. You can see Vasari's truss work. It's incredible. Bruder's voice suddenly echoed again across the hall of the 500. So where the hell did they go? His words, 
like his anguished yell a little earlier, had emanated from behind a lattice grate positioned high on the wall to Vayantha's left. Bruder was apparently in a room behind the grate, a full story beneath the room's ornate ceiling. Vayantha's eyes climbed again to the bulge in the canvas overhead. Rats in the attic, she thought. Trying to find a way out. She thanked the man with the camcorder and drifted quickly toward the museum entrance. The door was closed, but with all the officers running in and out, she suspected that it was unlocked. Sure enough, her instincts were correct. Chapter 47 Outside in the piazza, amid the chaos of arriving police, a middle-aged man stood in the shadows of the Loggia Dei Lanzi, where he had been observing the activity with great interest. The man wore plume Paris spectacles, a paisley necktie, and a tiny gold stud in one ear. As he watched the commotion, he caught himself scratching at his neck again. The man had developed a rash overnight, which seemed to be getting worse, manifesting in small pustules on his jawline, neck, cheeks, and over his eyes. When he glanced down at his fingernails, he saw they were bloody. He took out his handkerchief and wiped his fingers, also dabbing the bloody pustules on his neck and cheeks. When he had cleaned himself up, he returned his gaze to the two black vans parked outside the palazzo. The closest van contained two people in the back seat. One was an armed soldier in black. The other was an older, but very beautiful silver-haired woman wearing a blue amulet. The soldier looked as if he were preparing a hypodermic syringe. Inside the van, Dr. Elizabeth Sinsky gazed absently out at the palazzo, wondering about how this crisis had deteriorated to such an extent. Ma'am, a deep voice said beside her. She turned groggily to the soldier accompanying her. He was gripping her forearm and holding up a syringe. Just be still. The sharp stab of a needle pierced her flesh. The soldier completed the injection. Now go back to sleep. As she closed her eyes, she could have sworn she saw a man studying her from the shadows. He wore designer glasses and a preppy necktie. His face was rashy and red. For a moment she thought she knew him, but when she opened her eyes for another look, the man had disappeared. Chapter 48 In the darkness of the garret, Langdon and Sienna were now separated by a twenty-foot expanse of open air. Eight feet beneath them, the fallen plank had come to rest across the wooden framing that supported the canvas bearing Vasari's apotheosis. The large flashlight, still glowing, was resting on the canvas itself, creating a small indentation, like a stone on a trampoline. The plank behind you, Langdon whispered. Can you drag it across to reach this strut? Sienna eyed the plank. Not without the other end falling into the canvas. Langdon had feared as much, the last thing they needed now was to send a two by six crashing through a Vasari canvas. I've got an idea, Sienna said, now moving sideways along the strut, heading for the sidewall. Langdon followed on his beam, the footing becoming more treacherous with each step as they ventured away from the flashlight beam. By the time they reached the side wall, they were almost entirely in darkness. Down there, Sienna whispered, pointing into the obscurity below them. At the edge of the frame. It's got to be mounted to the wall. It should hold me. Before Langdon could protest, Sienna was climbing down off the strut, using a series of supporting beams as a ladder. She eased herself down onto the edge of the wooden lacuner. It creaked once but held. Then, inching along the wall, Sienna began moving in Langdon's direction as if she were inching across the ledge of a high building. The lacuner creaked again. Thin ice, Langdon thought. Stay near shore. As Sienna reached the halfway point, approaching the strut on which he stood in the darkness, Langdon felt a sudden renewed hope that they might indeed get out of here in time. Suddenly, somewhere in the darkness ahead, a door slammed and he heard fast-moving footsteps approaching along the walkway. The beam of a flashlight now appeared, sweeping the area, getting closer every second. Langdon felt his hopes sink. Someone was coming their way moving along the main walkway and cutting off their escape route. Sienna, keep going, he whispered, reacting on instinct. Continue the entire length of the wall. 
There's an exit at the far end. I'll run interference. No. Sienna whispered urgently. Robert, come back. But Langdon was already on the move, heading back along the strut toward the central spine of the garret, leaving Sienna in the darkness, inching across the sidewall, eight feet below him. When Langdon arrived at the center of the garret, a faceless silhouette with a flashlight had just arrived on the raised viewing platform. The person halted at the low guardrail and aimed the flashlight beam down into Langdon's eyes. The glare was blinding, and Langdon immediately raised his arms in surrender. He could not have felt more vulnerable balanced high above the hall of the 500, blinded by a bright light. Langdon waited for a gunshot or for an authoritative command, but there was only silence. After a moment the beam swung away from his face and began probing the darkness behind him, apparently looking for something, or someone else. As the beam left his eyes, Langdon could just make out the silhouette of the person now blocking his escape route. It was a woman, lean and dressed all in black. He had no doubt that beneath her baseball cap was a head of spiked hair. Langdon's muscles tightened instinctively as his mind flooded with images of Dr. Marconi dying on the hospital floor. She found me. She's here to finish the job. Langdon flashed on an image of Greek free divers swimming deep into a tunnel, far past the point of no return, and then colliding with a stony dead end. The assassin swung her flashlight beam back down into Langdon's eyes. Mr. Langdon, she whispered. Where is your friend? Langdon felt a chill. This killer is here for both of us. Langdon made a show of glancing away from Sienna, over his shoulder into the darkness from which they'd come. She has nothing to do with this. You want me? Langdon prayed that Sienna was now making progress along the wall. If she could sneak beyond the viewing platform, she could then quietly cross back to the central boardwalk, behind the spike-haired woman, and move toward the door. The assassin again raised her light and scanned the empty garret behind him. With the glare momentarily out of his eyes, Langdon caught a sudden glimpse of a form in the darkness behind her. Oh God, no! Sienna was indeed making her way across a strut in the direction of the central boardwalk, but unfortunately, she was only ten yards behind their attacker. Sienna, no. You're too close. She'll hear you. The beam returned to Langdon's eyes again. Listen carefully, Professor, the assassin whispered. If you want to live, I suggest you trust me. My mission has been terminated. I have no reason to harm you. You and I are on the same team now, and I may know how to help you. Langdon was barely listening, his thoughts focused squarely on Sienna, who was now faintly visible in profile, climbing deftly up onto the walkway behind the viewing platform, entirely too close to the woman with the gun. Run! He willed her. Get the hell out of here! Sienna, however, to Langdon's alarm, held her ground, crouching low in the shadows and watching in silence. Vayantha's eyes probed the darkness behind Langdon. Where the hell did she go? Did they separate? Vayantha had to find a way to keep the fleeing couple out of Bruder's hands. It's my only hope. Sienna. Vayantha ventured in a throaty whisper. If you can hear me, listen carefully. You do not want to be captured by the men downstairs. They will not be lenient. I know an escape route. I can help you. Trust me. Trust you. Langdon challenged, his voice suddenly loud enough that anyone nearby could hear him. You're a killer. Sienna is nearby, Vayantha realized. Langdon is talking to her, trying to warn her. Vayantha tried again. Sienna, the situation is complicated, but I can get you out of here. Consider your options. You're trapped. You have no choice. She has a choice, Langdon called out loudly. And she's smart enough to run as far from you as possible. Everything's changed, Vayantha insisted. I have no reason to hurt either of you. You killed Dr. Marconi. And I'm guessing you're also the one who shot me in the head. Vayantha knew that the man was never going to believe she had no intention of killing him. The time for talking is over. 
there's nothing I can say to convince him. Without hesitation, she reached into her leather jacket and extracted the silenced handgun. Motionless in the shadows, Cien remained crouched on the walkway no more than ten yards behind the woman who had just confronted Langdon. Even in the dark, the woman's silhouette was unmistakable. To Sienna's horror, she was brandishing the same weapon she had used on Dr. Marconi. She's going to fire, Sienna knew, sensing the woman's body language. Sure enough, the woman took two threatening steps toward Langdon, stopping at the low railing that enclosed the viewing platform above Vasari's apotheosis. The assassin was now as close to Langdon as she could get. She raised the gun and pointed it directly at Langdon's chest. This will only hurt for an instant, she said, but it's my only choice. Sienna reacted on instinct. The unexpected vibration in the boards beneath Vayantha's feet was just enough to cause her to turn slightly as she was firing. Even as her weapon discharged, she knew it was no longer pointed at Langdon. Something was approaching behind her. Approaching fast. Vayantha spun in place, swinging her weapon 180 degrees toward her attacker, and a flash of blonde hair glinted in the darkness as someone collided with Vayantha at full speed. The gun hissed again, but the person had crouched below barrel level in order to apply a forceful upward body check. Vayantha's feet left the floor and her midsection crashed hard into the low railing of the viewing platform. As her torso was propelled out over the railing, she flailed her arms trying to grab onto anything to stop her fall, but it was too late. She went over the edge. Vayantha fell through the darkness, bracing herself for the collision with the dusty floor that lay eight feet beneath the platform. Strangely, though, her landing was softer than she'd imagined, as if she had been caught by a cloth hammock, which now sagged beneath her weight. Disoriented, Vayantha lay on her back and stared up at her attacker. Sienna Brooks was looking down at her over the railing. Stunned, Vayantha opened her mouth to speak, but suddenly, just beneath her, there was a loud ripping sound. The cloth that was supporting her weight tore open. Vayantha was falling again. This time she fell for three very long seconds, during which she found herself staring upward at a ceiling that was covered with beautiful paintings. The painting directly above her a massive circular canvas depicting Cosimo I encircled by cherubs on a heavenly cloud now showed a jagged dark tear that cut through its center. Then, with a sudden crash, Vayantha's entire world vanished into blackness. High above, frozen in disbelief, Robert Langdon peered through the torn apotheosis into the cavernous space below. On the stone floor of the Hall of the Five Hundred, the spike-haired woman lay motionless, a dark pool of blood quickly spreading from her head. She still had the gun clutched in her hand. Langdon raised his eyes to Sienna, who was also staring down, transfixed by the grim scene below. Sienna's expression was one of utter shock. I didn't mean to, you reacted on instinct, Langdon whispered. She was about to kill me. From down below, shouts of alarm filtered up through the torn canvas. Gently. Langdon guided Sienna away from the railing. We need to keep moving. Chapter 49 In the secret study of Duchess Bianca Capello, Agent Bruder had heard a sickening thud followed by a growing commotion in the Hall of the Five Hundred. He rushed to the grate in the wall and peered through it. The scene on the elegant stone floor below took him several seconds to process. The pregnant museum administrator had arrived beside him at the grate, immediately covering her mouth in mute terror at the sight below a crumpled figure surrounded by panicked tourists. As the woman's gaze shifted slowly upward to the ceiling of the Hall of the Five Hundred, she let out a pained whimper. Bruder looked up, following her gaze to a circular ceiling panel a painted canvas with a large tear across the center. He turned to the woman. How do we get up there? At the other end of the building, Langdon and Sienna descended breathlessly from the attic and burst through a doorway. Within a matter of seconds, Langdon had found the small alcove, deftly hidden behind a crimson curtain. He had recalled it clearly from his secret passages tour. The Duke of Athens stairway. The sound of running footsteps and shouting seemed to be coming from all directions now, and Langdon knew their time was short. He pulled aside the curtain 
and he and Sienna slipped through onto a small landing. Without a word, they began to descend the stone staircase. The passage had been designed as a series of frighteningly narrow switchback stairs. The deeper they went, the tighter it seemed to get. Just as Langdon felt as if the walls were moving in to crush him, thankfully, they could go no farther. Ground level. The space at the bottom of the stairs was a tiny stone chamber, and although its exit had to be one of the smallest doors on earth, it was a welcome sight. Only about four feet high, the door was made of heavy wood with iron rivets and a heavy interior bowl to keep people out. I can hear street sounds beyond the door, Sienna whispered, still looking shaken. What's on the other side? The Via della Nina, Langdon replied, picturing the crowded pedestrian walkway. But there may be police. They won't recognize us. They'll be looking for a blonde girl and a dark-haired man. Langdon eyed her strangely. Which is precisely what we are, Sienna shook her head, a melancholy resolve crossing her face. I didn't want you to see me like this, Robert, but unfortunately it's what I look like at the moment. Abruptly, Sienna reached up and grabbed a handful of her blonde hair. Then she yanked down, and all of her hair slid off in a single motion. Langdon recoiled, startled both by the fact that Sienna wore a wig and by her altered appearance without it. Sienna Brooks was in fact totally bald, her bare scalp smooth and pale, like a cancer patient undergoing chemotherapy. On top of it all, she's ill? I know, she said. Long story. Now bent down. She held up the wig clearly intending to put it on Langdon's head. Is she serious? Langdon half-heartedly bent over, and Sienna wedged the blonde hair onto his head. The wig barely fit, but she arranged it as best as she could. Then she stepped back and assessed him. Not quite satisfied, she reached up, loosened his tie, and slipped the loop up onto his forehead, retightening it like a bandana and securing the ill-fitting wig to his head. Sienna now set to work on herself, rolling up her pant legs and pushing her socks down around her ankles. When she stood up, she had a sneer on her lips. The lovely Sienna Brooks was now a punk rock skinhead. The former Shakespearean actress's transformation was startling. Remember, she said, 90% of personal recognition is body language, so when you move, move like an aging rocker. Aging, I can do. Langdon thought. Rocker, I'm not so sure. Before Langdon could argue the point, Sienna had unbolted the tiny door and swung it open. She ducked low and exited onto the crowded cobblestone street. Langdon followed, nearly on all fours as he emerged into the daylight. Aside from a few startled glances at the mismatched couple emerging from the tiny door in the foundation of Palazzo Vecchio, nobody gave them a second look. Within seconds, Langdon and Sienna were moving east, swallowed up by the crowd. The man in the plume Paris eyeglasses picked at his bleeding skin as he snaked through the crowd, keeping a safe distance behind Robert Langdon and Sienna Brooks. Despite their clever disguises, he had spotted them emerging from the tiny door on the Via della Nina and had immediately known who they were. He had tailed them only a few blocks before he got winded, his chest aching acutely forcing him to take shallow breaths. He felt like he'd been punched in the sternum. Gritting his teeth against the pain, he forced his attention back to Langdon and Siena as he continued to follow them through the streets of Florence. Chapter 50 The morning sun had fully risen now, casting long shadows down the narrow canyons that snaked between the buildings of old Florence. Shopkeepers had begun throwing open the metal grates that protected their shops and bars, and the air was heavy with the aromas of morning espresso and freshly baked cornetti. Despite a gnawing hunger, Langdon kept moving. I've got to find the mask, and see what's hidden on the back. As Langdon led Sienna northward along the slender Via Dei Leone, he was having a hard time getting used to the sight of her bald head. Her radically altered appearance reminded him that he barely knew her. They were moving in the direction of Piazza del Duomo the square where Ignazio Busoni had been found dead after placing his final phone call. Robert, Ignazio had managed to say, breathless. What you seek is safely hidden. The gates are open to you, but you must hurry. 
Paradise 25. God's Speed. Paradise 25, Langdon repeated to himself, still puzzled that Ignazio Busoni had recalled Dante's text well enough to reference a specific canto off the top of his head. Something about that canto was apparently memorable to Busoni. Whatever it was, Langdon knew he would find out soon enough, as soon as he laid his hands on a copy of the text, which he could easily do at any number of locations up ahead. His shoulder-length wig was beginning to itch now, and though he felt somewhat ridiculous in his disguise, he had to admit that Siena's impromptu styling had been an effective ruse. Nobody had given them a second look, not even the police reinforcements who had just rushed past them en route to the Palazzo Vecchio. Siena had been walking in total silence beside him for several minutes, and Langdon glanced over to make sure she was okay. She seemed miles away, probably trying to accept the fact that she had just killed the woman who had been chasing them. Lyra for your thoughts, he ventured lightly, hoping to pull her mind from the image of the spike-haired woman lying dead on the palazzo floor. Sienna emerged slowly from her contemplations. I was thinking of Zabrist, she said slowly. Trying to recall anything else I might know about him. And? She shrugged. Most of what I know is from a controversial essay he wrote a few years ago. It really stayed with me. Among the medical community, it instantly went viral. She winced. Sorry, bad choice of words. Langdon gave a grim chuckle. Go on. His essay essentially declared that the human race was on the brink of extinction, and that unless we had a catastrophic event that precipitously decreased global population growth, our species would not survive another hundred years. Langdon turned and stared at her. A single century. It was a pretty stark thesis. The predicted time frame was substantially shorter than previous estimates, but it was supported by some very potent scientific data. He made a lot of enemies by declaring that all doctors should stop practicing medicine because extending the human lifespan was only exacerbating the population problem. Langdon now understood why the article spread wildly through the medical community. Not surprisingly, Sienna continued. Zabrist was immediately attacked from all sides politicians, clergy, the World Health Organization all of whom derided him as a doomsayer lunatic who was simply trying to cause panic. They took particular umbrage at his statement that today's youth, if they chose to reproduce, would have offspring that literally would witness the end of the human race. Zabrist illustrated his point with a doomsday clock, which showed that if the entire span of human life on Earth were compressed into a single hour, we are now in its final seconds. I've actually seen that clock online, Langdon said. Yes, well, it's his, and it caused quite an uproar. The biggest backlash against Zabrist, however, came when he declared that his advances in genetic engineering would be far more helpful to mankind if they were used not to cure disease, but rather to create it. What? Yes. He argued that his technology should be used to limit population growth by creating hybrid strains of disease that our modern medicine would be unable to cure. Langdon felt a rising dread as his mind conjured images of strange, hybrid designer viruses that, once released, were totally unstoppable. Over a few short years, Sienna said, Zabrist went from being the toast of the medical world to being a total outcast. An anathema. She paused a look of compassion crossing her face. It's really no wonder he snapped and killed himself. Even sadder because his thesis is probably correct. Langdon almost fell over. I'm sorry you think he's right. Sienna gave him a solemn shrug. Robert, speaking from a purely scientific standpoint all logic, no heart I can tell you without a doubt that without some kind of drastic change, the end of our species is coming and it's coming fast. It won't be fire, brimstone, apocalypse, or nuclear war, it will be total collapse due to the number of people on the planet. The mathematics is indisputable. Langdon stiffened. I've studied a fair amount of biology, she said, and it's quite normal for a species to go extinct simply as a result of overpopulating its environment. Picture a colony of surface algae living in a tiny pond in the forest, enjoying the pond's perfect balance of nutrients. Unchecked, 
they reproduce so wildly that they quickly cover the pond's entire surface, blotting out the sun and thereby preventing the growth of the nutrients in the pond. Having sapped everything possible from their environment, the algae quickly die and disappear without a trace. She gave a heavy sigh. A similar fate could easily await mankind. Far sooner and faster than any of us imagine. Langdon felt deeply unsettled. But, that seems impossible. Not impossible, Robert, just unthinkable. The human mind has a primitive ego defense mechanism that negates all realities that produce too much stress for the brain to handle. It's called denial. I've heard of denial, Langdon quipped blithely, but I don't think it exists. Sienna rolled her eyes. Cute, but believe me, it's very real. Denial is a critical part of the human coping mechanism. Without it, we would all wake up terrified every morning about all the ways we could die. Instead, our minds block out our existential fears by focusing on stresses we can handle like getting to work on time or paying our taxes. If we have wider, existential fears, we jettison them very quickly, refocusing on simple tasks and daily trivialities. Langdon recalled a recent web tracking study of students at some Ivy League universities which revealed that even highly intellectual users displayed an instinctual tendency toward denial. According to the study, the vast majority of university students, after clicking on a depressing news article about Arctic ice melt or species extinction, would quickly exit that page in favor of something trivial that purged their minds of fear. Favorite choices included sports highlights, funny cat videos, and celebrity gossip. In ancient mythology, Langdon offered, a hero in denial is the ultimate manifestation of hubris and pride. No man is more prideful than he who believes himself immune to the dangers of the world. Dante clearly agreed, denouncing pride as the worst of the seven deadly sins, and punished the prideful in the deepest ring of the inferno. Sienna reflected a moment and then continued. Zabrist's article accused many of the world's leaders of being in extreme denial, putting their heads in the sand. He was particularly critical of the World Health Organization. I bet that went over well. They reacted by equating him with a religious zealot on a street corner holding a sign that says the end is near. Harvard Square has a couple of those. Yes, and we all ignore them because none of us can imagine it will happen. But believe me. Just because the human mind can't imagine something happening, doesn't mean it won't. You almost sound like you're a fan of Zobrists. I'm a fan of the truth, she replied forcefully, even if it's painfully hard to accept. Langdon fell silent, again feeling strangely isolated from Sienna at the moment, trying to understand her bizarre combination of passion and detachment. Sienna glanced over at him, her face softening. Robert. Look, I'm not saying Zobrist is correct that a plague that kills half the world's people is the answer to overpopulation. Nor am I saying we should stop curing the sick. What I am saying is that our current path is a pretty simple formula for destruction. Population growth is an exponential progression occurring within a system of finite space and limited resources. The end will arrive very abruptly. Our experience will not be that of slowly running out of gas it will be more like driving off a cliff. Langdon exhaled, trying to process everything he had just heard. Speaking of which, she added, somberly pointing up in the air to their right, I'm pretty sure that's where Zabrist jumped. Langdon glanced up and saw that they were just passing the austere stone facade of the Bargello Museum to their right. Behind it, the tapered spire of the Badia Tower rose above the surrounding structures. He stared at the top of the tower, wondering why Zobrist had jumped and hoped to hell it wasn't because the man had done something terrible and hadn't wanted to face what was coming. Critics of Zobrist, Sienna said, like to point out how paradoxical it is that many of the genetic technologies he developed are now extending life expectancy dramatically. Which only compounds the population problem. Exactly. Zobrist once said publicly that he wished he could put the genie back in the bottle and erase some of his contributions to human longevity. I suppose that makes sense ideologically. The longer we live, the more our resources go to supporting the elderly and ailing. Langdon nodded. 
I've read that in the US some 60% of healthcare costs go to support patients during the last six months of their lives. True, and while our brains say, this is insane, our hearts say, keep grandma alive as long as we can. Langdon nodded. It's the conflict between Apollo and Dionysus a famous dilemma in mythology. It's the age-old battle between mind and heart, which seldom want the same thing. The mythological reference, Langdon had heard, was now being used in AA meetings to describe the alcoholic who stares at a glass of alcohol, his brain knowing it will harm him, but his heart craving the comfort it will provide. The message apparently was, don't feel alone even the gods were conflicted. Who needs Agathusia? Sienna whispered suddenly. I'm sorry. Sienna glanced up. I finally remembered the name of Zabrist's essay. It was called, Who Needs Agathusia? Langdon had never heard the word Agathusia, but took his best guess based on its Greek roots Agathos and Thusia. Agathusia, would be a good sacrifice. Almost. Its actual meaning is a self-sacrifice for the common good. She paused. Otherwise known as benevolent suicide. Langdon had indeed heard this term before once in relation to a bankrupt father who killed himself so his family could collect his life insurance, and a second time to describe a remorseful serial killer who ended his life fearing he couldn't control his impulse to kill. The most chilling example Langdon recalled, however, was in the 1967 novel Logan's Run, which depicted a future society in which everyone gladly agreed to commit suicide at age 21 thus fully enjoying their youth while not letting their numbers or old age stress the planet's limited resources. If Langdon recalled correctly, the movie version of Logan's Run had increased the determination age from 21 to 30, no doubt in an attempt to make the film more palatable to the box office's crucial 18 to 25 demographic. So, Zabrist's essay, Langdon said. I'm not sure I understand the title. Who needs Agathusia? Was he saying it sarcastically? As in who needs benevolent suicide, we all do. Actually no, the title is a pun. Langdon shook his head, not seeing it. Who needs suicide as in the WHO the World Health Organization? In his essay, Zabrist railed against the director of the WHO Dr. Elizabeth Sinsky who has been there forever and, according to Zabrist, is not taking population control seriously. His article was saying that the WHO would be better off if director Sinsky killed herself. Compassionate guy. The perils of being a genius, I guess. Oftentimes, those special brains, the ones that are capable of focusing more intently than others, do so at the expense of emotional maturity. Langdon pictured the articles he had seen about the young Sienna, the child prodigy with the 208 IQ and off-the-chart intellectual function. Langdon wondered if, in talking about Zabrist, she was also, on some level, talking about herself, he also wondered how long she would choose to keep her secret. Up ahead, Langdon spotted the landmark he had been looking for. After crossing the Via Dei Leone, Langdon led her to the intersection of an exceptionally narrow street more of an alleyway. The sign overhead read via Dante Alieri. It sounds like you know a lot about the human brain, Langdon said. Was that your area of concentration in medical school? No, but when I was a kid, I read a lot. I became interested in brain science because I had some, medical issues. Langdon shot her a curious look, hoping she would continue. My brain, Sienna said quietly. It grew differently from most kids, and it caused some, problems. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was wrong with me, and in the process I learned a lot about neuroscience. She caught Langdon's eye. And yes, my baldness is related to my medical condition. Langdon averted his eyes, embarrassed he'd asked. Don't worry about it, she said. I've learned to live with it. As they moved into the cold air of the shadowed alleyway, Langdon considered everything he had just learned about Zabrist and his alarming philosophical positions. A recurring question nagged at him. These soldiers, Langdon began. The ones trying to kill us. Who are they? It makes no sense. If Zabrist has put a potential plague out there, 
wouldn't everyone be on the same side, working to stop its release? Not necessarily. Zabrist may be a pariah in the medical community, but he probably has a legion of devout fans of his ideology people who agree that a culling is a necessary evil to save the planet. For all we know, these soldiers are trying to ensure that Zabrist's vision is realized. Zabrist's own private army of disciples? Langdon considered the possibility. Admittedly, history was full of zealots and cults who killed themselves because of all kinds of crazy notions a belief that their leader is the Messiah, a belief that a spaceship is waiting for them behind the moon, a belief that Judgment Day is imminent. The speculation about population control was at least grounded in science, and yet something about these soldiers still didn't feel right to Langdon. I just can't believe that a bunch of trained soldiers would knowingly agree to kill innocent masses, all the while fearing they might get sick and die themselves. Sienna shot him a puzzled look. Robert, what do you think soldiers do when they go to war? They kill innocent people and risk their own death. Anything is possible when people believe in a cause. A cause? Releasing a plague. Sienna glanced at him, her brown eyes probing. Robert, the cause is not releasing a plague, it's saving the world. She paused. One of the passages in Bertrand Zabrist's essay that got a lot of people talking was a very pointed hypothetical question. I want you to answer it. What's the question? Zabrist asked the following, if you could throw a switch and randomly kill half the population on Earth, would you do it? Of course not. Okay. But what if you were told that if you didn't throw that switch right now, the human race would be extinct in the next hundred years? She paused. Would you throw it then? Even if it meant you might murder friends, family, and possibly even yourself? Sienna, I can't possibly it's a hypothetical question, she said. Would you kill half the population today in order to save our species from extinction? Langdon felt deeply disturbed by the macabre subject they were discussing, and so he was grateful to see a familiar red banner hanging on the side of a stone building just ahead. Look, he announced, pointing. We're here. Sienna shook her head. Like I said. Denial. Chapter 51 The Casa de Dante is located on the Via Santa Margarita and is easily identified by the large banner suspended from the stone facade partway up the alleyway. Museo Casa de Dante. Sienna eyed the banner with uncertainty. We're going to Dante's house. Not exactly, Langdon said. Dante lived around the corner. This is more of a Dante, museum. Langdon had ventured inside the place once, curious about the art collection, which turned out to be no more than reproductions of famous Dante-related works from around the world and yet it was interesting to see them all gathered together under one roof. Sienna looked suddenly hopeful. And you think they have an ancient copy of the Divine Comedy on display? Langdon chuckled. No, but I know they have a gift shop that sells huge posters with the entire text of Dante's Divine Comedy printed in microscopic type. She gave him a slightly appalled glance. I know. But it's better than nothing. The only problem is that my eyes are going, so you'll have to read the fine print. Ikaiusa, an old man called out, seeing them approach the door. Eil giorno di ripasso. Closed for the Sabbath? Langdon felt suddenly disoriented again. He looked at Sienna. Isn't today. Monday. She nodded. Florentines prefer a Monday Sabbath. Langdon groaned suddenly recalling the city's unusual weekly calendar. Because tourist dollars flowed most heavily on weekends, many Florentine merchants chose to move the Christian day of rest from Sunday to Monday to prevent the Sabbath from cutting too deeply into their bottom line. Unfortunately, Langdon realized, this probably also ruled out his other option, the paperback exchange one of Langdon's favorite Florentine bookshops which would definitely have had copies of the Divine Comedy on hand. Any other ideas? Sienna said. Langdon thought a long moment and finally nodded. There's a site just around the corner where Dante enthusiasts gather. I bet someone there has a copy we can borrow. It's probably closed, too, Sienna warned. 
almost every place in town moves the Sabbath away from Sunday. This place wouldn't dream of doing such a thing, Langdon replied with a smile. It's a church. Fifty yards behind them, lurking among the crowd, the man with the skin rash and gold earring leaned on a wall, savoring this chance to catch his breath. His breathing was not getting any better, and the rash on his face was nearly impossible to ignore, especially the sensitive skin just above his eyes. He took off his plume Paris glasses and gently rubbed his sleeve across his eye sockets, trying not to break the skin. When he replaced his glasses, he could see his quarry moving on. Forcing himself to follow, he continued after them, breathing as gently as possible. Several blocks behind Langdon and Siena, inside the hall of the 500, Agent Bruder stood over the broken body of the all-too-familiar spike-haired woman who was now lying sprawled out on the floor. He knelt down and retrieved her handgun, carefully removing the clip for safety before handing it off to one of his men. The pregnant museum administrator, Marta Alvarez, stood off to one side. She had just relayed to Bruder a brief but startling account of what had transpired with Robert Langdon since the previous night, including a single piece of information that Bruder was still trying to process. Langdon claims to have amnesia. Bruder pulled out his phone and dialed. The line at the other end rang three times before his boss answered, sounding distant and unsteady. Yes, Agent Bruder? Go ahead. Bruder spoke slowly to ensure that his every word was understood. We are still trying to locate Langdon and the girl, but there's been another development. Bruder paused. And if it's true, it changes everything. The provost paced his office, fighting the temptation to pour himself another scotch forcing himself to face this growing crisis head-on. Never in his career had he betrayed a client or failed to keep an agreement, and he most certainly had no intention of starting now. At the same time he suspected that he might have gotten himself tangled up in a scenario whose purpose diverged from what he had originally imagined. One year ago, the famous geneticist Bertrand Zabrist had come aboard the Mendacium and requested a safe haven in which to work. At that time the provost imagined that Zobrist was planning to develop a secret medical procedure whose patenting would increase Zobrist's vast fortune. It would not be the first time the consortium had been hired by paranoid scientists and engineers who preferred working in extreme isolation to prevent their valuable ideas from being stolen. With that in mind, the provost accepted the client and was not surprised when he learned that the people at the World Health Organization had begun searching for him. Nor did he give it a second thought when the director of the WHO herself Dr. Elizabeth Sinsky seemed to make it her personal mission to locate their client. The consortium has always faced powerful adversaries. As agreed, the consortium carried out their agreement with Zabrist, no questions asked, thwarting Sinsky's efforts to find him for the entire length of the scientist's contract. Almost the entire length. Less than a week before the contract was to expire, Sinsky had somehow located Zabrist in Florence and moved in, harassing and chasing him until he committed suicide. For the first time in his career, the provost had failed to provide the protection he had agreed to, and it haunted him, along with the bizarre circumstances of Zabrist's death. He committed suicide, rather than being captured. What the hell was Zabrist protecting? In the aftermath of his death, Sinsky had confiscated an item from Zabrist's safe deposit box, and now the consortium was locked in a head-to-head -head battle with Sinsky in Florence a high-stakes treasure hunt to find. To find what? The provost felt himself glance instinctively toward the bookshelf and the heavy tome given to him two weeks ago by the wild-eyed Zabrist. The Divine Comedy The provost retrieved the book and carried it back to his desk, where he dropped it with a heavy thud. With unsteady fingers, he opened the cover to the first page and again read the inscription. My dear friend, thank you for helping me find the path. The world thanks you, too. First off, the provost thought, you and I were never friends. He read the inscription three more times. Then he turned his eyes to the bright red circle his client had scrawled on his calendar, highlighting tomorrow's date. The world thanks you. He turned and gazed out at the horizon a long moment. In the silence, he thought about the video and heard the voice of facilitator Nalton from his earlier phone call. 
I thought you might want to preview it before upload, the content is quite disturbing. The call still puzzled the provost. Nalton was one of his best facilitators, and making such a request was entirely out of character. He knew better than to suggest an override of the compartmentalization protocol. After replacing the Divine Comedy on the shelf, the provost walked to the scotch bottle and poured himself half a glass. He had a very difficult decision to make. Chapter 52 Known as the Church of Dante, the Sanctuary of Chisa di Santa Margarita dei Cerchi is more of a chapel than a church. The tiny, one-room house of worship is a popular destination for devotees of Dante who revere it as the sacred ground on which transpired two pivotal moments in the great poet's life. According to lore, it was here at this church, at the age of nine, that Dante first laid eyes on Beatrice Portinari the woman with whom he fell in love at first sight, and for whom his heart ached his entire life. To Dante's great anguish, Beatrice married another man, and then died at the youthful age of twenty-four. It was also in this church, some years later, that Dante married Gemma Donati a woman who, even by the account of the great writer and poet Boccaccio, was a poor choice of wife for Dante. Despite having children, the couple showed little signs of affection for each other, and after Dante's exile, neither spouse seemed eager to see the other ever again. The love of Dante's life had always been and would always remain the departed Beatrice Portinari, whom Dante had scarcely known, and yet whose memory was so overpowering for him that her ghost became the muse that inspired his greatest works. Dante's celebrated volume of poetry La Vita Nuova overflows with flattering verses about the blessed Beatrice. More worshipful still, the Divine Comedy casts Beatrice as none other than the Saviour who guides Dante through Paradise. In both works, Dante longs for his unattainable lady. Nowadays, the Church of Dante has become a shrine for the broken-hearted who suffer from unrequited love. The tomb of young Beatrice herself is inside the Church and her simple sepulchre has become a pilgrimage destination for both Dante fans and heartsick lovers alike. This morning, as Langdon and Siena wound their way through Old Florence toward the church, the streets continued to narrow until they became little more than glorified pedestrian walkways. An occasional local car appeared, inching through the maze and forcing pedestrians to flatten themselves against the buildings as it passed. The church is just around the corner, Langdon told Siena hopeful that one of the tourists inside would be able to help them. He knew their chances of finding a good Samaritan were better now that Sienna had taken back her wig in exchange for Langdon's jacket, and both had reverted to their normal selves, transforming from rocker and skinhead, to college professor and clean-cut young woman. Langdon was relieved once again to feel like himself. As they strode into an even tighter alleyway the Via del Presto Langdon scanned the various doorways. The entrance of the church was always tricky to locate because the building itself was very small, unadorned, and wedged tightly between two other buildings. One could easily walk past it without even noticing. Oddly, it was often easier to locate this church using not one's eyes, but one's ears. One of the peculiarities of La Chisa di Santa Margarita dei Cerchi was that it hosted frequent concerts, and when no concert was scheduled, the church piped in recordings of those concerts so visitors could enjoy the music at any time. As anticipated, as they advanced down the alleyway, Langdon began to hear the thin strains of recorded music, which grew steadily louder, until he and Sienna were standing before the inconspicuous entrance. The only indication that this was indeed the correct location was a tiny sign the antithesis of the bright red banner at the Museo Casa di Dante that humbly announced that this was the Church of Dante and Beatrice. When Langdon and Siena stepped off the street into the dark confines of the church, the air grew cooler and the music grew louder. The interior was stark and simple, smaller than Langdon recalled. There was only a handful of tourists, mingling, writing in journals, sitting quietly in the pews enjoying the music, or examining the curious collection of artwork. With the exception of the Madonna-themed altarpiece by Neri di Bici, almost all of the original art in this chapel had been replaced with contemporary pieces representing the two celebrities Dante and Beatrice the reasons most visitors sought out this tiny chapel. Most of the paintings depicted Dante's longing gaze during his famous first encounter with Beatrice, during which the poet, by his own account, 
instantly fell in love. The paintings were of widely varying quality, and most, to Langdon's taste, seemed kitschy and out of place. In one such rendering, Dante's iconic red cap with ear flaps looked like something Dante had stolen from Santa Claus. Nonetheless, the recurring theme of the poet's yearning gaze at his muse, Beatrice, left no doubt that this was a church of painful love unfulfilled, unrequited, and unattained. Langdon turned instinctively to his left and gazed upon the modest tomb of Beatrice Portinari. This was the primary reason people visited this church, although not so much to see the tomb itself as to see the famous object that sat beside it. A wicker basket. This morning, as always, the simple wicker basket sat beside Beatrice's tomb. And this morning, as always, it was overflowing with folded slips of paper each a handwritten letter from a visitor, written to Beatrice herself. Beatrice Portinari had become something of a patron saint of star-crossed lovers, and according to long-standing tradition, handwritten prayers to Beatrice could be deposited in the basket in the hope that she would intervene on the writer's behalf perhaps inspiring someone to love them more, or helping them find their true love, or even giving them the strength to forget a love who had passed away. Langdon, many years ago, while in the throes of researching a book on art history, had paused in this church to leave a note in the basket, entreating Dante's muse not to grant him true love, but to shed on him some of the inspiration that had enabled Dante to write his massive tome. Sing in me, muse, and through me tell the story. The opening line of Homer's Odyssey had seemed a worthy supplication, and Langdon secretly believed his message had indeed sparked Beatrice's divine inspiration for upon his return home, he had written the book with unusual ease. Scusate. Sienna's voice boomed suddenly. Potite ask alter me tutti. Everyone? Langdon spun to see Sienna loudly addressing the scattering of tourists, all of whom now glanced over at her, looking somewhat alarmed. Sienna smiled sweetly at everyone and asked in Italian if anyone happened to have a copy of Dante's Divine Comedy. After some strange looks and shakes of the head, she tried the question in English, without any more success. An older woman who was sweeping the altar hissed sharply at Sienna and held up a finger to her lips for silence. Sienna turned back to Langdon and frowned, as if to say, now what? Sienna's calling all cars solicitation was not quite what Langdon had had in mind, but he had to admit he'd anticipated a better response than she'd received. On previous visits, Langdon had seen no shortage of tourists reading the Divine Comedy in this hallowed space, apparently enjoying a total immersion in the Dante experience. Not so today. Langdon set his sights on an elderly couple seated near the front of the church. The old man's bald head was dipped forward, chin to chest, clearly he was stealing a nap. The woman beside him seemed very much awake, with a pair of white earbud cables dangling from beneath her grey hair. A glimmer of promise, Langdon thought, making his way up the aisle until he was even with the couple. As Langdon had hoped, the woman's telltale white earbuds snaked down to an iPhone in her lap. Sensing she was being watched, she looked up and pulled the earbuds from her ears. Langdon had no idea what language the woman spoke, but the global proliferation of iPhones, iPads, and iPods had resulted in a vocabulary as universally understood as the male-slash-female symbols that graced restrooms around the world. iPhone. Langdon asked, admiring her device. The old woman brightened at once, nodding proudly. Such a clever little toy, she whispered in a British accent. My son got it for me. I'm listening to my email. Can you believe it listening to my email? This little treasure actually reads it for me. With my old eyes, it's such a help. I have one, two, Langdon said with a smile as he sat down beside her, careful not to wake up her sleeping husband. But somehow I lost it last night. Oh, tragedy. Did you try the find your iPhone feature? My son says stupid me, I never activated that feature. Langdon gave her a sheepish look and ventured hesitantly, if it's not too much of an intrusion, would you mind terribly if I borrowed yours for just a moment? I need to look up something online. It would be a big help to me. Of course. She pulled out the earbuds and thrust the device into his hands. 
No problem at all. Poor dear. Langdon thanked her and took the phone. While she prattled on beside him about how terrible she would feel if she lost her iPhone, Langdon pulled up Google's search window and pressed the microphone button. When the phone beeped once, Langdon articulated his search string. Dante, Divine Comedy, Paradise, Canto 25. The woman looked amazed, apparently having yet to learn about this feature. As the search results began to materialize on the tiny screen, Langdon stole a quick glance back at Sienna, who was thumbing through some printed material near the basket of letters to Beatrice. Not far from where Sienna stood, a man in a necktie was kneeling in the shadows, praying intently, his head bowed low. Langdon couldn't see his face, but he felt a pang of sadness for the solitary man, who had probably lost his loved one and had come here for comfort. Langdon returned his focus to the iPhone, and within seconds was able to pull up a link to a digital offering of the Divine Comedy freely accessible because it was in the public domain. When the page opened precisely to Canto 25, he had to admit he was impressed with the technology. I've got to stop being such a snob about leather-bound books, he reminded himself. E-books do have their moments. As the elderly woman looked on, showing a bit of concern and saying something about the high data rates for surfing the internet abroad, Langdon sensed that his window of opportunity would be brief, and he focused intently on the web page before him. The text was small, but the dim lighting in the chapel made the illuminated screen more legible. Langdon was pleased to see he had randomly stumbled into the Mandelbaum translation a popular modern rendition by the late American professor Alan Mandelbaum. For his dazzling translation, Mandelbaum had received Italy's highest honor, the Presidential Cross of the Order of the Star of Italian Solidarity. While admittedly less overtly poetic than Longfellow's version, Mandelbaum's translation tended to be far more comprehensible. Today I'll take clarity over poesy, Langdon thought, hoping to quickly spot in the text a reference to a specific location in Florence the location where Ignazio hid the Dante death mask. The iPhone's tiny screen displayed only six lines of text at a time, and as Langdon began to read, he recalled the passage. In the opening of Canto 25, Dante referenced the Divine Comedy itself, the physical toll its writing had taken on him, and the aching hope that perhaps his heavenly poem could overcome the wolfish brutality of the exile that kept him from his fair Florence. Canto XXV If it should happen, if this sacred poem this work so shared by heaven and by earth that it has made me lean through these long years can ever overcome the cruelty that bars me from the fair fold where I slept, a lamb opposed to wolves that war on it. While the passage was a reminder that fair Florence was the home for which Dante longed while writing the Divine Comedy, Langdon saw no reference to any specific location in the city. What do you know about data charges, the woman interrupted, eyeing her iPhone with sudden concern. I just remembered my son told me to be careful about web surfing abroad. Langdon assured her he would be only a minute and offered to reimburse her, but even so, he sensed she would never let him read all 100 lines of Canto 25. He quickly scrolled down to the next six lines and continued reading. By then with other voice, with other fleece, I shall return as poet and put on, at my baptismal font, the laurel crown for there I first found entry to that faith which makes souls welcome unto God, and then, for that faith, Peter garlanded my brow. Langdon loosely recalled this passage, to an oblique reference to a political deal offered to Dante by his enemies. According to history, the wolves who banished Dante from Florence had told him he could return to the city only if he agreed to endure a public shaming that of standing before an entire congregation, alone at his baptismal font wearing only sackcloth as an admission of his guilt. In the passage Langdon had just read, Dante, having declined the deal, proclaims that if he ever returns to his baptismal font, he will be wearing not the sackcloth of a guilty man but the laurel crown of a poet. Langdon raised his index finger to scroll farther, but the woman suddenly protested, holding out her hand for the iPhone, apparently having reconsidered her loan. Langdon barely heard her. In the split second before he had touched the screen, his eye had glossed over a line of text, seeing it a second time. I shall return as poet and put on, at my baptismal font, the laurel crown, Langdon stared at the words, 
sensing that in his eagerness to find mention of a specific location, he'd almost missed a glowing prospect in the very opening lines. At my baptismal font. Florence was home to one of the world's most celebrated baptismal fonts, which for more than 700 years had been used to purify and christen young Florentines among them, Dante Alieri. Langdon immediately conjured an image of the building containing the font. It was a spectacular, octagonal edifice that in many ways was more heavenly than the Duomo itself. He now wondered if perhaps he'd read all he needed to read. Could this building be the place Ignazio was referring to? A ray of golden light blazed now in Langdon's mind as a beautiful image materialized a spectacular set of bronze doors radiant and glistening in the morning sun. I know what Ignazio was trying to tell me. Any lingering doubts evaporated an instant later when he realized that Ignazio Busoni was one of the only people in Florence who could possibly unlock those doors. Robert, the gates are open to you, but you must hurry. Langdon handed the iPhone back to the old woman and thanked her profusely. He rushed over to Siena and whispered excitedly, I know what gates Ignazio was talking about. The gates of paradise. Siena looked dubious. The gates of paradise? Aren't those, in heaven? Actually, Langdon said, giving her a wry smile and heading for the door, if you know where to look, Florence is heaven. Chapter 53 I shall return as poet, at my baptismal font. Dante's words echoed repeatedly in Langdon's mind as he led Siena northward along the narrow passageway known as Viadello Studio. Their destination lay ahead and with every step Langdon was feeling more confident that they were on the right course and had left their pursuers behind. The gates are open to you, but you must hurry. As they neared the end of the chasm-like alleyway, Langdon could already hear the low thrum of activity ahead. Abruptly the cavern on either side of them gave way, spilling them out into a sprawling expanse. The Piazza del Duomo this enormous plaza with its complex network of structures was the ancient religious center of Florence. More of a tourist center nowadays, the piazza was already bustling with tour buses and throngs of visitors crowding around Florence's famed cathedral. Having arrived on the south side of the piazza, Langdon and Siena were now facing the side of the cathedral with its dazzling exterior of green, pink, and white marble. As breathtaking in its size as it was in the artistry that had gone into its construction, the cathedral stretched off in both directions to seemingly impossible distances, its full length nearly equal to that of the Washington Monument laid on its side. Despite its abandonment of traditional monochromatic stone filigree in favor of an unusually flamboyant mix of colors, the structure was pure Gothic classic, robust and enduring. Admittedly, Langdon, on his first trip to Florence, had found the architecture almost gaudy. On subsequent trips, however, he found himself studying the structure for hours at a time, strangely captivated by its unusual aesthetic effects, and finally appreciating its spectacular beauty. Il Duomo or, more formally, the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore in addition to providing a nickname for Ignazio Busoni had long provided not only a spiritual heart to Florence but centuries of drama and intrigue. The building's volatile past ranged from long and vicious debates over Vasari's much-despised fresco of the Last Judgment on the dome's interior, to the hotly disputed competition to select the architect to finish the dome itself. Filippo Brunelleschi had eventually secured the lucrative contract and completed the dome the largest of its kind at the time and to this day Brunelleschi himself can be seen in sculpture seated outside the Palazzo dei Canonici, staring contentedly up at his masterpiece. This morning, as Langdon raised his eyes skyward to the famed red-tiled dome that had been an architectural feat of its era, he recalled the time he had foolishly decided to ascend the dome only to discover that its narrow, tourist-crammed staircases were as distressing as any of the claustrophobic spaces he'd ever encountered. Even so, Langdon was grateful for the ordeal he'd endured while climbing Brunelleschi's dome, since it had encouraged him to read an entertaining Ross King book of the same name. Robert. Sienna said. Are you coming? Langdon lowered his gaze from the dome, realizing he had stopped in his tracks to admire the architecture. Sorry about that. They continued moving, hugging the perimeter of the square. The cathedral was on their right now 
and Langdon noted that tourists were already flowing out of its side exits, checking the site off their to-see lists. Up ahead rose the unmistakable shape of a campanile the second of the three structures in the cathedral complex. Commonly known as Giotto's Bell Tower, the campanile left no doubt that it belonged with the cathedral beside it. Adorned in the identical pink, green, and white facing stones, the square spire climbed skyward to a dizzying height of nearly 300 feet. Langdon had always found it amazing that this slender structure could remain standing all these centuries, through earthquakes and bad weather, especially knowing how top-heavy it was, with its apex belfry supporting more than 20,000 pounds of bells. Sienna walked briskly beside him, her eyes nervously scanning the skies beyond the campanile, clearly searching for the drone, but it was nowhere to be seen. The crowd was fairly dense, even at this early hour and Langdon made a point of staying in the thick of it. As they approached the Campanile, they passed a line of caricature artists standing at their easels sketching garish cartoons of tourists a teenage boy grinding on a skateboard, a horse-toothed girl wielding a lacrosse stick, a pair of honeymooners kissing on a unicorn. Langdon found it amusing somehow that this activity was permitted on the same sacred cobbles where Michelangelo had set up his own easel as a boy. Continuing quickly around the base of Giotto's bell tower, Langdon and Sienna turned right, moving out across the open square directly in front of the cathedral. Here the crowds were thickest, with tourists from around the world aiming camera phones and video cameras upward at the colorful main facade. Langdon barely glanced up, having already set his sights on a much smaller building that had just come into view. Positioned directly opposite the front entrance of the cathedral stood the third and final structure in the cathedral complex. It was also Langdon's favorite. The Baptistry of San Giovanni. Adorned in the same polychromatic facing stones and striped pilasters as the cathedral, the baptistry distinguished itself from the larger building by its striking shape a perfect octagon. Resembling a layer cake, some had claimed, the eight-sided structure consisted of three distinct tiers that ascended to a shallow white roof. Langdon knew the octagonal shape had nothing to do with aesthetics and everything to do with symbolism. In Christianity, the number eight represented rebirth and recreation. The octagon served as a visual reminder of the six days of God's creation of heaven and earth, the one day of Sabbath, and the eighth day, upon which Christians were reborn or recreated through baptism. Octagons had become a common shape for baptistries around the world. While Langdon considered the baptistry one of Florence's most striking buildings, he always found the choice of its location a bit unfair. This baptistry, nearly anywhere else on earth, would be the center of attention. Here, however, in the shadow of its two colossal siblings, the baptistry gave the impression of being the runt of the litter. Until you step inside, Langdon reminded himself, picturing the mind-boggling mosaic work of the interior, which was so spectacular that early admirers claimed the baptistry ceiling resembled heaven itself. If you know where to look, Langdon had wryly told Siena, Florence is heaven. For centuries, this eight-sided sanctuary had hosted the baptisms of countless notable figures Dante among them. I shall return as poet, at my baptismal font. Because of his exile, Dante had never been permitted to return to this sacred site the place of his baptism although Langdon felt a rising hope that Dante's death mask, through the unlikely series of events that had occurred last night, had finally found its way back in his stead. The baptistry, Langdon thought. This has to be where Ignazio hid the mask before he died. He recalled Ignazio's desperate phone message, and for a chilling moment, Langdon pictured the corpulent man clutching his chest lurching across the piazza into an alley, and making his final phone call after leaving the mask safely inside the baptistry. The gates are open to you. Langdon's eyes remained fixed on the baptistry as he and Sienna snaked through the crowd. Sienna was moving now with such nimble eagerness that Langdon nearly had to jog to keep up. Even at a distance, he could see the baptistry's massive main doors glistening in the sun. Crafted of gilded bronze and over 15 feet tall, the doors had taken Lorenzo Ghiberti more than twenty years to complete. They were adorned with ten intricate panels of delicate biblical figures of such quality that Giorgio Vasari had called the doors undeniably perfect in every way and, the finest masterpiece ever created. 
It had been Michelangelo, however, whose gushing testimonial had provided the doors with a nickname that endured even today. Michelangelo had proclaimed them so beautiful as to be fit for use, as the gates of paradise.